Okay, we are now live and I'll return the host powers to you. So you are now all set. Okay. Um, so which, I will, mm -hmm. can you tell me which email that is? Um, uh, let's see here. What did I call that email? Placeholder image. Got it. Thank you, Tommy. Okay, wonderful. Thank I'm glad you, you found it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Have good reviews. Bye. Bye-bye, you too.
Good morning, Jane. Good morning. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Very well, thank you. All right. Um, just as uh, I'm waiting for everyone to get here, just have some things to share. Um, okay. So this is the honors courtyard, courtyard at UT. It's um, uh, so just I asked the students to do a few things. Uh, one is to uh, produce an Edenic garden suitable for small gatherings, large celebrations or graduation ceremonies. So the program was relatively um, low tech uh, and on purpose, uh, followed by the fact that the students were requested to produce a platform to provide, excuse me, a platform for academic life and the volumes, exclamation point, of experience that frames ceremony, celebration and debate. Uh, so here is the site. Um, and these are the objectives. There's a PDF that I just uploaded uh, to the box folder that could, will have some additional information for you. Uh, but most importantly, the students have been asked to focus specifically on uh, the, the volume, the making of an exterior room. And the reason I'm being very explicit about that is because this is uh, one of five courses that the students take over the course of the semester. So this isn't a traditional six unit studio. This is a three unit studio. So it's just a, it's just a fraction of their responsibilities this semester. So I've pared everything down. We're focusing specifically on the making of three volumes, an exterior room for celebration, ceremony, and debate. Uh, and this connects directly back to their technical grading course and their visual communication course. Those are two of the five uh, that uh, courses that we have made direct connections to. And so focusing specifically on getting that volume. Uh, so masses, massing, frame, threshold, boundary. Those were the key, key operating uh, vocabularies. A few givens. One, there are heritage trees on the site and I've asked the students to keep a minimum of three. Um, that is my decision as the instructor. If you have issues with that, save that criticism for me, not for them. That's in order to make the grading solution, uh, let's say plausible within this uh, courtyard. Second, uh, and this is a big one, uh, we did not use a UGS data. We had to survey the site ourselves so that the students could gain some sort of access. It's completely uh, locked to the public and the only people uh, who are allowed in the courtyard during the, uh, this semester were the residents of the uh, four residence halls. Right, so from Littlefield to Carruthers, Andrews and Blanton, they were the only people who allowed access. So Rob Stepnoski uh, produced a LIDAR and photogrammetry survey. The students were able to walk through it um, in VR, uh, but they could not go into the site. So they've, there's been a, a level of release or separation uh, from the media. One thing uh, from the site itself, our survey is in, from a, a datum set at Littlefield, not USGS. So the contours go from zero to negative 12. So you will see negative 12 on the, con you know, you will see negative contours. We've, um, for expediency's sake, we've kept with that uh, and did not change them back to the datum. So that is a, um, because we went straight from the LIDAR into uh, Civil 3D to generate the surface and contour models. So that's an instructor error decision, not the students. And we've been focusing on uh, producing uh, drawings, not a PowerPoint presentation. So that too uh, is the students have the ability to do that, but we've been focusing on them making a legible drawing in CAD. They will have some power, some of them will have PowerPoints with, a, with diagrams, sketch drawings, and prior narratives, but the deliverables were explicitly for drawings. 
and they should have a presentation in three parts. First part is they have to state their intent and the mechanism, their goals for the project, and then the mechanism that they employed for those goals, followed by the uh, a walking through of the drawings and the project, and third with their particular narrative that they wanted to share through PowerPoint or through a set of diagrams to explain the project. Okay, so uh, Franny uh, is going to begin the day and uh, we have five students. So from Franny, William, Anna, Ashwini and Andrew, we should be, the student will have control of their screen. So I will relinquish control and um, turn it over to Franny. Um, as we wait for Franny to get started, did you have any questions? Jane? No. Okay. All right. No question. Terrific. Thank you. And great to see you. Oh, should I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please, Franny. Thank you. Oh, uh, Jane, uh, in addition, I have shared with you the Miro board just in case. So we've got uh, a double backup uh, or triple backup uh, of the work. So if you wanted to log on to Miro, you could view the work uh, there. Okay, thank you. I can start whenever you're ready. Just okay. I'll start. For the thumbs up. Uh, uh, I will leave. It's up to you. You may begin now, Franny. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Let's see, I can. Well, oh, there we go. Um, okay. So this project is about transforming a courtyard that's currently made up of disparate parts into a space that can be both unified and divided to meet the scale of the moment, be it graduation or um, time to study or debate. Uh, almost like a library whose shelves can be rearranged for events. Um, a series of modular outdoor rooms of the courtyard can be conceptually rearranged, if you will, to read as a collection of small spaces or as a unified whole, depending on, um, depending on the event and the scale. Um, this is prim primarily accomplished by dividing the rooms through um, variety in ground condition and unifying the space through a rhythmic, rhythmic canopy that um, meets all of the edges of the courtyard. Um, there we go. Um, in the surrounding buildings and in the courtyard as it exists right now, you can see that um, the modular components of the residence halls can be read either as single individual bedrooms or it can also be read as hallways and then sometimes read as entire buildings. And similarly, the, the goal with the project was to make it so that there are um, modular garden rooms that can be read as small spaces or as larger spaces for um, larger gatherings. Whoops. There we go. Um, in the residence halls, the mechanisms for achieving that, um, that change across scale are, um, or the components of that, um, that process are the bedrooms and the bathways and the hallways, the bathrooms and the hallways. Um, oops. I'm sorry, this is being so finicky. Okay. Um, and in this project, the three mechanisms for achieving that change across scale are really the ground condition and the canopy 
therapy, as well as some uh, forms of separation. And because it is about um, shaping these outdoor spaces, it's really the relationship between the ground and the canopy that either creates or um, divides rooms. Um, changes in topography are used to signal the difference in volume and therefore a change in the space. So a lot of the iterative process was about realizing what those relationships were between the canopy and the ground condition and how um, manipulating that that ground condition and um, the difference in like uh, terrace levels was really how this was going to be um, achieved. Um, as in the main courtyard um, there as it exists there are three main rooms and as you can see the topography really does emphasize that there is an entryway to the northern part of the courtyard that um, is more in more open, almost like a speedway type um, walkway that is multimodal and um, really connects back to the larger campus landscape. Um, this, the more central part of the courtyard is more enclosed and it provides a place for people to slow down a little bit. Um, and again, this is that space that can really be seen as smaller rooms and you can see the planters that divide and the changes in topography that divide. And to the south, that's um, the third area is more private and more intimate. It's a time of really slowing down. And um, this is where a debate might take place or um, more reflectful academic activities in room separations. Um, there are further divisions across the span of the courtyard uh, that are achieved through this change in topography. Um, that provide even smaller and even more separation across, yet we can see that the canopy remains consistent in unifying. Um, from this view, as you're walking out from Carruthers, this is the stage where one would stand for graduation, um, but on any given day, it's also a space that can be experienced by multiple people in different ways. Yet, when you look out to it, you can see that it is a unified central courtyard. Finally, um, testing for modularity and separation and unity across the garden. Um, there are these three larger areas that remain and are even emphasized by the tree canopy. And within the, that canopy, you can see there are smaller rooms that are created that still, when unified, read as, an, as, a, um, as one space. Um, even further, you can see that the changes in the ground condition and the terracing does carve out smaller spaces for perhaps a reading group or a small group of students um, or a seminar. and um, that canopy still remains consistent above, but it really is that carving out and the change in topography that creates that space. Similarly, as you're looking down the, um, the rows of trees, you can see the different spaces carved out, a space for debate, a space for reading and gathering. And then in plan view, we can see with the canopy plantings, that rhythmic um, and consistent planting scheme does create that larger sense of unity and emphasizes um, the larger rooms. Um, so finally, just as, as you can see in plan and through section that um, because the canopy does remain consistent, it, it's about that relationship between the canopy and the ground condition that provides these different spaces that can be read, read as individual rooms or can also be read as a collection of rooms, depending on um, the needs of the moment. Thank you. Great, thank you, Franny. So, Jane and Alan, if we, uh, if you, you need Franny to return to any other particular drawings, you should feel free to request that. Thank you. 
So Franny, I'm going to say this is a little hard, not because of Zoom per se, but um, I think there's a lot to talk about in the design in terms of successes. The presentation, though, led you astray. You made a lot of assertions and mixed up too, or used too many metaphors. It's dividing, it's unifying, it's this, it's that. Um, it's a... Uh, it, 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 it got to the point where I think there was some old Saturday Night Live skit where there's this blender that Dan Aykroyd's selling that does everything. And so I know that one of the things you had you were, you were tasked for is there's an idea and there are volumes do it. Right? That was the, the, the sort of overarching agenda from Hope. And then you added in it's the words, not the drawings. It's getting in the way. And then also one of the things that actually is more important because it's Zoom, and we're not in a room where, because if we were in a room with stuff pinned on the wall, you would actually walk around and point at stuff as you were talking. So we would see how the words and the graphics match. Instead, we're, Jen and I are having to do a lot of work to figure out, wait, do I really see that there? We need help. Mm -hmm. And so if we take, stick with the plan that you've got on the screen right now, for example, you said rhythm. Where's the rhythm? Show me the rhythm. Use the cursor and show me the rhythm. rhythm. The rhythm was in the, in the grid planting of the trees as it kind of runs from north to south. So it was a grid or rhythm? Um, well, it's not, it's not exactly a grid. There are spaces that are kind of offset. Um, or there are certain trees that are offset for um, because of the topography um, or to, I guess, to, to merge with the topography. And um, so I would say it's more of a rhythm guided by a grid. Okay, but then you've got to, you got to tell us that. Because again, you said the word grid. Again, we're, we are hostage to you. Okay. So if, it, if it's a rhythm, great. If it's not a rhythm, great too. But then if it is a rhythm and you've said it's based on topography, now here's a question, a challenge for the drawing. How is that perceivable? Right? And also in the drawing, how is it perceivable? And also, if I was on the site, would I actually perceive those variations? Um, and again, this is one of those where I think all of us are sorry you couldn't be out in the field for this class and other classes. Dimensions in landscape are not the same as dimensions in architecture. Right? There's a fuzziness. Things have to be a certain size before you even notice them. So if your if your rhythm is really only off by eight inches when you're talking trees, no one's going to know. So we're back to a grid. And so it's a little tricky on that. Okay, so we got that. So the stage is off the central path, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, good. So what are they look like retaining walls on the eastern side of that. I see a bunch of, of what are on the on the zoom frame vertical lines. Right here? The, no, in the middle. Those guys. These? Yeah. Yes, so those are um, a series of their shallow steps, about four inches, that per provide kind of a, a subtle terracing. Um, the intention with the with the steps was to create not a harsh edge condition that a terrace wall would create that would really be like a firm division. Um, the steps instead are a gentle, um, a gentle separation um, that negotiates the proposed topography to the existing on this eastern side that's quite low. You, okay. may, you may reference your precedent and, oh, uh, okay. you and then Alan, if you go to view options, you can use the annotation tool to point to things for Franny. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so I was looking at the um, the Beck House in Dallas, the Reed Hildebrand landscape. Okay. Yep. Um, as the the steps that um, that um, I guess are also integrated into the hill. Um, so as we're moving up in the hill, there are certain places where you would step up physically and others that act more as a ramp. Okay. 
So I can understand that. And I can also see how that provides a, 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 an actual rhythm going towards from east to west up the steps. What I don't see though, is how the steps actually hit the topo lines. Because if they are steps, they're, they're mini retaining walls. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is a graphic error on, on my end. Um, do you have another drawing that shows them? I do not. No, that, um, yes, that is a, a graphics. Well, now you know what you're doing for your holiday break. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's enough for me from right now. Jane, um, thoughts from you? Thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation, Franny. I, th I would like to um, echo my sentiments that Alan had, that if you were in a room and we were looking at drawings, we could walk around and look at them all at once. So this is a little bit challenging. And I think that that's one of the things, since we're going to have more um, virtual presentations, that that's something we need to be prepared for. And um, I'm not saying that, I'm not sure, you know, I'm sure you got directions on what you're supposed to present, but having sections and plan views on the same sheet and having some things so that since we don't have the opportunity to see all the plans at once, would really be helpful. And when I saw these trees and I saw that there's a, I think Hope said there's a 12 foot difference in elevation across the site. Uh, uh, six, it, in, at the extreme, it's like nine, but six to nine elevation change from the south west to the northeast. Okay, okay. But you know, showing like some topo and some drainage arrows, um, even just schematically would have been really helpful to understand your ground plane a little bit better. Um, and I was having a little bit of trouble too in these four inch risers that you talked about. And again, the grading plan would have helped me understand that. So you mentioned some of the things you were talking about, but I was looking for those three elements and how you would describe your um, interpretation of those in terms of the celebration, the debate, and you talked about the ceremony, but you didn't talk about space, you talked about spaces for gathering, but debate and celebration. And I think that it would have been helpful if you could have talked about how you designed some of those spaces to address those functions or gathering places. Um, the other thing that would have been more clear from the sections and elevations. It looked like you had some walls in there defining some of your spaces. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Go back to the, where are your walls. No, you, you showed, go back, you showed some, and Lois, maybe it was out of scale. You had a, oh, there's another one somewhere. The That one, okay. Oh, yeah, how yeah. tall? Are those the buildings or I've had a hard time understanding what was what in this? Um, yes, space so that were out. The, the buildings, it's just an extrusion of the facade. Um, okay. That these buildings are. Um, and then these were the, the trees. Um, and then these are like the planters. I don't know I, if that. I totally misread that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Some sketches. Sorry. Were no, that's okay. I thought, are those walls? You know, I couldn't tell what the elements were. Um, you know, volume wise, I, I understand how you're representing the schematically now that you've explained it, but I never could have seen that just from looking at the drawing. And the other concern I had was um, the, you have the terracing, but the ADA accessibility, when you have all, you know, what would be the accessible routes through this space with all these mm -hmm. small grade changes? Too. So um, as far as the um, this part right here, the, the central kind of terraces, this right here is a ramp. Um, this is also a ramp that comes up and just sits here. So it it's kind of different, I guess, depending on where you're intending to go. Um, but like this would be a ramp and then and you could also go over there. And there, this side is only accessible through the steps if you're coming up from the top. Um, but then this is also. Okay, I was thinking in terms too, you might want to have a little extra because what often happens in resting places for um, handicap access is that they leave room for the wheelchair, but they don't think about the people that are around them and the people they want to associate with. So it would be good to have some space. Um, 
designed in there that is integral to the space, but allows for um, w wheelchairs and, and other um, semi-ambulatory devices, I guess, so that they would be able to congregate and celebrate with others so that they're not divided. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, the other question I had, and this may not have been part of your program, was there a day-night dynamic with this? Was this a day-use only space or? Um, it wasn't, uh, yes, it wasn't specified in the program, but it is a residence hall and also a courtyard. So I, it's my understanding that people um, or students in the, in the honors program and also students outside of it would hang out here during the day. But then at nighttime, I, I would imagine that um, that there would also be students there. Because the night use may have a effect on where you would place trees or where would you, you know, where you would place steps and how everything would be well lit and visible. Um, it might change some of the way you position your design elements um, to make it a 24 hour space or a day and night space. So I just didn't know if that was part of your program. And that's, that's enough for me, I think. Thank you. I just have one more thing. It's minor and you would never have known it. Here we go. Um, Sorry, I think I froze for a second. No. Um, it's a thing you would never have known unless you could have been on site, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing, where's my draw? That's Diana? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the issue is um, what happens when you block a front door? It's not, a, it's, not an, it's not an access thing in terms of safety in this case, but it is one of those, you gotta be there and figure it out things because the idea of putting some statuary in front of a door, it's done but there's always a pretty good distance between it and the door because you also don't want to obscure, here's where you go in. And so there's a fine yes. so, line. And I, well, I was just going to say, those are, those are the steps onto the terrace. Right. Which oh, no, I know that. Yeah. I'm not sure. But in this case, okay. you're, I'm wondering if you're clo too close to those staircase, that staircase. Oh, okay. So you've got a set of thresholds, right? There's, there are steps, there's a plaza, there are the doors. And, and it's mm -hmm. really hard here because you've got all three of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not sure, it, it, in plan it fits. In experience, I'm not sure it was a great location, but you would have mm -hmm. had to have been there and walk around and probably take your classmates and say, hey, you three stand together, you're gonna be a big giant statue for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, it might have even made sense, even though it's moving now closer to the building, to actually just move it up to the center of that plaza. Mm. That might have given you sort of the sort of entry sequence into that in a better way. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was thinking of that because it is quite a wide space. I, I was thinking that it could also be like a place for people to sit because it is, it does kind of have a, that, um, like an elevated base where people could sit. Um, also conceptually, I think I, I put it there because um, the three women for whom the buildings were named to the, the bottom half, the, the southern end, are all like um, definitely like pioneers and um, Littlefield seemed a little beholden to her husband. And I think Diana is a symbol of like feminine power. So I put it there. I thought she needed it. Um, she could use it. That was kind of the guiding, uh, the guiding thought. Okay. Anyway, that's all I got. Thank you. Franny, do you have any questions for your panel before we move on? Um, I can't think of anything in particular. I, I think, um, one of the things that I found, I guess, the most challenging was um, was trying to figure out the ground condition um, and figuring out how those terraces would interact with one another and how they would um, 
connect to one another. Um, and I can see that, um, yeah, I think, I think making that a more integral part of my presentation and how those things were resolved, um, I do think that would have been really, really helpful. So uh, <laughs> next time. <laughs> All right, next time. Oh yes, you know, next, next week. Yeah. So, uh, Franny, thank you very much uh, for your effort and thank you for starting off the day. It is always the, the hot seat uh, for issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, William, I'm going to set the timer and the floor and Zoom screens are yours. Okay, hello. Um, thank you both for taking the time to come and uh, visit with us today and, and see the work that we've been doing. Uh, it means a lot. Um, and uh, I am gonna be kind of walking you through the proposed courtyard that I've been working on over the course of this semester. Uh, in response to the program requirements, uh, the courtyard is divided into three spaces which are positioned on platforms. Uh, the uh, proposed courtyard uh, has three rooms that are clustered around a central primary axis that is focused on stage area. Uh, the three areas that are created are a, uh, a larger gathering area, a debate stage that also doubles as a study space, and then a more private secluded study space that is uh, more tucked away in the corner of the courtyard area. Uh, the, one of the primary challenges that uh, we worked through over uh, the course of the project is the grade change over the courtyard and the fact that the previous courtyard designs did not take into account or really uh, address this grade change, which is something that I wanted to, uh, with this plan, basically this plan addresses that directly in a sense of we use the uh, platforming to uh, separate out spaces for different elevations from a uh, stair step area that uh, acts as a viewing of the stage and also as a celebration space as a space for events for performances uh, etc for graduations and then moving up the elevations we have a uh, we have a uh, debate space, which is uh, slightly uh, less public spacing than this direct uh, area and is centered with a uh, statue of Diana and has uh, features different uh, more shade trees that uh, allow people to study on the benches, but also has a larger open space that allows people to debate, uh, have discussions, possibly hold classes, et cetera, this type of thing. And then we move across the stage, as I said, into a more private area, which is the furthest removed from the public. Uh, we have this larger pathway, which is uh, features the entrance into the main public area. And then the furthest removed is this public, is this private area that uh, allows for really more private study. It has direct access from the uh, Carruthers area. And a large amount of what this design was, was identifying this protrusion off of Carruthers into the courtyard and allowing that to influence the hierarchy as far as uh, that protrusion uh, continues into the stage and then uh, cascades out into the elevation changes up in the public platform. Uh, we can kind of see this change of grade across the longitudinal sections with this uh, public walkway area uh, which uh, on either side of it has these larger trees that create walls. Uh, and then moving up into the larger uh, gathering area. And then as we move up further, we move into this debate space uh, again. And then with the cross sections, uh, we can see these different spaces again, uh, divided off with uh, the private area here, which features, uh, you know, it's, it's positioned higher, uh, a little bit more privacy. Uh, this wall again, uh, the entrance in, which, uh, which enters directly onto that public debate stage, uh, these stair steps up, the stage itself, and then on top here with the, uh, the debate space with the statue in the center, 
and the trees on either side of it. We can see here again that we are able to uh, view speakers on stage, view an event on stage, possibly like a small musical performance. Uh, this space is also has uh, these these retaining, I suppose you could call them retaining walls, but these jumps in elevation that uh, could be for seating. Uh, one thing that was really important to me uh, was accessibility. So we have the path that runs up this area for wheelchair accessibility, but also for people that are uh, challenged as far as uh, needing places to sit down. Uh, we tried to fill the public area with that as well. These also double as areas where people could study in general uh, during the evening. Um, this is a view from the more private area. Again, you can see out into this larger area and the three areas feel connected, uh, but it does have this more tucked away uh, viewport. Uh, and then uh, the final one here is the, uh, the debate stage, which uh, again has this view out into the, uh, the larger space, but is pushed back and uh, features these more shade trees uh, and then this larger open area. Thank you. Well, Liam, can you just point at the drawing and tell us what all the surfaces, surfaces are? Yes, of course. Um, so again, here we have uh, a pathway. On either side, we have, uh, to the entrance of Littlefield, we have uh, these four kind of grand trees. Uh, Right here is the entrance in, uh, trees again on this side, creating a privacy wall, uh, a separation between these two areas. Uh, this is a pathway leading up uh, to the top elevation here. And then these kind of cascading jumping elevations, which double as seating or standing areas to view the stage. And then moving through here, uh, this is the base stage, as I said, uh, which has a slight uh, elevation going up, but uh, very, uh, very small change, uh, around four feet of elevation change across the entire area with seating, trees, bushes, et cetera. Moving across, this is the stage uh, in the private area with bushes, trees, and again, seating. Okay, so thing one, say shrubs, not bushes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I get this. So that's black or some kind of hard, hard thing. Right. Then, then I turn and that's hard stuff. Yes? Yes. And it's still hard stuff here. Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, and then that's a ramp, so that's hard stuff. Right. And so then is all of this pavement? So that's paved, yes. Oh, okay. Then all of this is pavement? Yes, that's paved. And then, I yeah, this is something- And then that's, that's the existing, I mean, that's, well, that's kind of the existing area anyway. Right, exactly. And then I guess the thing that I should have made clear and I should have used a cross hatching or something is that this area is grass, uh, which is which is a separated out thing. Uh, but these areas are all paved with uh, then planters for the trees, etc. Okay. So what's your attitude to lushness? Wasn't lushness in the program? Um, I my attitude towards lushness was essentially, uh, I suppose, a little bit more of a, a minimal idea of it, of having these trees and uh, shrubs that uh, emphasize certain areas, I suppose, more and create more of space versus uh, having the entire area just be filled with plants. Okay. William. What does yes. lush mean to you? And and the brief said Edenic lush. <laughs> so you you have you have a different you've taken a different position. Right. Um, I suppose that the way that I was viewing lush was more. I suppose that kind of a hard, hard thing to describe, but like small, uh, I guess that lush would be uh, filled areas with like a certain type of uh, beauty or something of that sort. 
uh, and I was taking it as instead of uh, filled with like life or something throughout the entire thing, having it uh, emphasize certain areas or having certain parts of it have these lush areas of trees, uh, of shrubs, uh, and, and giving more open space, if that makes sense. More, I mean, it sort of makes sense, yes. I mean, it gets to some other questions, though. I mean, so I, I can under, from what you've said, I understand the over, overall vision of right. your version of lushness. Yeah. What I don't know, though, is how I test that. Right. Right? You say, I got this word lush, and now you're saying, trust me. Right. So is, for example, three trees up here, does that alone make, give me lush? I, I, I need a little more, or the, your audience, your, your would-be clients, right. you need a little more to, to say, you, you think you know Lush, but let me rephrase it for you. Okay. I'm going to give you a new definition of Lush. Because um, I, yeah. I think it's a little, from my perspective, it seemed a little too spare. But okay. if, you, if you still took the, the intent you had about this, but began to make, I'm just going to say, thicker or layer, more layered separations. Yeah. Right? So it maybe it becomes like using some of these little trees alongside these big trees too. So that the paved areas are still paved. You know, that part's right. still there. Yeah. But I do feel wrapped in green. Yeah. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And that's, I think that that, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's something that I... I would definitely agree with that. It feels like it might be a little bit too spare or I didn't advance that idea far enough, I suppose. Well, also there's a project you can't find anymore because it, it, it was, it, it's destroyed. <laughs> that, I mean, that's why you can't find it anymore. Wonderful. Um, and unfortunately the library has the book, but you can't get into the library. Um, but there was a project by Michael Van Valkenburg Associates called uh, 50 Avenue Montaigne in Paris. It was a tiny, uh, it was a sm much smaller courtyard than you've got by an office park, by a, a okay. big shiny office tower. And in it, he has alternating rows of vestigial and espalier trees with, with, with some, some kind of ground cover on parts of it. It's a lot of stone, but you would never know it's just stone. Right. And so I think you can certainly build up the idea of something vibrant and Edenic, but you got to work a little harder. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. All right, Jan, I'll hand it off to you. I trying uh, I think you're muted. Alan's muted. There. There's Jane. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, William. I would Hi. Uh, like lip syncing. Um, <laughs> what's the dimension across your courtyard? Like, you know, with the, I'm saying in north, which way is north is up, which way north is straight up? North is straight up. Okay. And then what's the dimension from north to south? building to building it's uh i don't have the exact dimension about, about uh i think that it's roughly i don't remember i don't actually i think that it might be uh around a little over 100 i believe hope do you remember the exact dimensions you do know that it's around 340 feet. 300, yeah. <laughs> and it's 100, 180 something from Carruthers to Blant. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Brent Brent can give us the, the direct numbers. Oh, no, that's okay. I just want a general idea of the yeah. dimensions of the space. Because um, you have these, and you have these, everything looks paved and we talked about the layering of the ground plane and the tree plane and then you have this interruptive middle plane 
which I guess is here. And I think from plan view, um, you know, I can understand your, your terracing here and your relationship to the building. But what I have, I'm having a hard time understanding, and I, and I have no problem with your um, interpretation of green I, I, in terms of your definition of sparse, but I think I have some issues with the placement of sparse and the, because when you're sparse, then every single element becomes really, really important. Every single element of green becomes extremely important. So I'm trying to figure out what some of the functions of these trees were. Cause if you look at, and I'm assuming that North is straight up. So I'm over here and, you know, I mean, just be thinking about what kind of thermal comfort I'm going to have in this space. Right. And I don't see a lot of accommodation for that. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, I think you've arranged the trees from a, maybe a sculptural standpoint, but from a functional standpoint, I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding where I would be most comfortable in this space. You know, if I'm out here for a graduation or whatever, um, yeah. you know, it gets pretty hot in Texas in May or in August or in, you know, um, right. you know, what, how am I going to stay comfortable in that space? Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think that that's something that I should have taken into consideration is, is the conditions that what people are experiencing versus just. Uh, yeah, because think about the meaning and the functionality of the space, not just right. the flow, you know, like I'm yeah. to walk through the space. And <laughs> right. then the, the, go to your section. I need to see your section with the, with the trees and shrubs. No, you have another one somewhere. Yeah, okay. There we go. Okay. This really, if you're talking about the sparse and I, I'm getting it in the trees, I'm understanding it. Right. I feel like this is a, this middle plane is kind of an obliteration of the spare that you're trying to create. Right. So, um, you know, it's important to have that, that middle layer, but yeah. how does it function? What, right. what's it doing there? I mean, I don't, I don't get it. Um, you know, it may look nice, but how does it work? And how does it, how does it define the space? Cause you have these big spaces in between. And then, you know, are the, I guess what I'm saying, are these necessary? Is that how right. you need to define the space? Do they really provide any shade or any seasonal interest or function? So be thinking about that. Okay. And the other thing I just wanted to ask you was, and I may have misunderstood what Hope said, but you said they had have three trees that needed to be saved. Where are those? Uh, one of them is back here. And then one is in this area over here. Uh, and then one is back in the uh, near. Okay. Uh, so it looks like in, in, go back, go back to where you were. No, go back to the drawing we were looking at. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So this one, you're going to save this one? It is, I don't think it's showing up right now. Is it this one? Is that one? Uh, is that it's one? this here. Or this one? Okay. Yeah. So you're taking this tree and you're saving it, but then the aeration and the roots for the survival of the tree are in the top, what, 12 inches? So you're paving over the whole, around the whole tree that you're saving, you're gonna essentially kill that tree. Right. Um, That's something I, I should have thought about, I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just that, um, you know, there are things that can be done, a lot of cost and preparation beforehand um, right. to save those trees and pave around them, but you're paving around the whole thing. So all you have, for the nutrition and health of the tree essentially is just a little bit around the root collar. So you need to be, cause you know, the worst thing that can happen is you design around a design. You've probably seen this. Um, yeah. You design around a space to save a tree, then the tree dies and you have this really awkward space in your plan that doesn't mean anything anymore. So just be yeah. cautious of when you're going to save something, how are you going to save it? And what does it take to save it? Right. I that think. makes a lot of sense. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, William, do you have any questions? Uh, William, do you have any questions for your panel before we transition? I do not. I I, I found uh, I found Alan's comments about about sparseness and and uh, and then these comments about about really looking at uh, saving trees and, and what those implications are to be really helpful as far as uh, progressing further. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. William, two words: Silva cell. <laughs> Silva cell hope. Silva, oh, okay. Fair enough. Okay, um, I do not know how to make a transition between Silva cell and Anna Applequist, but um, I will turn the screen over to her and uh, thank William for his time and effort. Good morning, everybody. The Honors Courtyard serves many purposes, oopsies, for those that frequent the campus throughout the year. This area um, is where students are housed. It's a place for conversation and debate and a space for celebration that includes friends and family and faculty when graduation takes place at the end of the year. But with all this said, this place is primarily, most days of the year, a place where students live. They study, socialize, sleep, eat, and dream here. This place is meant to serve them in the health and social functioning of their daily lives. So with this in mind, my reimagination of the Honors Courtyard works to create equally accessible spaces for rest, recreation, congregation, and study for every single dormitory on site. The goal of these spaces, and there's six of them in total, is to promote a sense of community and openness for those that live there and those that will conduct classes there and those that will visit. And I've achieved this in a few different ways. Uh, firstly, planted and shaded lawns, flanking um, both sides of each dormitory, provide opportunities for people to meet, study together, debate, and these spaces connect one dorm to another via sinuous pathways that encircle the entire design. These rooms uh, give people a sense of enclosure and privacy through canopy pecan trees and blooming mountain walls, while also having the opportunity to gaze out to the main recreation space at the center of the courtyard. So each room is inadvertently connected to one another through these straight and sinuous pathways that encircle the entire topography. Uh, secondly, this sense of openness is further strengthened by this primary recreation and socialization space uh, centralized in the middle of the courtyard. This vast open lawn space is surrounded in its entirety by these rooms, um, each of which vary in elevation, but all bleed into the lawn's flat topography. So this main area serves as a space where people can lay down a blanket, have a picnic, sprawl out their books and materials, or toss a frisbee or football around. And this space also lends itself to larger groups of people and can accommodate large events. Um, notably and potentially controversially about this design, the space in the courtyard is primarily grassy, open walking space, um, as are the classrooms and study areas and cars are not allowed entrance into the dorm area in any capacity. So they're to be routed around the back of Blanton. Um, I concluded that the noise, exhaust, and potential dangers of cars don't facilitate safe congregation. So while this understandably might prove to be a challenging move-in day for parents and students, hopefully every other day of the year facilitates free flowing movement. Um, and then the last goal of this reimagination was to preserve all of the existing heritage trees on site and create a planning regimen that um, incorporated color throughout the year and soft texture and was low maintenance. So now I'd like to give you a quick tour through the site. Um, sorry, this is kind of fuzzy. Um, 
So as I mentioned earlier, the center of design of the design lies in the common recreation line, through which all classrooms, eating and socialization areas um, are connected and surrounded by. This topography is completely flat. Um, and as one exits each of the dorms and moves down in elevation towards this area, it further enforces the sense of connectedness and directs the gaze downwards to this main area. So if we imagine we're a student leaving uh, Littlefield, we would be able to wave to friends um, down to the west as they sit, maybe eating or studying in the open grass shaded by the heritage trees. And as rainwater will flow down this elevation to leave the site, um, blue stem and mealy grasses have been installed to mitigate some of that waterfall. Um, this room is shared with Blanton, and the east side room is shared with Carruthers. Uh, the west side room of Littlefield is reimagined, reimagined to be a private space where classes in this era of social distancing might be conducted. Um, the grassy lawn is encased in mountain morals and has horsetail reed planting beds uh, behind lawn benches where several people can sit. This is one of the highest elevations on the site, and the tree line walkway in front of the classroom meets the flattened topography. So, here we're given perhaps our first clear view of Diana as we continue south towards Brothers. Uh, we then find ourselves in front of a statue, which is flanked by benches, each with their own canopy tree to provide a contemplative area or a place one can rest and watch the comings and goings of the expanse of lawn. Again, rows of trees, sexmania, and open grass create a sense of enclosure within the expanse of recreation area and an opening between the south side rows of trees um, it gives us passage into the elevated main debate room in front of Andrews. The rows of trees within the vast lawn direct the gaze head towards the debate room and provides a space where graduation and large events could potentially be conducted. And the last piece I want to show you is on the west side of Andrews. Um, is a smaller grassy area for study and private conversation to the east of the debate area, um, plentiful seating, canopy trees, and raised elevation define this space. Um, it's by far the most shaded area in the courtyard. And the final room to the east, connecting Andrews and Blanton, provides a clear view towards the statue of Diana, the goddess of the hunt, the moon, and nature. Thank you all very much for your time, and I'm excited to hear your feedback. Anna, do you have a Part T diagram? I think that was one of the things you guys worked on, yes? A Part T? Yeah. Um, not up with me right now. So why don't you just draw it on top of the plan? Draw it. How do I draw it here? So I'm nervous, so my lines are straight. Well, that's the path system, but what's the party? Um, I I do this to highlight the specific rooms. Is that not? Well. It looks like the paths. It does, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what, the thing I'm, I, I get the rooms, and we can talk about the rooms individually, and that makes sense, and there are some qualities about all of them. But as a whole, it seems like a, 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 a set of aggregates, not one thing yet. Because I think the part T is not clear. Um, especially with the with the um, that diagonal path, that guy, mm -hmm. right? 
they seem to say, I've got a room, I've got a room, rooms are kind of rectangular. And then there's this funny, well, the, the big main event space is carved into. And so it seems to, to um, I don't know, erode the intent. Uh, the and so I again I think it's if the party is molecule atom 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 what's the big molecule I don't it's hard to figure that one out the um, the the part about saving the trees I certainly appreciate um, but again well once you did that step. I don't know if you were bold enough. Um, I think you, sh you you took those trees and then shied away from them rather than try to grab them. But do you want to elaborate on what you meant by grab them? Yeah. Um, do the trees, the trees seem to become sort of vestiges of the old courtyard not the new thing that you're creating, right? So okay. you found a you found a um, you found a resource on site. Say, hey, this is special. I want to save it. He's like, yeah, okay, I'll just dance around it a little bit. But I saved it. Isn't that enough? Not quite. Okay. So your idea would be to kind of centralize those and draw attention to the. I would use the actual partee to figure out how I might use those in their best, in their best way, not as simply being present. Mm -hmm. um, and it does come to the matter of the, of the whole. Um, it, it just seems, it just in the end, I, there were the best intents here, but it, I think the, the total courtyard composition is a little too timid especially when you're ready to banish the cars, right? You say, I'm gonna save the trees and kill the cars. Boom, okay, you have just cleared the deck to do something spectacular and bold. And, and because you've got little rooms, it's, not, it's no longer bold. Okay. Okay, yeah, I mean, in some ways it is comparable to the I mean, there are, yeah, remaining elements of the other design. Um, I guess my boldness was trying to open this central space and crash through that and kind of have all rooms lead into that, but. Yeah, I think, so yeah, you're a little too deferential to a lousy courtyard. Like the, the, the thing that's there right now is a mess. Um, before Hope started using this, as a, as a project for studio, I used to do a walk with third semester, sometimes second semester students, and we would go and visit courtyards on campus and basically decompose them. And then after we did that with really nice, clear spaces, we would show up and did this thing and I'd say, what do you do with it? And he was like, all right, uh, uh, what, uh, what have you done to us? <laughs> students were not happy. And Hope started saying, okay, we're just gonna design it and preempt that. So it really is the existing conditions are a mess. Um, so, which is why you've got to do something more active. The fact that you save the trees, that's great. The fact you banish the cars, that's great. Parking will hate you, but that's okay. They're humorless people anyway. But then use, use the conditions you've set for yourself. Um, yeah, because not everything in the past is great or even good. Jane, over to you. Okay. Um, Hello. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Jane, for solving your te technical difficulty. I couldn't, I couldn't hear her presentation, so I had to uh, oh. research other things for technical um, assistance. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> that. I can hear again now, but I apologize for that. Oh, that's Thank okay. You. So I can only go on what I see. <laughs> um, and uh, I think you've done a good job of defining the space in a plan view. 
but I didn't really get a sense of volume when I looked at the sections um, in terms of how these spaces respond to the program of celebration, debate, and ceremony. Could you go back to the section? Yeah, I'm trying to. Just for a second. I think I might have to stop annotating. I don't know. If you had a, um, I'll, I'll clear the annotation. That um, I can do that. Now you had one with color on it. Where was that? You had the. There we go. Okay. So where was this taken from? Which way are you looking? You're looking from the southeast into the site, or uh, it's southwest. Southwest. Okay. So this is the expanse of lawn and then the side rooms are elevated around it. And what, what was your biggest challenge in saving those trees that you had to save and meeting the program requirements? Uh, well, we were kind of just talking about that. I think, yeah, trying to create a unique design while saving those. Um, yeah, trying to create something different. Um, and I, I kind of just planted around them and with them. So that might have created a sense of similarity to the old design. But um, I did it. OK, thanks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I had the disadvantage of not being able to hear your presentation. But okay. I appreciate the work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Anna, as we make the, the, the final transition, and I think to build upon Adeline's and Jane's comments. And the fact that you elected to keep all of the heritage trees. What is your attitude toward change? Toward change? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. Because, right, or what is your added larger, you know, frame of reference or attitude toward changing the whole courtyard? I don't know. I, when I think of changing everything, I have a visual of just gutting the entire thing and, you know, a big brown dirt pile and everything goes and, I don't know, part of my ethos I like to think is working with, with what's there, the best of what's there and trying to create health for the soil and the people there. So I don't, the idea of changing everything is I'm kind of abrasive to that, I guess. In some ways. Okay. Alan, does that answer, does that give you a bit more insight into um, the reasoning behind some of Anna's decisions? Sure. But should I do my Michael makes dinner story then, Ben? I think you should, because I was going to say, now, but I think that the key statement by Anna was the health of the soil. And uh, yes, if we do keep those heritage trees, the disturbance has potential, you know, deleterious effects, right? But I think design or landscape architecture, with it comes an embrace, a, a, a strong embrace of change. So tell us about dinner. So, so um, a while ago, we had Michael Van Bachenberg come down to meet with and a, he gave a talk, but he also had a private session with the landscape students. Um, and so, as is not, not, not uncommonly, he started with food analogies. And he said, and somebody said, okay, look, and part of this was because one of his principals in his firm is a guy named Gulliver Shepherd, who's actually trained as an architect, but now works as a landscape architect. And so, Michael said, okay, uh, okay, look, think of it this way. You're going to make dinner for your friends. These are your best friends forever but you don't see them very often. So you want to make a special dinner. So you got two choices here. Option one, you pull out all your recipe books and you find the perfect recipe um, and you find it. And then you go to Whole Foods or Central Market and you find the very best ingredients for, that's on the list in the perfect proportions with, to the degree you can afford it, uh, but you have everything perfect and you come home and you're preheating the oven and it's stove top and all of your pans have been re-scrubbed and it's perfect. And down to the last minute when your friends arrive, it's ready. That's one option. Other option. Well, okay, your friends are coming over. You like them a lot. 
What do you got? Okay, uh, you got some bow tie pasta. It's not really your favorite, but it's there. You have a decent cheese. That's good. Um, you've got some some broccoli that's a little turning, but still good. And you've got a really great bottle of wine. So, if you choose option one, go be an architect. If you choose option two, you're a landscape architect. Because what you're going to do is make the awesome thing out of some okay pasta, some vegetables that are going a little bit bad, a decent block of cheese, and a great bottle of wine. Right? You pick the trees as your great bottle of wine. But then you didn't make the other ingredients your own to make your friends the best dinner possible. I like the second meal. Okay. Yeah. So make like, it next time. <laughs> I like the analogy. And I think that one yeah. of the things that students really don't realize is the amount of care and time and expense that it takes to really smartly save a tree on site. So it, you have to really be willing to make that investment to do that and invest in your design to accommodate that. And so, you know, when you save them all, are you doing that? You know, I mean, it's a question, nobody can answer it. You know, I mean, everyone has a different interpretation of it, but it's probably, it's a really big question. And your idea about disturbance is well taken because that happens a lot. And what would happen most of the time is you would go in, um, a couple of months before and you would root prune that tree before anybody even got in there with any earthwork, you know, and you would, you would prune the top third out and you'd probably have an overhead irrigation spray to reduce evapotranspiration. And it gets really costly to save big trees mm -hmm. and uh, even more costly to relocate them. So you need to think about, that's why I liked Alan's analogy, because think about that one thing that's really special and how that figures into your design. And if it's that tree, then, you know, make it a big deal. Okay. Thank you guys, that was interesting. Okay, uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, Ashwini uh, is next, and then we have one more student. So after, oh, it's all the A's. I lumped you all together. So uh, after Ashwini, we have Andrew and uh, we'll come to a conclusion for this morning. Thank you very much, Anna. Hello, if you guys are ready, I can start. Please begin. Okay. Um, hello and good morning. Um, this is the honors courtyard today. We were asked to reimagine the courtyard that is surrounded by the four residence halls, heritage trees, and a vehicular drive that goes around the statue of Diana. The new design proposal revolves around three main aspects. The first is to introduce a new road layout that intends to separate the student activities from the vehicular drive. It also uh, frames the experience of celebration during major events by allowing family and friends to ascend into the Littlefield Courtyard, uh, witnessing the statue of Diana on one side and the events happening on the other. Second, an elevated plinth is, uh, that is in compliance with the universal design is added to unify the spaces to give the same experience. It connects the various regions for debate, discussion, uh, intimate contemplation, and allows for the passage through the promenade that leads you on the main dais and the ceremonial space here. It also makes a direct connection with the Andrews facade here. Finally, water on either side is added to emphasize the scale and the primary axes that was initially dominated by Correthers and Andrews uh, that, that, were, uh, that was thrusting into the courtyard. And this helps uh, make the balance again, strike the balance. Um, this is a planting plan. These are the heritage trees that were existing. Uh, these smaller round ones are the bald cypresses. 
Um, these um, are the undercover or the hedges that are used to um, emphasize the building um, boundary. The smaller ones here are the prairie or the Texas native plantations that are happening across. Um, uh, this is a view uh, showing the intimate spaces with the bald cypresses on one side and the grasses and uh, the AD accessible ramps uh, show, uh, also happening here. A lot of uh, importance has been given for uh, universal design. So uh, this view is showing that. The second view is showing the larger gathering area uh, that could be used for graduations or uh, for guest speakers or other performances. And this view is showing that. This is a bird's eye view of the entire space. Uh, this is a space for intimate discussions, smaller gathering areas, the larger gradu graduation and ceremony ceremonial area. Uh, this is a Diana here. I have a few sections that, oh, sorry. Yeah, I have a few sections that show the change in grade uh, happening. This is a plan and it's cut facing that way. Um, we have corredors on this side and the wild cypresses that form the space. Um, then I have the smaller sections that show the various grain, grade changes that happen at various spots. Um, this is the gathering space um, that's cut here. And then this is the ramp that leads you from one space to another. And this is cut at this bridge here. Um, and finally, I have a view of um, uh, the Yuri Tower in the background and uh, the view of the entire space here. That's it. Thank you. Do you have a grading plan? I do not have a grading plan. Sorry. Okay, because that I gotta say, there's a lot of accomplishment here in terms of making major and minor spaces and delineating boundaries, all that kind of stuff. I'm having trouble believing the actual layout mm -hmm. because of because of the way I know the actual site works. Um, and so I'm sure you can do some some of the stuff in the middle of the terrace. And yeah, you can do that. I'm not, I, I'm not convinced the road works. Okay. If the road doesn't work, then the northeast corner doesn't work. And then we're in a whole cascade of what? <laughs> so so I, I, in some ways, we're almost having to approach this as if, as if Lenote came in and flattened everything out, and we've got a parterre. So you just have to, you're gonna have to, your, your holiday break is gonna have to be making a grading plan. Otherwise, you're gonna show this to somebody for a job interview, and they're gonna say, Does this work? And you're gonna have to say, Trust me. You don't wanna have to be in that situation. You wanna demonstrate, not say trust. Um, so there's that. The other, the other issue with, is that, and I know you couldn't get into the site which is a big deal, but it also looks like you've blocked off a lot of windows on the ground floor. Um, actually, uh, if you're talking about this side, uh, there is, so I've given, oh, sorry, let me go back to that. So um, there's just um, ground cover here and grass here. So if uh, the windows are not affected by it, well, I was looking at the elevations you've seen to render these things in, and you're blocking, it looks like you're blocking windows. Okay. So, awesome. so here there actually are no windows, but I'd still be a little bit worried about that. Um, go another, there's another one, maybe it's the next yeah. slide. Yeah, like all that's, so, so if I'm looking at, at the building on the south, whatever those, 
those small trees, shrubs are, you're, there are windows that are unhappy. There are now occupants who are really unhappy. And also over here on Carruthers, whatever that looks like binding coming up the building, that's um, yeah, that's that's a bit problematic too. So I think so. There are a couple. So that's easily handled, handled, handleable. Um, but the bigger thing to concern yourself with is not as I can whack these things down. It's what does it mean to be in the building, in these rooms, and actually looking out on the space. Um, what you've done is you have you've made a really strong center in the courtyard, but by doing that, you've sort of obliterated the edges. So you just I'm going to build a fort. I'm going to make a box inside this box, and you haven't doesn't appear that there's the notion of like what does it mean for me to live in this storm room and look out my window every morning, and how do I begin to engage and, and appreciate that? Because um, that's a that's a that'll be an important thing of you being a landscape architect is think about the the poor schmuck who's stuck in an office all day who gets to look outside, but only gets to look outside. And so I think there's some, there's some just concerns about that. I think also this is um, another, uh, a different scale of understanding relations between landscape and buildings, which is, so we are in an institutional setting um, and a question is, do, or maybe should, institutional buildings have foundation plantings? So across the American suburbs, we put foundation plantings at the bottom of everything to hide the bottom layers of cinder block. Institutional buildings tend to have their own masonry course that says, look, I'm pretty by itself. So you, you also haven't done, you have, well, you have arguably not done the architects a favor. Now, that's your right because it's your design and forget the architects, but Again, it's a, it's a think about in the future kind of concern. Okay. Um, also, these are not foundation plannings. Like they're just to uh, give more emphasis to the boundary. Um, is uh, that? <laughs> well, we, we can quibble about this one, but you'll probably lose. Um, are they blocking the foundation of the building? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, um, also, if this helps, I don't know if this helps, but this is the existing grade. So do you still think that it would not work? This is the I, existing I, 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 I appreciate the, the, the trick of trying to get me to say, of course, I believe it now. <laughs> Until I see a grading plan, no, I don't believe it. <laughs> Next time then. Good, yeah. good try. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for playing, but I'm going to turn you over to Jane now. <laughs> All right. Um, I appreciate how you showed me an aerial photograph at the very beginning. That was very helpful to orient me to the site and what was going on. Because I've been in that site, but it's been a while. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that really helps uh, get an idea of what some of the relationships are to the site and within the site. And I guess the biggest question I have is you're making a really, really strong statement here, an axial relationship between those two buildings that I don't quite understand. Now, I think you would have to, as a client, you would really have to do some hard convincing to make me, you know, unless the building, unless one of those two buildings is named after me, I would have a hard time with that at strong axial relationship and, and with a lack of attention to the other two buildings. Um, I'm not sure that works or how it works. Um, on the other hand, I really appreciate and I like your selection of the bald cypress, maybe not the spacing, but that's something that um, would do well in that space, would provide a light shade and would also provide a seasonal interest for all of Alan's workers that are looking from inside from the windows. And I think that would be a, a definite plus. Um, so I think that in the, and he's already talked about the, the blocking of the views and the, and the vegetation. Um, but I think your, I don't know grading wise if it works, but I think your central plan, even though I, I'm not a fan of the axial, the strong axial view, I think your layering uh, works pretty well and in, in your approach. Um, but I would think about how the site needs to function and what are those relationships between the buildings? Is there an important relationship between them? I don't know. Um, 
but that's something that I think you would have to consider in how the space is used. And I did like your backdrop for the um, graduation pictures. You're thinking about how people would use the space, um, but I would probably reconfigure. I, I like some of the elements, but I think it would need a, a strong reconfiguration to um, get me to buy off on your design. Thank um, you. Thank you. Also to answer your question about the axis, um, Blanton has a pretty plain facade. Oh, sorry, I think. Blanton has a very plain facade and earlier, um, I mean, right now, currently, Corridors has the primary axis that goes this way and Blanton is just like, it has um, uh, stairs that go, I can show it to you in the plan. Um, sorry. Okay, so it has stairs on either side and it has a very blank facade here. It has nothing interesting is happening here. So um, the idea was to make this space more interesting and to make the access read into the existing geometry of the building of Andrews. Um, mm -hmm. Also, at Corridors, uh, if you look at the uh, architecture of Corridors, it kind of trusts itself onto the courtyard. None of the other buildings, I mean, except for Andrews do that, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of balancing what Andrews had um, by using it, it as to be part of my design. Um, yeah, so that was the intention behind it. Jane, well, I, I, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. It's visual and those are the building facades, but what if I live in one of those buildings or what if I work in one of those buildings? How would I feel about it if I was in the blank face building and you've oriented the whole cart? You know, the users, you have to think about the users and how they use the space as well as the visual facades of the building because um, you don't want to, you don't want to shortchange people that are paying the same rent for that interior space and what they get to enjoy outdoors. Right. If that's the case, but you know, you've kind of set a hierarchy mm -hmm based on one thing. And I think you need to be a little bit more thoughtful about all the elements. Okay. That's it, Hope. Okay. Uh, now, you know, I was gonna say, Ashwini, it might not be my most favorite of the images that you've shared, but let's go to the graduation. So uh, there's part of the narrative that Ashwini did not mention. Uh, she, uh, the, it would be your last, your last image, number 10. And uh, she spoke about, you know, early on in the project, she spoke about the, the ritual of your parents dropping you off here in the honor, honors courtyard to say, you know, as you start your career. And so that's the whole, that's one of the reasons behind the drive through the relocation of Diana standing at the base of Littlefield. And because from the base of Littlefield, you can see the UT tower even though it's like not on axis, it's oblique. So there really is something about that, at that moment of graduation or at that moment of saying goodbye to your parents when they bring you to college for the first time, there is that really purposeful setup. And Ashwini didn't mention that, but I think the fact that that was part, that drove a lot of her initial decisions about what to do at the base of Littlefield. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to remind you, that, remind us. Let's change Thank my you, perception. Hope. Thank you, Hope. Because You're I welcome. did that very same thing at Florida State. I took one of my kids there and they were having a summer graduation. I said, that's where I want to see you in four years. So, <laughs> so I think there's some advantage to that, but I, I think you should have pointed that out that, you know, that meeting because it didn't really come across in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I've explained to the everybody that that's my job today is to refocus sometimes something they, they told me but didn't share with you. Um, Ashwini, do you have any questions for your panel as we make our transition to the last student today? I just have one question for Alan. He kind of mentioned about the views through the windows. Did he have any suggestion? I want to know if he has any suggestions about how I could achieve that in this setting. <laughs> Dr. Shearer? Is he thinking? No, sorry, I was muted. I thought I, 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 
I went to unmute, but I muted myself. So going back to Jane's comments also. So part one, don't put big shrubs in front of windows. That's easy. But part two is think about just the view out of just say a select number of windows, right? You've clearly built a 3D model of this thing. You could put a viewport wherever you wanted to, mm -hmm. right? And simply say, oh, okay, from this window, do I have a sense of foreground, middle bound, foreground, middle ground, background? Now, this, this, the, the, this scale of that is going to be compressed. It's not like standing on a mountaintop and looking over the entire state of Colorado. Right? But do you have a sense of there is a landing right in front of you, there's this bit of a, a pause, and then there's a backdrop to it? I think you can begin to do that. And I think what that would do is that would likely begin to add a, and I, I agree with Jane, there's a lot of good sense of layering here, but they might add a couple more layers into the landscape here, but mm -hmm. push back from the buildings. I think that um, you know, when we were talking about Anna's project just before yours, it was that she was a little too deferential to the site. I think you were not deferential enough. Mm -hmm. You said, I got a design, I'm, I'm putting it in there. And so there needs to be a bit of a give and take on, in both of those. And so I think that's what it would be. Again, you know how to do the right, since you don't have to construct perspective yourself, you got the model, <coughs> drop in some viewports, use those as parts of your tests. All right, thank you. Oh, now you're muted. Excuse me, I muted myself in the unmute process. Andrew, thank you very much, Ashwini. Andrew, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. I saw your visage earlier. Sorry if I, sorry if I popped in preemptively. No, 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 That's, it's good to be on deck. So- um, Hello everyone. Thank you. I'm, I'm still reeling from that dinner analogy. It's, good it's a good one. All right. So in its current form, the, the honors courtyard is a set of disconnected spaces. It's dominated by a vehicular drive and it prioritizes the car over the, the scholarly experience, but it also presents the opportunity to be reinvented as a platform for academic and for student life. And this proposal aims to do that through the creation of three distinct but connected spaces. In the north, mesquite trees frame an outdoor classroom, which the statue of Diana watches over as a symbol of intellectual pursuit. And this is to be a setting for formal lectures, but also a, a safe space in which students can express their ideas, challenge each other and their instructor and engage in spirited academic debate. At center, the currently underutilized terrace above the reading room of Carruthers Hall is to be transformed and recaptured into a stage on which graduates receive their diploma as their loved ones watch from below in the shade of an oak tree. And finally, a secluded meadow provides honors residents and their friends and the larger student community with a place in which to gather and engage in recreation and escape from the rigors and the expectations of their academic life. The proposal maintains accessible, maintains accessible slopes throughout, as well as a series of bioswales which delineate each of the courtyard's program spaces and connect both at a point along uh, the facade of Blanton Hall, and then finally at a point along the east-west circulation path before they exit the courtyard into the larger system. And these bioswales, in addition to capturing stormwater, treating it as it moves through the courtyard and beyond, provide a lush edge between each outdoor room of the courtyard and permeable low water crossings above them, in addition to giving a strong visual threshold between the three spaces, provide a connecting path to Blanton, which in its current form is dominated by service uses, vehicular uses, and trash and such things. And for the most part on that account is uh, visually disconnected from the larger scheme of the courtyard. So in terms of plantings, escarbon live oaks are to be added at the north, just south of Littlefield Hall, in addition to three preserved heritage trees. And this is to strengthen what is sort of an existing alley of trees given that this is a very important east-west axis of circulation through the courtyard. On the west, widest in the East University, and on either end is where the exit and entrance and vice versa are to the courtyard. As previously mentioned, thornless mesquite trees are placed in planters in order to 
frame the classroom and the planters and trees, in addition to providing some additional seating, um, create a visual barrier to, again, make a space in which students can concentrate on their classes, debate, challenge each other, and uh, have a safe space to express their views. And in addition to buffalo grass turf throughout the proposed courtyard, the bioswale plantings include a thick border of inland sea oats that surrounds button bush and Mexican bush sage and blue mist flower, so that these natural edges also have an ornamental and a blooming quality and a, an element to attract pollinators. And finally, in sort of a nod to the urban waterways we all know and love in Austin, a row of columnar bald cypresses at the rear of the theater provides a picturesque backdrop, as well as the added benefit of some visual softening of whatever uh, vehicular and service needs may need to remain connected to planting for the day-to-day -day needs of the university. So in this set of sections, we see the shaded seating that's provided by the live oak tree in, in the central theater and the view up to Carruthers. And the circulation paths that run through the theater and around the tree and up to Carruthers in this time of celebration act as a sort of aisle um, to address the idea of procession that the graduates walk up to Carruthers, receive their diploma and process back to their seats. But also important is that these circulation paths in combination with the tree divide the space up into two smaller ones for the times of the year when smaller gatherings or study groups or more informal classes may wish to make use of this space, especially if the outdoor classroom is already in use. So we see in this view the outdoor classroom students taking advantage of this planter seating and the seating in the lawn. And as they engage with their instructor, they also have a view of Diana as another reminder of the intellectual pursuit that they're engaged in as they challenge each other. And the relative openness within the enclosure of the mesquites of the classroom is also important that it encourages the students and the instructor to sit on the same level, to engage each other as peers and so that all views are heard and that um, the students feel that they can challenge each other and their instructor. Peering through the bioswale behind the theater, we see a small graduation in full swing and as graduates process to and from Carruthers, in front of their loved ones and peers, we see a young graduate atop the Carruthers Terrace. And as they look down to their loved ones, they may also see a glimpse of Diana and remember their favorite class. They might perhaps look up to the southeast of the UT Tower and appreciate the place they've called home for the last several years. Or they may look over to the meadow and reminisce on the memories they've made with their cherished friends. And ultimately, this is a recapturing of what is an important viewpoint in the courier that is currently underutilized then by allowing the view of the various academic experiences that the student has undergone throughout their time in the courtyard. It can contextualize the whole experience and frame the celebration in which uh, they've reached the culmination of their college career. So in closing on this overall image of the courtyard, we see these, the set of spaces as a connected whole, providing a lush setting for academic experience, whether it be celebration of the completion of the college career, as well as the moments and spaces in between the debates, the classes, the gatherings, and the lives of students that make the memories of their college career so important. Thank you. So overall, a very nice presentation. Um, but if we, um, if you dropped the Diana language as you use it, does the scheme still hold up? Well, I think that the north-south axis is Diana's placement is for the classroom, but also for the north-south axis as you viewed from Littlefield. Again, it's oh yeah, no, it's not Diana the object. It's your use of the of Diana in your description in your narrative. Does the design hold up if you drop your usage, your description of Diana in this narrative? I believe so in that the form of the classroom is still there. And I think what the existing element that I'm attempting to capture most strongly is the Carruthers Terrace and the view from it as a, as a celebratory moment. So I would say yes. Great, I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with you also. And you want to drop the way you're talking about Diana. Um, Diana is the goddess of the hunt, but that is not the pursuit of knowledge. The hunt is to kill things. So come to UT, be Diana, kill it. Athena, oh, wants to jump in. 
I'm thinking you you, you you took a metaphor one step too far. And unfortunately, there's going to be some wise ass in the audience who's going to call you on it. And the conversation we would have right now is you understanding mythology, not about your design. We want you to make sure we talk about your design. So it, it's, it's really critical for you, for all designers to, to think through how they're going to present and be smart, right? Be evocative, be, give imaginations. That's a really powerful thing that you can do. But if you overplay that, it can turn on you really quickly. Yeah. So let's Diana, not the, knowledge. Yeah. But, and that framing of Diana, I think, was, was primarily in response to its history um, as a sculpture done by a female sculptor in honor of the, the female intellectuals for whom three of the buildings are named. And in that, so there was, there was a specific, specific context of Diana. Not your story, not what you told us. You laid on three times, pursuit of knowledge, Diana. So I'm thinking like, yeah, great. Come to knowledge to kill, uh, kill it. Come to Texas to kill ideas. Oh my God, I don't want that for my honor student. So we're gonna stop talking about that now <laughs> um, and go back to the design. I think actually one of the things you actually have done, the, 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 general, um, the general theme of several places that are somehow connected to one bigger whole has, has been pretty successful here. I mean, I think that you actually, it, it's actually the party is actually clear enough and the, the kind of wide swath you've got going north to south allows that, allows you to both feel enclosed-ish, but yet I can go to the next room also. I think that's a strength. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about the bald cypress next to Blanton, because yeah, you're hiding the cars, but you're really hiding Blanton. Blanton gets no love ever in this studio. Um, I mean, you're not the first to do it. You won't be the last to do it. Um, there have probably even been more, even bolder attempts to hide it from the rest of civilization. But I think you're not, you're not doing it fair justice. Oh, who wants to chime in? Oh, but it just bakes in that summer, western, end of the day sunshine. It is just flat. There is not one ounce of shade. Then, then peel off a living wall on its, on, on its facade. Okay, fine. Um, which I realize starts to make you architects, not landscape architects, but um, even the way you des described it, Andrew, it felt like, yeah, I'm hiding the cars, wink, wink. <laughs> I'm blocking that damn building that I don't want to see. Um, so that, I think also, and, and I bet Jay will have some ideas about this. On the one hand, I do like the idea of planting buffalo grass through here. I think it actually has lots of strong possibilities, both visually in terms of making, you know, habitat for, in this case, more insects than actual critters. I don't know if people are going to want to sit on it for classes. I think at some point they're saying it's not, that's not the Bermuda grass that I think I should be sitting on. And how do you handle that? Um, and it may be a matter of, of giving up a little real estate to making both kinds of lawns. So there's this sort of edge of buffalo grass, but there's still some other occupiable, just we'll call it more generic lawn that we all are accustomed to. So that's a, that's a question. I do like the idea. I just don't know if it will be used in a way that you would envision. Yeah, there was actually, I had done earlier renderings of, with, of this with lar longer buffalo grass, which I think aesthetically oh. was really pleasing, but of course it became pretty problematic from the standpoint of how do you move across this yeah. accessibly. And there's another, there's another, another quirk to it, which I think can be done, it can be done, which is what, when people sh showed up for the first time, they're dropping their sons and daughters off to the honors program for the first time and they see your buffalo grass. Is the, is the typical person in the world going to say, wow, it seems kind of, they can't mow a lawn here. What am I, what's going on? Um, and that's just a challenge whenever one tries to put in we'll call it functional grasses as opposed to strictly ornamental grasses. Um, and would it take away from the lushness of the swales if the grass were too long? Maybe, maybe. maybe. I mean, it uh, depends on, you could, 
figure that you could read it, replant the swales too, I bet. So I think you can work your, you can work through that one. Um, but it's, it's the, it, it's the, it would be the, the immediate effect of someone not knowing what the intent was, seeing buffalo grass kind of shaggy. It's a tough one. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm done for a while. Jane? Hi, Andrew. Um, I'm not going to go over the things that Alan went over. I think you have a pretty successful um, arrangement here, configuration. I can see myself moving through that space, but I do have some specific questions. Um, particularly, I'm trying to understand what this is. Is this like a, some type of a grate or what is this material right in here? Yeah, the idea was a permeable, uh, like low water crossing of probably, you know, a steel grate or okay, steel grating or something like a permeable crossing, probably yeah, steel grating or a, a very a low steel bridge or something. And then the area, that that area over here is the bioswale? Yes. Okay. Um, and people live in these buildings, right? Is that, is that right? People live here? Okay. Um, I would be concerned about the species from an allergenic point of view and some of those pollinators. Um, I have allergies to them and in doing plantings around dorms, um, some universities won't let you use those types of plants because of, they don't want students to be um, sick or sneezing or you know anything like that. Um, and then, I mean, we've already talked about the, the bald cypress. Um, but I guess I was wondering in terms of the, how you see the hierarchy of spaces. When you looked at this and you, and you told you were supposed to have celebration, debate and ceremony, what did that mean to you in terms of the hierarchy of your arrangement on site? What was the most important? Or was there one that was most important? I mean, certainly from a use standpoint, in terms of the experience, the, the Carruthers Terrace, and by that, the, the east-west axis. And so the theater space being hierarchically, I think the most important in terms of the academic life. But I think I would echo what Alan said in that the north-south axis, the implication of that is connecting all of the rooms and making them feel accessible to each other was also a, mm -hmm. a guiding principle. Yeah. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is that buffalo grass. Um, I had a yard full of buffalo grass um, and I had a special area of St. Augustine for my guests and seating. Um, because the buffalo grass, I mean, we kept it mowed and everything. But it's not great to walk on. It looks okay, but you're not going to get a finished lawn look like you have here in a formal space. I mean, I guess what I'm saying, it may just look a bit out of context when it's nowhere else around, right? Is anywhere is there any is there any other buffalo? I can't I don't remember seeing any buffalo grass on campus in a courtyard space. Yeah, I mean, one, one precedent we had in one class of ours was some of it used as turf at Dell Medical Center, but that's about as close as to something near campus. Uh -huh. that I could think that's of. okay. Um, but is it gonna have that finished look? It looks green. From a distance, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference. Up close, you will. And it really depends on how you um, maintain it and what your maintenance schedule is. If you mow it like grass, it looks pretty much like grass. If you, you know, if you treat it like, if you maintain it like turf, but what you're having here looks like you're letting it grow a little bit longer. And then I think you're gonna have some problems. But you can mow it just like turf. I mean, we, I mowed it every week, um, but you're not gonna have the same look that you have here. Right. That, that's something you need to think about in the selection of your plant materials is not only how's it going to look initially, but how's it going to look over time and how it's going to look in different seasons. It won't, yeah, look, it won't look like the cut velvet part there. No, it's not going to look that good in winter. Even and I knew, I knew by the specificity of my 
planting. It'll be a ten in the summer, stuff. but it won't look like turf in the winter, like like the other turf around here looks. So that'd be something to consider. Okay. And I agree with the talk about the statue. Um, statues are controversial anyway, so I would not bring a lot of attention to anyone I use in a design unless that was the purpose of the design. Because <laughs> there's a lot of um, a lot of controversy in terms of what they should be, who they should be about, and what the interpretation of them is um, at the time of construction and over time. So I would probably stay away from an emphasis of statue in any event. Right. Understood. And I'll say, uh, Alan, I think uh, it resonated with me when you told us several weeks ago about telling a story, but it's also good to know that there's a point at which you can go too far. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Andrew, um, since uh, you are wrapping up our morning session, so, and we are timely, which is unique in my world. Uh, I wanted to uh, give you the opportunity to submit a question to your panel and your classmates, if they all wanna tune in and share their, their presences with us, if they had questions uh, for the panel in light of their own uh, work that we'll see you later or comments that were made about, um, that were made earlier during the day. So um, I wanted to, so let Andrew make the transition and hopefully your classmates will tune in. Or Andrew, did you have any questions? Uh, yeah, to follow up Jane with what you were asking about um, the hierarchy of spaces. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if, if there's any other suggestions or any other devices you might imagine for creating an even stronger hierarchy in the spaces of this program. well one you know i mean i guess the the hierarchy is the designer's interpretation sometimes it's programmatic that a particular client wants to emphasize one aspect as primary and the others as secondary and tertiary but um i would i guess i was thinking that the middle space would be the most formal and the most paid attention to so when i saw the buffalo grass i said oh, i love buffalo grass but that's not a fit <laughs> i mean that's what it seemed like a uh, kind of oppositional, if you will. Um, and that's why, and the other thing is that when you design these spaces and, and I've done work at universities and my first question is who maintains it and what's their budget? Because, you know, the space you design, um, you may thinking of a corporate client who has a, a healthy maintenance budget, but you know, I've done the same, basically the same design on two different streetscapes and it can look a world of difference in terms of how it's maintained. So um, that would be one of my concerns. I don't think you've done anything that, that um, destroys that, but, but I would keep that in mind. And the use of materials, do they, know, do they know how to maintain the grasses that you suggest and when they need to be mowed or when they need to be thin? Because what's happening in some of these bioswales, particularly in Oregon, is they're getting weeds in them. So what do you keep? You know, you have these things you created, but these native natural vegetation bioswales, and now they're getting weeds in a lot of them. And that's, you know, labor intensive to get out the weeds. You know, you can't do it by chemical means necessarily when you're trying to have a ecological bioswale. So that's a lot of um, handwork to be done. So that's another consideration that you think about when you're designing these is, who's going to maintain it and how they're going to maintain it. Cause you want to make sure that, cause unfortunately design lasts after the designer's gone, you know, that we finish a design, we get the check, we move on to the next project. And um, in my research and case studies on projects, I've had planners and designers ask me about, Oh, what happened then? You know, they want me to tell them about the, the post occupancy design because they're not there after the design happens. So um, you want to make sure that whatever you design that you've done enough to keep as much integrity as you can after you're gone. So, and, I, and I think you've made an attempt to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the, uh, from your classmates today for our jury or panel, any comments? I have a question uh, sort of about how to frame process in a 
in a setting like this or like with a client. So like Franny had this really cool collage in her presentation that I was just wondering like how would, if that was part of your process, like this like artistic exploration, how would you frame that in a way that like celebrated it and helped move the conversation forward? Um, I think the best thing is to show your process through a series of sketches or models that you can see. And, and one of the most effective ones um, that I've seen is Todd Johnson from Design Workshop. He's no longer there. He now teaches at Utah State, but Design Workshop has a book and um, they have several books, but this is a, one about their projects and they show Crescent Park, which is in Denver. And Todd Johnson shows some really loose sketches that he did. And then with that, next to it, he has a photograph, a plan view of the finished product. And you can see, you know, just from how he did, just in those two illustrations, you can see what he did. I mean, it's really, really effective and really minimal in terms of, he didn't have a bunch of sketches. He just said, okay, this was my idea. This is what it looks like. And it looks very much like that, but it's a really loose sketch just done in pencil and it really works. So think about, the steps through the process and also bringing your client through the process because when a client only sees a finished project they may not be familiar with the process you went through to get there and i think if you could educate them about the process it minimizes some of the off questions that you might get you know we talked about and i don't want to pick on andrew but you know you talked about that statue for a long time that wasn't your main message so when you go through the process, you're trying to convince people and support what your thesis is, what your main message is, what you're trying to get across. You know, if you have the thing where you want, what's the takeaway I want this person to take, you know, what the two things I want this person to take away from my presentation and be thinking about that the whole time and framing that the whole time and reiterating it because people that aren't familiar with design and I can see it even in doing these reviews, you know, I went to UT and I'm familiar with that space but I've been there in a while and, and you all just jump in like, here it is and hope to get a real good introduction. And this happens in classes, but remember when you get out in the real world, everybody's not gonna have the same level of information about your project. And right now you're used to, to working with each other and talking about it. And when you're in practice, you're used to talking to your project team about it. So you need to make sure that you step back. And um, you know, I would always, I have somebody that didn't know anything about design, I would make a presentation to you before I met with the client just to see did they understand it? Did my grandmother understand it? Did my six-year-old understand it? Okay, then I'm, I'm on my way. So, and that helps. Thank you. And also on that, it's it's important to simply be able to say why you're showing someone any kind of representation. There may be things that you doodle on in the quiet of your home to help you think through things. And they actually don't make any intuitive sense even to you yet three or four drawings down the road, they do. But so you wouldn't want to show that first doodle because it's like, I don't know what I was thinking yet. But the audience should be, you should be able to tell the audience, I'm showing you this and it's important, here's why. Whether it be a construction drawing for a tree pit or a Zaha Hadid painting. Thank you. And, and sometimes a sketch explains why you couldn't do something the client wanted, what the obstacle was or how it doesn't work, or you know that sometimes that's as important as what it does, especially when a client has a strong idea about an element they want and you just and you know there's it's just not going to work on the site. So, those really help a lot. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all for your time this morning. Thank you for the comments from your classmates. Thank your classmates who snuck in with uh, information on demand uh, based upon some things that might be written in the land in the catalog of the collection of sculptures and such uh, for the university. So I'm going to thank throw out a thank you to Catherine. Um, I thank you to both Jane and Alan. I did not introduce Jane early on. I know her bio is part of the package that was sent to all faculty and students, but Jane um, is now at uh, Texas A&M, 
but uh, she did wear the orange uh, for many years while she was here completing her PhD. And it was um, my pleasure to get to know Jane uh, while she was here. And I thank her for making a repeat, uh, a visit. And uh, we'll have a, a today and we'll have a chance for Jane to revisit us again uh, later in the afternoon uh, for the third session. So uh, Jane, thank you very much. Dr. Shearer, Alan, my colleague, thank you again uh, for your lecture to the students over the course of the semester and for your comments uh, in the, the 16th, you know, mid project, and then again uh, today. All right, and so thank you everyone. I'll see you back at 1230. Uh, at the last 10 minutes of every session, we're going to have a more group oriented uh, opportunity for you to quiz your panel or our panelists or jurors and then um, I'll repeat again uh, the project intro but I have copied the project intro and context slides uh, into UT box for anyone uh, who is interested in uh, reviewing the work before we get to get back together at 12:30 so all right thank you thank college you. station thank you Great job, students, and um, thanks for showing me your work. I appreciate it. And it's good to be back with the Longhorns. <laughs> okay. Bye. Good work, everyone. Thanks a lot. Um, enjoy your breaks. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, great. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we're waiting for uh, Kim, Kim Harding to join us, but uh, I think- Hello, hi, Mirka. Hi, everybody. It was great to see the work this morning. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all, and uh, great to see um, Nelly, Kimberly, um, Mirka, and um, uh, Phoebe, who are here to be your panel uh, for this portion of today's review. Um, I there's a few things that we need to go over uh, in the directory root directory for the student work. There's a file there called 20 Hasbrook LAR Studio One, which has the uh, background information. Uh, about the student about the studio, but I need to take four minutes to go through this relatively quickly because there are some things that um, need to be stated. Uh, there are five students today, approximately uh, 20 minutes per student. <coughs> I give a little bit more time to the original uh, to the early presenter to help uh, answer some questions and reorient everyone. Then at the end, there's we've been having a couple of minutes and we're from seven to 10 minutes left over at the end to open up questions to everybody, um, uh, to the panel uh, of jurors, um, as well as um, other general comments uh, for the day. Uh, this is a Landscape Architecture Studio One. It is a three credit course. It is one fifth of the courses that the students are taking over the course of the semester. So this is equivalent to the work that is done in history, that is done in tech, that is done in living systems, and what is done in visual communication. So they have a full plate this semester, and there are aspects of the courses that are coordinated. Um, the project is the uh, is to reimagine uh, the honors courtyard on the University of Texas campus. The three items of uh, program that have been discussed for the students include a platform for academic life, the volumes of experience that frame ceremony, celebration, and debate. So the students have been emph emphasized is the formation of experiential volume. It's about making exterior rooms has been the focus. The vehicle has been this sad courtyard on the UT campus. Other aspects are that it is to be lush, Edenic garden, suitable for small, small gatherings, large celebrations or graduation ceremony. You will see some diagrams where students have outlined how the graduation will operate, work, or accommodate uh, the numbers of people. There are several objectives. Many of them relate to coordination back to their other core curriculum, which includes an ADA compliant path that connects to tech. There is, they need to apply the visual communication techniques that they've had in their VizCom class with Maggie Hansen. Uh, Adam Barb has been working with the students uh, in the tech class. And then uh, the deploy of deployment of basic grammar of plant material. We looked at Dan Kiley's Miller Garden, and we also looked at um, the techniques for how Peter Walker used plants along Speedway and other portions of the UT campus. I'm interested in how they have defined volume and boundary. Volume and boundary, it's been uh, my, the mantra. There's some other things that we need to cover and these are the givens. There are several heritage trees on this site. They have been asked to keep a minimum of three. Please save the criticism or your, your comments about that for the instructor of record, which is me. Here are the heritage trees. They're along the north portion here, close to Littlefield Hall, Carruthers Dormitory, newer trees um, at the base here at Andrews, and then another single tree here at Blanton. I simplified the project. It has only been five and a half weeks. 
I took the position that they have to maintain three. Many have chosen to save all, but it has created situations that don't necessarily address all of the issues, thus being the grading and the ADA circulation. So there are costs and benefits here. I simplified the project. The third, we surveyed, um, we were able to use LIDAR and photogrammetry in September in order to document the site. The students have not had access to the courtyard at all. It's been locked 24 seven. The students um, have access to the LIDAR data. They've been able to make uh, topographic surfaces based on the LIDAR and photogrammetry. They've been able to walk through the point clouds that we were able to shoot. One of the results was that we did not use a USGS datum. Therefore, the contours are in relationship to project zero in the survey, which means that the contours will show up on their grading plan as negative four through negative 12. That in order to expedite the delivery of the material to the students, we did not re, we did not give it a datum. They are completely aware that there is no such thing as a negative contour, or maybe there is, but there's not in this situation. So please, that is a criticism that needs to be aimed toward the instructor of record, not to the student. There is a change in grade from up here. This is the uh, southwestern corner and it slopes, not precipitously, but over the six to eight feet from here down to the north eastern corner. The students met with Dr. Shearer at the, uh, midway through the project. He gave them um, uh, directions or on the anatomy of a presentation. We've amended that slightly. The students have been asked to present in the Dr. Shearer fashion their work, then followed by walking you through the drawings and then followed by um, optional information um, that is to be in a PowerPoint that they could assemble together in a PowerPoint slide. The focus for me has been for them to produce at scale in AutoCAD or Rhino with Illustrator and InDesign or their equivalent, uh, a set of drawings. So they are at full size. They are the students are, there is work that's presented at one eighth of an inch equals a foot and work that is produced at one inch equals 10 feet. Any additional diagrams or, or sketches have been encouraged but are not necessarily part of anyone's presentation. We have had a redundant uh, set uh, way for you to gain information. The students will share their screen and take you through their presentations just in case you all have been invited to the studio's Miro board, where you can see the prior two examples of work. And then you can also see the work for the final review laid out like it would be pinned up uh, in a review environment. So there are multiple ways in which you can access or see the work. Okay, so here are some images of the point cloud. Students have ad, had access to this from early on. Um, this being the longitudinal section from Andrews Hall at the south to Littlefield Hall at the north. They're predominantly resident. It's residential with some office and a classroom in Carruthers Hall. And Carruthers is the, let's say, let's call it the home front uh, for the honors programs and the plan two programs for undergraduates UT. So it, it is um, honorific, but maybe not honorific, but special. So here we are looking um, directly at Andrews Hall. This is the uh, dormitory uh, all the way to the south, flanked by the fire stair here, which takes part of the courtyard and is at the highest portion of our site. We're moving north now uh, cutting through Carruthers Hall. This is that special reading room for the honors program. And then Blanton Dormitory here um, at the extreme east, sloping from the high point here down eventually to Waller Creek. Uh, a little further north, 
Carruthers to our right, Blanton to the left. In the center of the courtyard is a statue of Diana the Huntress. Uh, one thing to note, you can see that the there is a lot of curbs and um, let's say vehicular language. That's because the, uh, this courtyard is filled with cars uh, during the move in and move out. And so, but what's, you know, it was the courtyard is incremental. It was not designed as a cohesive place. You can tell that by the way in which it's the language is more for the car and moving in and for maintenance than it really is about accommodating any, um, let's say, programs uses uh, for. So the students are reimagining a new courtyard and they're doing that through uh, grading and the making of platforms. As they move further, we're moving closer toward Littlefield to the north. You can see the heritage, the heritage trees here, the live oaks of varying degrees of health. There are around seven on the site. Again, I made the decision for three. If you have an issue, you tell me. Uh, and then uh, here we are right at the base of Littlefield Hall, looking all the way south. And then here we flipped around, we're looking north. This is Littlefield Hall, Whitest Avenue, is here to the left and it slopes dramatically downward toward University Avenue. And uh, here you see the vestiges or this sad little outdoor cafe for the Littlefield Cafe. If you stand on the steps of Littlefield and look south, you can see the UT Tower. And some of the students have, uh, let's say, capitalized on that uh, view connection. If you need any more site information, there are additional photos. They're all in our uh, UT Box folder. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for those 11 minutes. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Carolina to begin. Hello. Share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Good. You can see the screen. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, hello, uh, today I'll be walking you through my redesign for the Honors Courtyard. The current Honors Courtyard attempts to serve as a platform for ac academic life, encompassing ceremony, celebration, and debate. To better facilitate reimagining, more definitively organizes them through defined spaces for celebration, contemplation, and seclusion. Working on a radi radiating diagonal gradient and two structuring axes, the space transitions through each of these roles. Beginning with the most open communal space, an individual will pass through a kind of ecological and social ecotone as they enter a more enclosed secluded area. As a further uh, explanation, the diagonal gradient was defined by the center of Littlefield Steps and the UT Tower that's not pictured, reinforcing the ceremonial aspect of Littlefield. Boundary lines made with material and elevation changes more readily define the space while still allowing visual transparency overlooking and layering student and academic life as a whole. And these are more uh, to scale um, zoomed in images of the uh, grading plan and the planting plan. These sections give further information on the distinct experiences of these defined spaces. The most open communal space, uh, kind of defined in section A, is intended for debate, ceremony, and celebration, which can be seen through these uh, scaly figures seated to watch the graduation happening on Littlefield. These elevation changes uh, made a uh, are make for implied classrooms from a series of terraces. And as we go through the ecotone, which I annotated here um, and is shown in section through uh, section B, which is represented through the Cuthers, Cuthers and Blanton axis, um, we go deeper into the grove, which is more uh, of an opportunity for speculation and enclosure. Um, and this can be used for study or contemplation um, and as this is primarily a uh, site for students, uh, the design should incorporate moments of more personal space, uh, which this area allows for. 
the longitudinal sections um, show the elevation of uh, a terrace per section. So each terrace is on the same elevation, which can be seen through these sections. And it's another view of this transition from gathering space to uh, more seclusion pri and private space, as well as the positionings and relationships uh, of the rampings to the terraces. Uh, to further represent this transition from open space for celebration, debate, and gathering into an enclosed private space for intimacy and seclusion, we have this perspective here, um, starting, uh, well, we're, we're from Littlefield viewing Andrews. And then as we go deeper into the grove, we have a series of views from within the grove and ends from uh, with our backs to Andrews viewing Littlefield. And going into further detail on how this design came to be, uh, using the original courtyard design, I um, used the two paths surrounding the access from Carruthers to Blanton as a uh, dividing lines for my distinctive rooms as, and, I, and I kept the primary axis of Littlefield to Andrews as well as Carruthers to Blanton. From the folly that was uh, also used to inspire this space, um, I got the three rooms. Um, one is the gathering room, which can be seen with this little nook here, and the uh, intimate grove here on the right with the transition space of entering these two areas. So those would be the three distinct rooms. And I synthesized these pieces first by placing my folly more sculpturally in the courtyard and then expanding it to um, encompass the entire courtyard and surrounding buildings and finally incorporating the diagonal, which was first defined by uh, kind of by a random diagonal path uh, in the existing courtyard and then later redefined as the center of Littlefield Steps and the not seen ET Tower, um, which I shown again in the perspective. Thank you. It's interesting. Um, let's see, am I unmuted? Yes. Um, Carolina, can you um, draw the path through your site on the plan using the annotation pen just to give us a sense of how one goes through? There yeah, you go. Sure. Yeah, so this is the grading plan. Um, um, how do I annotate? Uh, okay, so you can go me. up um, and view options uh, at the top, and then there's an annotate. Oh, here we go. Okay, um, great. Okay, so I imagine that these, this entrance point and this entrance point were the main entrance points. So you have options. Um, these, this path here, so one could go down here and use these ramps. These are accessible ramps. Um, so a large part of my design was surrounding accessibility, um, but also just different, uh, by allowing for that accessibility allows just different opportunities to interact with the space. So these ramps are um, ADA accessible and can be used there um, somewhat. These are, these are steps right here. So this is not ADA accessible, but this primary access could be used um, to walk through. And then uh, these kind of bigger paths here are for mostly for vehicles um, to move through, but you know, students can walk through those too as primary access points. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Um, how do you mediate between the vehicles and the students walking? I'm just curious whether those are vehicles for bringing, well, yes, what would they be doing? Yeah, so that would mostly just be for move-in day. So I would imagine that um, like the more primary walking access points would probably be closed or there would be like some sort of information given that it's not, really accessible for pedestrians during that time. But for the majority of the year, it wouldn't have cars. It's just for to allow access for a move-in day. I have one uh, broader question. Um, these categories, ceremony, debate, intimate, um, where do you see the separations and how are those done volumetrically between your ceremonious landscape and also in ceremony, there's often an issue of hierarchy. That is somebody presenting, others listening. Uh, how do you have hierarchy expressed in the ceremonious part? Just curious about these qualities. Sure, sure. Um, how do I like, oh, okay. I'm just gonna erase all these and then go to another drawing. 
to answer that. Great, okay. thank you. Okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think this um, drawing shows that most clearly. So the spaces for ceremony and debate um, are operate in the same space, um, and they can they're divided by the terraces, I guess. So that would be the space for ceremony and debate. And I showed, like I represented what it would look like in terms of ceremony. So ch chairs lined up to watch the graduation happening at Littlefield right here. Um, but this space can also be used as a classroom. So um, these chairs could be facing each other and these terraces operating as uh, kind of boundary lines for different classrooms. So that's how I saw a debate being incorporated. And this middle space right here, which I just put my registration line diagram to show how that works, but um, the B section is the middle of that, I call it ecotone, that transition space between social gathering and intimate inclusion, um, where B is kind of bifurcating that and you slowly see a uh, more enclosure happening. Um, and that's where C kind of comes into where there's just different spaces um, enclosed by the tree canopy where people kind of study individually or in groups, but there's not space for larger gatherings um, that would facilitate debate or ceremony or anything like that. Yeah, so physically and conceptually, the grove demarcates yeah. in that sense. Yeah, yeah, the grove yes. is kind of where mm -hmm. it stops and ends. Right. And just finally, before turning it over to um, another um, colleague here, um, did you have certain precedents in mind? In the morning, we didn't talk that much about historical precedent. And I'm just mm -hmm. curious uh, what you used and what you might have drawn from it. Yeah, um, I actually, I when I first saw this, I thought uh, the original concept, I thought that the Belvedere could work as like, like if we put the Belvedere in here, just because of the sloping plane, if we just mark that off as like terraces. So I kind of expanded what the Belvedere looked like in terms of like an outdoor uh, staircase and turned that into terraces. Um, but that's kind of where that idea originated from. And then I yes. looked into different designs of like stairs incorporating ramps. And I kind of put that in there too um, from more modern uh, projects as well. Mm -hmm. but, but that's pretty much the primary president it came from. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. hey, um, Carolina, um, I'm just curious, how do you define the difference between operation, space, and place? Uh, I don't understand the question quite. Um, could you reword it? Sure. So, so what is the difference between a space and a place? And how does operation fit into the making of both? Yeah, I think, um, I guess off the top of my head, I, I react to space as something that is bounded um, and kind of defined by like volumes and places more of like experiential. So a place is what happens within a space. Um, that that's what it might not be correct, but that's kind of how I interpret it as like a place is more of an experience where a space is like a defined volume. Okay. Um, can we go to your uh, planting plan rendering, the, the plan with the, the color tones to it? Yeah. Okay. So my, my question comes from this. So you, Kind of described three different functions and, and three different sort of ways in which you hope that people might use the space. But um, I'm, I'm curious what what have you as a landscape architect put in that physical space in where you have those boundaries that are done by those paths that tells people this is where I celebrate or this is mm -hmm. where I contemplate. Um, yeah. So I think I did that primarily with the um, plantings along Carruthers and Littlefield where like you have these more vibrant flowers and I chose these on purpose to kind of 
keep with the theme of transition as well. The blue bonnet is the Texas state flower. And then I did the orange milkweed to represent UT state colors and then the Indian blanket and Diminita is like, again, transitioning between these contrasting colors. And I put those primarily along the main uh, ends of axis points. So Carruthers being kind of the primary pace, place of the honors courtyard. And then again, Little Field being the primary place of uh, like graduation ceremonies uh, and how I see that. Um, so those being the most vibrant plantings, I wanted to put those on the buildings that have the most, uh, I guess, celebratory or um, uh, like classroom use. Um, so just historically, those were those two. Uh, yeah, that's where I primarily put the mo most focal attention. And then in terms of creating space, I use tiny mesquite trees to kind of do that. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Should I go into more depth? No, um, sort of my, my comment to this is it's, you know, it's, we put a lot of intention in, in relying on the planting to, to sort of cue up how people could potentially use, you know, use the space or, or kind of tell them what your vision of what might happen here is. But in doing so, that kind of opens you up to some, some questions in terms of seasonality and also um, just like physical comfort. So you've kind of clustered your honey mesquite in a place where you want people to go and sort of, you know, have intimate uh, moments. But honey mesquite is actually a really tough tree to be around. It's, it's thorny, um, it grows very, very wild and it drops a lot of its, um, its little bean pods and sort of uh, it creates a very uncomfortable space for people. Mm -hmm. and you've got your sort of celebratory planting mix, but you know, are those are those going to be in bloom all year? There's a yeah, sure. there's seasonality to those wildflowers, and that there's a there's a cycle to that. That if you're relying on that to be your cue, you may not always get there. So mm -hmm. it feels like. Um, there's just something missing as, a, as landscape architects, we have the ability to really shape space, not just with plantings and not just in plans, but create volumes with pathways, create volumes with seating, but really get to um, sort of show our intentions. And that's not to say that people are gonna use the space always as intended, or that that should even be an objective to us, but um, relying too heavily on plan gestures does not always translate into volumetric space. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then getting that space, not just saying like this is the boundary, but like this is what, this is the thing that engenders place. This is how people form memory. Like that's that's an even you know another level onto that. Mm -hmm. Um. I'll I'll um just uh kind of add on to what Nellie said. Um, I, I agree, I think that um, honey mesquite is not the right species. Um, and, you know, maybe you would, you would change some of the other ground species plantings also um, with like more knowledge about plants in your third year. Um, but I think um, overall, like the, I think the intention is really clear and, um, and, could be very successful. Um, if we think about trees architecturally, which um, is sometimes a ridiculous thing to do, but in this case makes sense because you're inviting people to come and um, inhabit this space um, within this grove. So the, tr the trees really have to facilitate that. And I think the primary thing that would be really important in this case would be um, the space uh, between the ground and where the branching first starts, right? That you want that to be volumetric enough so that people can walk through um, and so that they can sit in and amongst this grove um, and be really comfortable. Um, and I think, you know, it warrants a kind of upright a tree, a straight leader, central leader, um, and something that is gonna make a kind of volumetric space underneath its branching. Um, 
And that contrasts pretty uh, strongly with the architectural form of the live oak, right? With their arms kind of moving out horizontally, it takes up a lot of space, that tree, and it, it is very sculptural. Um, so I think you could play those two forms against each other to, to sort of achieve a contrast and highlight um, the uniqueness of this grove, which would then kind of be a special place, something that mm -hmm. what, what Nellie was, was talking about. Um, but I think, you know, this, um, so I, I, see, um, I see that contrast in your design, but I see another contrast. Um, and I, I think like you're trying to differentiate across this space, um, particular kinds of experiences and, and particular shapes and forms um, as, you, as you said in your presentation, right? Um, and then another really important one is this idea that um, of the ceremonial and then the kind of introspective um, uh, spaces. And one question I have is, um, does the ceremonial actually work? Um, because of the placement of the very large live oaks, would people be able to see the graduation ceremony if they were on those terraces? Um, and then do the terraces actually accommodate the volume of people who would want to experience the graduation? Um, is it kind of maximizing um, the, the experience of ceremony um, and so I think the trees are one question. Um, and if you were able to visit the courtyard, it'd be much easier to answer. Um, and then the other is the pathways. Um, and I am not sure that the symmetry of the diagonals um, is really getting you, um, I, I, I don't know if it, first of all, I don't know if it works. Um, it, it seems like the diagonal paths cut up that area, you know, which you, which you, it, it sort of creates these um, slivers of space, um, which could be maximized for, um, for something like a graduation, right? The terraces, it, it cuts them into, um, into odd shapes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think also just having something, you're, you're trying to achieve symmetry with that path, which is um, with, with those diagonal paths, which are centered around these very strong axes, right? But the topography makes it actually quite asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. So there's a complexity there that just doesn't really feel resolved. Um, you know, I, I think this, if you look at the plan, it, it feels like it wants to be this sort of grand symmetrical space, right? With these pathways moving either and that the symmetry sort of that, and then the, the trees would play against that symmetry. But if you look at the elevation, there are these quite strange conditions, right? Where the, the path is elevated way above the adjacent space um, as, it's, as it's carving and ramping um, through the courtyard. So not that that, there's anything wrong with that. You know, I, I think those elevation changes are really interesting. It just, it doesn't feel like, it feels like it's, um, it's not uh, that, that the, the way that you've placed the paths is not to maximize the topographic experience, but rather the topographic experience is just um, a consequence of the symmetry that is that, that you've drawn on the plan. Mm -hmm. So it, it just leaves me with a question and I, this, there's no answer to this, right? Because it's like, well, if you designed it a different way, it would be different, uh, you know? And, and, but, but maybe if, if those diagonal paths weren't symmetrical, you could both address this issue of like the ceremonial space being more. You froze. I lost everyone. Oh, okay. can you guys still hear me? Back. Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, okay. I, I, um, something happened off with the that. if the paths weren't symmetrical, what would happen? That's lost. If the paths weren't symmetrical, I think you could maybe both um, uh, create a more generous ceremonial space, 
And then you could also um, choreograph um, an experience moving through the, the topographic condition that was very intentional. Um, and, you know, maybe it heightened, would heighten a kind of sense of intimacy, or maybe it would like require more attention to the movement of the body at a slow speed so that, um, you know, it, it sort of slows people down. Um, so I think you could um, actually achieve much greater difference across the, across the courtyard, um, which would mesh nicely with, with the ideas that you already presented. Yeah, yeah, I can, can definitely, um, yeah, I definitely hear what you're saying. I'm, the, the ramps, like, I just put, like, a set of rules for myself before even starting. One was the, that diagonal, and um, there's a few others, but another was I wanted it, like, almost every space to be accessible. So I wanted the paths to be ADA accessible, which is why the elevations are so kind of uh, asymmetrical, <laughs> um, because, like, I wanted this. Uh, staircase to be accessible, which meant that this this entire half is way higher than this one. Um, sure. And then, yes, I agree with the the sentiment that like the ceremony, I, I basically fit everything else around that. Um, and I thought it was, it worked enough. Um, like, I think you can fit five people this way and then maybe seven people this way uh, in terms of like graduation seating. But yeah, like this probably wouldn't be a great viewing space. Um, but I thought that en enough people would be able to fit there where everything would work. But kind of looking back on it, I probably don't even need this here at all because if this is accessible and there's no steps here, then th these ramps could probably go. And right, so I mean, maybe you move along the terraces instead mm -hmm. of, you know, yeah. against them or something yeah. and, and that becomes, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, just, there is a way in which the terracing um, is runs contrary to the way that we normally terrace spaces for ceremony, right? Like if, I, I don't know if you have um, looked at this precedent, but like the, the Swarthmore Amphitheater or really any amphitheater, right? But the Swarthmore Amphitheater is like the best um, in history. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's a great precedent. You should look at it. Um, but anyways, you know, like the, my presentation, you just stole my thunder. <laughs> the stacking of the land is mm -hmm. to give people in the, in the back, the greatest view, right? So you, you're sort of, you're, you're working with the topography that you're given, but you are, mm -hmm. you know, you are sort of amplifying this terrace that, that positions people towards not, not the place where the ceremony happens. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's an interesting condition. Um, and if you were to, to like come to this and create a new design, maybe you would, you could work with that um, or fun, find some way to reposition the, um, the terraces so that they were, um, I don't know, they, they seem to kind of like, uh, they seem to make sense with where the ceremony happens. Um, mm -hmm. But overall, like, I think your presentation was really clear. I really love the diagrams. Your drawings um, are really wonderful. Um, and um, this planting plan that I, we've just been staring at, um, yeah. it's sort of hard for me to read which plants are where. So you might reconsider how you, um, how you make this diagram. Um, and maybe we don't need to see the pictures of the plants, mm -hmm. um, but you color code it in a way um, that, that is more legible. But, but overall, and I, I, I think it's very complex what you're trying to do, both um, with the, the, the geometries that you're trying to work with. Um, oh, and then my last comment would just be that the diagonal that's towards the tower, that's not reinforced with the pathways, is it? No, it's just- It doesn't uh, align. No, the trees okay. are what, that's what right. define that. Mm -hmm. okay. It bounds the trees. Okay. Yeah. Nice job. I think like, uh, I'm not going to say a lot because we're short on time here, but I think um, everything Phoebe just said about you getting a little bit stuck in the rigidity of the, that path geometry, I think a way that you could have potentially solved that 
is by using the live oaks as a point of departure. So if you go back to um, the previous drawing uh, that you just had open, okay. so like, well, I guess, first of all, like, I don't think the live oaks look quite like this. So live oaks are incredibly special, you know, in Austin, they get heritage tree status and they have a set of rules and requirements uh, for construction around them typically. Um, so I, I think that the trees on the university campus um, aren't quite this, like, I think they've been limbed up a little bit over time and maybe kind of trained a little bit more, but under like knowing that you can't really change the grading around them in these three areas. And like maybe also understanding the technical requirement that you, you probably don't wanna build a path necessarily right up against the trunk of one uh, cause it could damage the tree. Um, might've helped to sort of shape and mold these things in a way that sort of naturally like terraces your way like through the spaces in between the trees that you decided to protect and keep. Mm -hmm. um, and then they become these like focal points that set up the terracing at the different heights that the trees are located at. Um, and I sort of, I was kind of wondering about focal points. Uh, I hope so there was a statue of Diana the Huntress in there before. Did you decide mm -hmm. to get rid of her? No, she's, she's there. It's that circle right there. there. She just isn't like a super important point. It was just to reinforce okay. the access for Carruthers <laughs> to Blanton. Yeah, she's just not the most important thing anymore. Okay, got it. Because you've got this like system of platforms mm -hmm. that you superimpose on the site, which I think works pretty well um, as a way to define rooms and, you know, address the prompt. Um, but I think, I think like, just breaking out of your own rules a little bit, kind of like Phoebe was saying, like this space becomes pretty tough in terms of usability. Mm -hmm. So like, what if you kind of broke your rules and like maybe the pathway was flared a little bit more and like mm -hmm. widened out or like, what's going to happen here when someone really wants to cut across the site and they just go ahead and walk through this planting bed here every time. So mm -hmm. like maybe a circulation diagram and like a sort of focal point diagram could have helped you out with this stuff a little bit. Um, and really like checking in on those acute angles there and understanding that they're probably only good for planting um, and not, not a chair, not a folding chair that might topple off the little concrete curb mm -hmm. there. Um, let's see. I don't know. Do you have any questions for us? Um, not that particularly. You guys were really thorough, so I think I kind of got through everything. Um, I mean, I guess the only like with the trees, like I chose the honey mesquite not because I like I haven't had a lot of experience with it, but I just chose it because I kind of what Phoebe was saying in the sense that I wanted some sort of feeling and I wanted light to be filtered in because I didn't want it to be claustrophobic. And that's just the one that I saw that looked like it would fit those requirements the best. But if you guys have any recommendations in terms of another tree that would fit that, which is a bit more comfortable to be around, I'm always down to drop that down. I kind of like to pick, well, there's like a, a lot of technical requirements that go into tree selection. Mm -hmm. you know how much light you have, how much water you have, what kind of soil you have. But a place I usually like to start is sort of like if it grows together it goes together so if you're thinking about like this whole grove of trees as understory trees um i like to ask the question like what understory trees naturally occur in like an oak understory um and and start there and mm -hmm. in that case this could be like red buds or mexican plums or you know some other Texas native trees like that. Um, okay. I don't know. I, I don't think you, it. but I don't, I don't think you want an understory tree. Like I see students doing this a lot. They're, they're trying to like make a space for people. And then they put a bunch of trees that are like going to be branching down in your face. Yeah. You know? And it's like, I can't think of anything more irritating than, than like a grove of trees that's like in my way. You know, so if you want people to inhabit the space, it's got to be something, you know, like maybe like a Monterey oak, 
with mm -hmm. that's like vertical and your, your, the branches are like, you limb them up. So they start at 10 feet or something like that, you know, but um, I think you could, there are probably like a lot of options. I get the, the transparency and letting light in. Sure. Um, that all makes sense. But again, like a, um, the, this, the, the low branching and the way that it is very horizontal in, in its form. It's just like, that's, that's not a, that's not a space for inhabitation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, unless it's like, like a really large park, you know, I think like maybe some people could go and sit under some understory trees, but we're talking about like a tight urban space here. Did you, would you go to the rendering? I had a question about the grading choices. So are the grassy platforms here, are those all flat? And then all of the grade exists within the path network? Yeah. Okay, and then there's like a lot of sort of like low concrete, I guess, walls here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm guessing like, are there places where the sort of grass is flush with the pathway so there isn't a barrier to get in there? Cause you had talked about universal accessibility previously, but I, I saw a lot of kind of barriers in here. And then I guess my next question would be, you know, related to the idea of these like tiered spaces that allow for an amphitheater type viewing experience um, did you ever consider like tipping these planes um, to give them a directionality, maybe for a class, like you talked about a classroom size platform, you know, in one of these spaces, um, or is that just too confusing to have all of the pathways as tipped planes and then also the occupiable rooms as tipped planes, like it might feel disorienting, I don't know, may make you okay. seasick a little, but. <laughs> Just curious yeah. about that. So I definitely thought about how the actual platforms would be accessible. Um, there's a few places where it's in line with the grade, but not very many. Um, and I just have the retention walls there because I know it, I don't think it could happen without them. Um, but because this is this would be grass anyway, I, I like I tried to figure out a way to make the ramp so that people could kind of go onto the platforms from the different paths, but because there's grass there anyway, I thought that there would it would just be very clunky and almost look like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, so it just, it, like, long story short, that is part of this that I haven't resolved yet because I would like this to be accessible, but I don't know how to do that with grass and without it looking like just like a bunch of like afterthought ramps placed in there. Um, but yeah, these right now aren't accessible, the platforms themselves. It would You would just kind of go up against or by them by the ramps that are next to it. I wonder if you could like create additional hierarchies too by adding some like materiality to all of the horizontal surfaces. Um, we talked about like creating rooms in terms of volume, uh, but I think materiality and just like surface texture can help create a room too and help mm -hmm. like sort of with people's speed like if you've got one path that's like a crunchy gravel and then one path that's like concrete, mm -hmm. you know, the it, it can help set up like a network or hierarchy, you know, or like maybe some of these are real grass where they have sun and it's gonna work. Maybe some of them under the trees are actually like a synthetic grass. Um, so you can preserve the social function of the lawn where it's technically not possible to have one grow because there isn't enough mm -hmm. sun. And then maybe some of these are, are paved so they can, mm -hmm. you know, have some furniture on them, um, some lawn furniture, whatever, patio furniture. Um, and I think like you made all these rooms, but like you haven't like quite designed the rooms yet. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I'm, I'm very sorry, we're a little behind now. Okay. Carolina, thank you very much for starting everyone off. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, uh, Timothy is next. And uh, I, so Timothy, whenever you're ready to share your screen, we're ready. All My right. timer will go off um, and I'll 
leave you messages in the chat when we're getting super close to the end. I'm going to share Miro. Does that make sense to do? Sure, whatever you choose. Okay. We are prepared to do both. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Do y'all see the uh, screen? Did I share it right? All right, excellent. Uh, my name is Timothy. I'm a first year landscape architecture student. Uh, and I've been tasked today with um, given this courtyard and the current uh, current state of the courtyard, honors courtyard, uh, just doesn't exhibit a kind of a clear space for use by resident students. Um, but by framing minor and major rooms using changes in elevation and planting material that my intent is to provide settings for intimate discussions, formal academic events, and cer uh, celebrations. And the way I've laid this out, there's three distinct space, uh, sorry, three uh, distinct uh, spaces along the central axis. Uh, one is a, uh, the central space is kind of a main, main space, is a, a flat open air plaza, uh, which, were, which would be good for, for larger celebrations or graduations or whatnot. A, um, an informal kind of woodland area, which maintains um, three, uh, sorry, maintains four of the larger heritage oaks that exist there with uh, ADA paths through. And finally, a third space is the debate space here at the north end, which, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which uh, is a kind of a flat 2% grade uh, slab surrounded by uh, small oak trees to create like, a, like an intimate, although fair space. Uh, let me just go on. In these sections, um, so section, oh, sorry, one, one more thing in, in speaking about Diana. Uh, previously, she was here at the kind of the center of the courtyard, but I've placed a statue on top of the reading room on Carruthers. That way it can be seen from kind of different vantages without it uh, losing like the, its importance. And there's little stairs to get up there, have a little drink or whatever. Um, and so in these sections, this section A kind of splits where this uh, debate space is flanked by these trees. There's a, you know, a, a grove of them, if you will. Uh, in the B section, there's uh, the central area is raised significantly because there's a pretty significant slope here. And then this is D Diana sitting on top of the reading room, uh, protecting everyone. Um, let me move on to the, to the renderings because it makes it a little more clear. This is- uh, Real quick, Timothy, what's a debate space? Uh, there's a different, there was different things about debate space. I, I was thinking kind of in a very, uh, here, let me, let me actually go this way in a very specific, like some, this is the d d debate space here with these trees around. Is someone, was someone here or a group of people here yelling at a group of people here? Although the debate space could also be a smaller scale as in like two people having a conversation and then they picked a corner or they could be having like a small, um, they could be playing chess or something. It's a, it really just depends on what the need, uh, what debate needs are, are there. Um, it also could be a classroom space. Similarly, just the, the a professor or teacher giving a lesson, but also hearing feedback in the same way, uh, reciprocally. Um, and this uh, this also view in the background, we see these taller live oaks creating a nice canopy, kind of the no informal space in between, and then the in the central space, um, there is a raised platform here for seating during ceremonies or also for, you know, let's say you put up a big tent for a nice dinner or something like that. Uh, and then the view here would be on the facade of Carruthers, which has a really interesting facade and significantly important with Diana sitting on the, on the top so it can be seen. Finally, this is one more showing from this central raised area looking down. Uh, 
Um, these areas would be grass, this is hardscaped, and in the center that could be where the speaker would be for announcing graduation. It could be where the uh, valedictorian is speaking various things and they're looking on this facade with the statue again on, on top. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run back to the, to the plan. Miro's fun. All right. And just for clarification, the, the original contours are here in dotted lines and I have them labeled, but just for, clear, just for simplicity, I have the newer contours and these dark lines and they're labeled uh, this direction. Uh, so they're readable this way because it got kind of a little um, complex. So but, Timothy, um, what is the height of the wall um, that is uh, retaining your central space mm -hmm. and, and yeah, along there. What's that? What's the sure? Height? Yeah, that's um, that's this space right here. It's six and a half feet. Okay. Yeah. Because there's a significant drop, especially in the sorry, especially in this corner, this uh, northeast corner here. It's at negative four, and by the time you get down to to here, it's like negative 12 or so. So it's about eight right. foot drop. Right. But I wanted to maintain that as, uh, you know, 2% slope. So it, it was relatively flat. Yeah. Especially out in this section for putting I mean, it, it's, I mean, it, it, it is kind of traditional, this, the, the way that you've, um, you're using um, orthogonal, Mm -hmm. form and you know sort of like walls and trees um but i think there there's actually something that that f feels um uh like it belongs at a university mm -hmm. um about your design that it there is this really wonderful central generous uh level space um that that fronts on this building um and I, I like the idea of moving the ceremony, um, you know, so that it actually works with the topography of the courtyard um, mm -hmm. and that it, it extends out from, from the building, which I, I don't understand how these buildings are used differently, but this one is the, this is the, this is the more important one for, for the honors graduation. Is that true, Hope? Um, so, so I, I think it's like, it's, it, it feels right. That feels right. And I, one thing that I would love to see is a study of whether the proportions of this space are adequate, um, you know, for the number of people, mm -hmm. um, because it's hard to tell from the plan um, if it's large enough. Um, and it might actually, you might actually want to diminish one of the other spaces, um, the debate space to be smaller or the woodland to be, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in order to enlarge it. Um, but I, I think that the, I think the concept feels, it, it feels actually quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the 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 place where Diana is, is that existing? It is existing. That yes. upper okay. So I um. And and is that like where the ceremony would happen, or the ceremony would happen on your raised terrace? The ceremony would happen here in front in this kind of uh, rectangular area. Just this normally would be entrance and exit to the building to this reading room, but mm -hmm. for the sake of ceremony. Uh, there would be podium here, table with guests, whatnot, and they're looking, they're looking into the the audience area. I'd say, and I kind of calculated some. It's a, um, it's about uh, ninety feet or so, and I think we could get eight rows, and that was something like two hundred people could fit up in this section right here. Mm -hmm. which is not huge, but the the plant owners uh, is a smaller school. Mm -hmm. So it's really just, yes. Okay, just for clarification's sake, they're all residential except for the bottom uh, floor of Carruthers where it is uh, the honor, there's some administrative 
and just the honors administrative group. So mm -hmm. it's purely residential. It's all dorms, except mm -hmm. for the, the ground level floor of Carruthers mm -hmm. or courtyard level floor of Carruthers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, well, in addition to like that sort of just like practical um, need and how, you know, you're working with the topography quite nicely and it doesn't seem like the wall is actually too tall, um, you know, I mean, there is a consequence of dividing up this space with the walls, mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you're, if you're moving diagonally across the courtyard, like, you know, I mean, these walls are interrupting it. Um, but I think that um, an, another sort of opportunity that I see is to just play with, um, with density and openness. Mm -hmm. uh, because I see that happening across the three spaces. When you talk about a woodland, um, you know, I mean, I, I imagine that that's a shaded and sort of dense, um, densely planted space. Yes. Um, and then you have this openness in the center. And then mm -hmm. The, the sort of debate, what you're calling the debate space at the end, it seems like it has this sort of density on, on its edge and then a clear space in the middle, you know? And so that, that has um, a, a really special character um, in, in terms of, you know, like you, you can imagine students sitting on the lawn in the center um, and being embraced by the vegetation at the edge. So, you know, the sections that you're showing with just, which, which are, um, I, I know because you all are in your first semester and you're just learning how to draw um, and how to sort of work with plants. Um, but I think really like thinking about even vegetation on the ground plane um, mm -hmm. and how you could thicken uh, the, the presence of the planting um, and make it sort of heavy um, uh, especially in the debate space, it seems like like it, it wants to be that the planting around the edges really wants to like embrace the center. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. and I don't know that like one tree is you know one line of trees is going to really do that. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be very thickly planted that edge. Um, and then just sort of like thinking about the oppositions there um, that are available to you as you move across the courtyard to really create a distinct character in, in each of these three spaces. Mm -hmm. There was a bigger idea I was trying to get nailed down about creating the volumes and creating distinct spaces with the idea that if given enough time, you could really delve into, uh, picking plant types and, and putting denser vegetation and maybe this grass area is not just like soy shore or something, but wild grasses that are, you know, kept thick or something like that. There's just, there was just a lot more that could be done with more time. Sure. I love the idea of this debate space. <laughs> it's got like a very classical design of mm -hmm. something almost like an athletic field um, or, you know, classical kind of garden rooms but it's almost like you're making it an athletic field for intellectual discourse, <laughs> which is sort of down. a fun idea. Um, and I think it'd be really excited, exciting to develop that typology. And, you know, I think your, your ideas are really good. I'm, sh I'm working with you to understand your drawings mm -hmm. um, because I think the modeling and the drawing that you've done is pretty good, but I'm, having to really use my imagination in terms of picturing, you know, how this space gets used. Mm -hmm. um, and I can give you that because I'm able to like read these drawings, but maybe not everyone, you know, like a client or something would be able to understand um, this stuff. So I think similarly to the last student, I would love to see a circulation diagram or mm -hmm. maybe like a programming diagram too. Um, there, was, there was another thought about program that I kept trying to really pit it down, but then the spaces get used as they get used. So something, this might not end up being the debate space. Someone might think, oh, that, that'd be perfect for some kind of celebration. And then it gets used as that. So it was almost just like making the spaces, but then letting the, letting the, um, the importance of it get developed over time as people use the use it and turn it into a place. 
Yeah, there's like, you can't over define it or you can't over define it so much that the use is overly prescriptive and mm -hmm. stops people from kind of making their own interpretation of it. But you also can't under define it in a way that leaves it sort of blank and too open to programming mm -hmm. in a way that people don't have things to respond to. So like finding that line between under-designed and over-designed um, I think is really important. You know, in a university context, I think you're able to cheat towards the under-designed a little bit more because mm -hmm. people really are going to take initiative and use the spaces, um, you know, more than some other contexts. But I, I definitely see like three distinct rooms mm -hmm. um, going back to the original prompt. Um, in terms of their, like, how they work together and their scalability, again, I really want to see a cir circulation diagram. Okay. And I'd be curious to hear you talk about, like, how the, the middle section gets used um, on, like, a non-ceremonial basis. Like, do people just pass through it? Are you thinking it's, like, an open sort of lawn programming? People are going to play Frisbee or... People are, are people going to jump off the six foot wall because they're trying to cut through and they don't care about a six foot jump because they're 19 years old. <laughs> there, there's some thicker hedges there, but uh, I guess that wouldn't matter either. Um, it, I keep imagining, I keep looking at the space, especially one of the diagrams just kind of shows it as an empty, like, you know, make your own adventure type space. Uh, and I didn't want to just put like a fountain there or beds or anything like that. It just is, it's just there. If the weather's nice, people could have classes out there. I even thought of like uh, bringing in some circuses, people in stilts and all kinds of stuff. It really, it really just could be anything, which is probably not, uh, probably not enough of my, I mean, my imagination goes wild up there, but. Um, Unmuted. What if the debate space had like some actual like topographic hills in there? <laughs> There's like one on each side or something. So you have like a landscape version of like a soapbox or something like that. Or just like thinking about what's that middle volume, you mm -hmm. know, like yeah. everyone's kind of thought about oh, you, you have a middle volume in walls. Um, and I think you thought about it with the small oaks. I don't know if there's such thing as a small oak, but I get your intention. Yeah, just not like a hundred foot oak. I'm super close to the end. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys. Sorry. Um, yes, I just want to add my- No other jurors, right? I'm trying to make space. Oh, okay. Just uh, add my appreciation to this sequence, to this matter of the sequence of the three rooms. I think they're great. And they remind me historically of early 20th century Germany, a great landscape architect, Leibrecht Migge, whom we'll see in the next semester, all of you. Um, and one thing, when you get to that point, Timothy, it would be wonderful to do a perspective view of this so that mm -hmm. you really see the canopy volumes. I think one thing I'm missing is really feeling that out, the heights of the plantings, their volumetric response to the buildings in terms of scale. And that would also be something in which circulation would become even more evident. So that's a drawing to think, or a couple of drawing sketches to think about for future. For sure, that, I think that's my next step actually. Great, great. great. Thank you so much. Oh, okay, everyone, Nellie, do you have anything or? Very quickly, I'll add, you know, great job. I think you were very intentional with the way that you formed those uh, spaces and those volumes. Push it to the next level and start to think about materiality and how texture could really reinforce like the difference in characters mm -hmm. of just because you're very proportional in terms of like a third, a third, a third. But if you start to break it up with like smaller textures, bigger textures, uh, tones, like I think that'll start to, to help you just take it to the next level. Okay, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Claire, we're on to you. Wonderful. Let me, and I just made my Zoom a lot smaller somehow. <laughs> Let me get everybody back up to size. Okay, there we go. Okay, 
can everybody see this? Yep, all good. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Kim, for nodding. I appreciate that. Um, okay, well, thanks so much for being here and for listening to my proposal for the UT Honors Courtyard. Um, at the heart of this design is conversation. First, conversation between spaces and ultimately, hopefully, conversation between people. Also, we're considering the unification of two seemingly disparate concepts. There's the concept of the everyday, the casual, the kind of warmly accessible, and by contrast, the elevated, the gracious, and the special. You've heard some of my colleagues talk about that as the recreation or social space versus the cere ceremonial space, and those concepts are very much present in this design as well. Um, you'll notice here, um, we've got a theme, I think, running through this group, and that is symmetry. Um, so this design considers both, again, the casual and the recreational, as well as the more special and elevated, but it doesn't prioritize one over the other. Um, equal devotion is paid to both almost exactly in terms of square footage and in terms of um, experience as well. So on the left in front of Andrews, you have this open lawn space that's meant to be the place for sometimes steady, sometimes frisbee. And then on the right in front of Littlefield is the ceremonial space. Um, or a space that's really defined more by structured boundaries and edges and a clear canopy. Linking the two though and creating that conversation is this middle area, um, the central plaza or promenade shouldn't be forgotten as it is substantial in size. And it's flanked on either side by kind of mid-sized canopy trees. These are meant to be flowering dogwoods that set up and direct views from one space back to the other. They mirror each other and they encourage you if, as you look in either direction to have a similar experience and to say, hmm, whatever's across the, across the way there looks just as inviting as where I'm standing right now. They also serve the purpose of defining smaller, more minor spaces that could be used as gathering spots, outdoor classrooms or a place where you could actually sit on the lawn and be surrounded by trees, but not be obscured by a canopy that's too low. Moving into a section view of the courtyard, um, you'll see once again that there's kind of equal attention brought to both areas. While the left side is more open and there are some clear, you know, trees that create a sense of enclosure on the right, there's still visual balance and there's going to be that same experience on either side of the plaza. In case a few of you prefer words over visuals, I do have my programming diagram up there to the left. Looking at additional section views, this one on top here is actually a cross section. So we're looking south. The building in the back is Andrews. And this wall here to the right is Carruthers. If you were to flip this though and face north toward Littlefield, um, you would have essentially the same view. You would see some live oaks behind these dogwoods, but it would be basically the same visual experience. And then this is a longitudinal section facing west toward Carruthers. Um, you can see there's kind of, from where this is positioned, there's a layered effect. You would actually have the stand of dogwoods um, here first, and then, the, and then the live oaks would be just beyond that. And then in the back there, reinforcing the architecture of Carruthers, you have my smaller canopy tree, which I chose a Texas redbud because um, they provide a lot of color and do well in a variety of soils and light conditions and water. Thinking about the elevation of the site and the challenge that that presents, um, 
my design does require some pretty hefty grading and it does mean that both the both the recreation space and the ceremony space are on essentially elevated plinths. Again, they're gonna be on equal height or equal elevation. So we're not prioritizing one over the other, but if you were to take a small cross section of uh, really this area down, down here on the Northeast side, um, this is not, I should mention, this is not a place where like people are not gonna have to climb this hill. <laughs> um, this is just uh, how we're treating the treating the ground in this in this corner here, and that's to be, you know, another space for planting and also collect water runoff. To make it a little more clear as to how one might actually experience um, walking in the space, the central promenade has a gradual slope. Um, it's under, at least if my math is right, for about two thirds of it, it's 4% or so, um, which is well within ADA compliance. And then as you get further down, um, scrolling back up to my plan, you'll see that I did include two sets of shallow stairs as well as a ramp to navigate the, the areas that get um, to be much steeper. I wanted to also call out too, while we're looking at this plan view, the logistics of how a ceremony like graduation or other gathering might work. Uh, looking at the lawn space here, there is ample room. In fact, I think it is about the same as Tim's central space. Um, if you don't include the area with the dogwoods, this is about 90 feet. And so it allows for several, several rows of, um, of chairs, and I was imagining that graduates would actually sit on the terrace of, um, or kind of the, that first story of Littlefield. So they would have a view of the whole courtyard. They would be able to see the bell tower, which would be about here. Um, and they're continuing that idea of conversation. They would be able to look back at where they spent many hours studying, hanging out, making friends, um, talking about homework, school, books, friends, all of that. Um, so they would have that clear remembrance about where they were, how they got there. So Claire, I'm while we're on this, oh, oh, so while we're on this drawing, can you explain a little bit more about the smaller plantings? Um, up against the building at the top, sort of what their what they are, what their function is. Yeah, those. Certainly, yes. These are Texas red buds, so they're going to be the smallest of my simplified planting palette. Um, so the idea there, and Phoebe, I was glad that you mentioned it earlier because I was thinking about okay, where might how might might I create a more kind of intimate spot um, without people bumping their heads. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to do these uh, kind of symmetrical plazas on either side of Carruthers where it is a bit flatter and where people are gonna be immediately coming out of the reading room or immediately coming out of their dorm. Um, but this would be more like a city park area. So you would have like benches or bistro tables underneath these Texas red buds. Um, but they create visually a nice grove and they're more, um, again, they're they're helping, especially in this in this um, side of the courtyard, to kind of define this large field. You have an, you know, they form kind of an edge condition over there. Good. And what is the surface underneath them? That would be a permeable paver, but one that's different than the paving used for the rest of the plaza. So another way to define that space as distinct from just the pathways themselves. And where is the ground of the recreation and the ceremonial centers? What is that ground? That would be grass. Um, and I thought about, you know, maybe using something a little more inventive than St. Augustine or B Bermuda, but ultimately I think either of those would probably be the most practical. For the hillsides though, um, I chose a Texas sedge 
because those really help soak up water and they're going to appreciate being on that slope like that. And they also do well in this climate. So I think you have a lovely clarity to the project. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, are there other drawings that you were scrolling through that we could, that we could, that we haven't seen um, at the, towards the end? Let's see. I think I hit most of them, but probably not for very long. <laughs> yeah, this is a good one. Um, I, I have a question about how the ramp works. Um, if you have a 10% grade um, uh, in the planted area, um, you know, south of your, sorry, it's not south. Um, I can't get the directions <laughs> right. It's uh, on the it's northeast east. side. I know east, it yeah. seems like it should be south because it's going down. So east, east of the, um, of the level areas, you have the 10% grade change in the planted areas. So how do you achieve um, the, the uh, accessible slope on the ramp that's adjacent? So it's lowered. This would, um, this would essentially be a retaining wall along that edge. Um, and then your pathway is recessed within that. Um, so at that spot, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how high that wall would be. I know like along here, uh, that's about four feet. Okay, can you go back to the plan? Yes. Do you have a grading plan that, that references how your, your pathways work and where you're grading around the trees that you're gonna preserve? Not anything formalized with like new proposed contours or something like that. I think yeah. since you don't have a grading plan, I would suggest not including the existing contours on your plan, for your, okay. your proposal, because that's confusing, right? Like you're talking about really changing the topography of this space, but then I see some, some existing contours here and I would just remove them. Okay, um, that's a good point. It'd yeah. also be good to see where the walls are in this plan. Um, this this plan does have a nice clarity in the way you've treated the buildings and the trees, I think, so far, um, in terms of the three projects we've seen. But yeah, I think indicating where the walls are, or maybe even some like directional arrows sort of showing what slopes where could help um, in the in the absence of a grading plan. Yeah, and I, I think mean, you fell in love with your plan, and I think you fell in love with the history <laughs> and the story that you were telling. I don't believe that it actually works in terms of how those buildings function and the, the topography changes and sort of the, the requirements of keeping three heritage trees, keeping those entrances, keeping the function of, you know, graduation move in and, and move out kind of days. So. Mm -hmm. That, that's fair. I mean, it is still living a lot in the conceptual conceptual realm for me. Um, I mean, I will say there's ample room down here for vehicular tra traffic, um, plenty of space. So I did consider just the practicality of that. And the pathways themselves are quite expansive, really, no matter where you are. Um, and so I think in terms of just traffic flow and people milling about, it is functional in that aspect. Which are the three trees that you're keeping? So calling me out, Phoebe, this one, this one is a heritage tree. Um, but the others we would have to strategically relocate, which I know is probably not possible. Um, but there was one right about here that conflicted with the pathway, and then one right about here um, that could maybe be worked around. Okay, so yeah, I think that's a cop out. Like you should figure out where, like, yeah, it's going to cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to relocate very large trees, but it could probably be done. Um, but just, yeah, like, tell us where they should go. Like, take the challenge of incorporating them into your design. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's, um, I, I'm, I'm with you on the, the creation of a level central space, 
Um, I don't think that the planting is really working as you envision it, but I think it could. Um, and I, I also, I appreciate your ideas and the, the concepts that you're trying to work with. And I think they're, they're applicable to this project. They um, certainly would make it a much better space um, for the students. And I, I, I like this idea of like the elevated and the everyday um, and the ceremonial and the conversational. But I, I think that it's too even across the project to really um, to, to, to really be legible or to be used in the way um, that those kinds of concepts um, to, be, to be used in contrasting ways as those concepts are. So, you know, you're like the space on the left on this plan and the space on the right, they're really not that different. Um, so, you know, like I, I, I actually don't, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with your design from that standpoint. I just think your intentions aren't matching the way the design would be experienced or understood. Um, yeah. And and that really exactly. like we would we would experience your level area even though it's bisected by this main access we would experience that kind of as one space, you know it is it is symmetrical it has the rows of trees um, east and west and and I think we would we would sort of understand that um, as having continuity across the axis. And you're, it sounds like you're trying to create difference, right? Um, it's something that's elevated and something that's every day. In, unless you intend the central space to be the elevated space and the, you know, the red bud space to be the every day. Um, so for me, there's a kind of, um, there's a little lack, there's a lack of clarity in the way you've translated your ideas materially. Okay, um, I think maybe, maybe I just wasn't, clear verbally and I and I do agree that there are definitely practical challenges to this and I for sure see the point about you know just maybe there not being enough difference but when I was talking about conversation I didn't mean one space for conversation and one space for play I meant a dialogue between two different ideas and actually showing how similar and complementary they really are so there is an intent to, to show that one is not more important than the other. They should be at the same level. There should be similarities between the two. Uh, okay, well, so that I, I, if, if, I mean, I think in that case, I think you're complicating the idea of simply creating a space, a multifunctional space. And like, that's what I see that you've done is you've created a multifunctional space. People can throw a frisbee on, frisbee on the lawn or it can be used for ceremony. Um, and so if we judge it by those criteria, then, you know, is it, is it actually successful? Um, and I think in some ways it is and in other ways it needs some adjustments. Um, you know, it's, I, I think like the, the trees there aren't enough trees to really like create a strong repetitive form. Like the three and the three, three trees is a little bit, and those are, sorry, I forget the species. You're dark. The dogwood. No, the, the, the three on. Oh, on the, those are live oak. Those are live oaks, okay. So they're gonna be, think of the live oaks outside the architecture building and how many there are, right? I think there are four that got newly planted. They're tiny. So you're talking about like three little live oaks on the, on the east and three little live oaks on the west edge. So I, I think like something like this really merits a heavy, uh, a kind of, I call it the hammer, you know, like you, you wanna have like a longer line of trees. If you're really, if this is really what you wanna do um, to make this kind of ceremonial framed central space, I think you need more trees all and they have to be aligned and the the zigzag the the you know of the of the dogwoods and the little dogwoods at the edges they kind of dilute the power of that um of that gesture 
Um, we, yeah. we walked on campus. We walked on campus. We had a campus walk where we looked at the, the language and the way in which the plantings, you know, the trees were planted and they were, they really were working in sets of lines and as opposed to this quasi quincunk kind of thing. But here's, um, we, we, we're going to have, we're running over like severely going to, to limit the, the last two presenters. So final comments, please, so that we can, we can go move on and, and give full attention to uh, both Suzanne and Justin. We have two more projects. Mm, I'll say for 60 seconds that I don't, while the way that Phoebe described, you know, reinforcing this like central platform with planting would help define that kind of space. I don't think that one of those elevated central lawns is appropriate for this location on campus. There are a number of spaces like that throughout UT. And what makes them so good is they have like a long view to downtown or back to the tower or something like that. So you can look beyond that, you know, flexible central lawn that's bounded by trees. In this case, where this has, you know, basically a building wrapper around it, I don't actually think that that type of space would work well in this setting for UT overall. I think, I think the more maybe the smaller rooms or the three rooms or something like that feels a little bit more appropriate. That's just my reaction to that. No. All right. Um, okay, Suzanne. Thank you. Are you ready? Thank you, Claire. Are you ready? Yes. yes okay. I am. I am ready. All right. The timer will go. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Suzanne Wiss. Thank you so much for coming to um, listen to our presentations today. Um, so I am proposing an honors quad design. And the honors quad is a place for daily campus living and celebration. It is a place of study and constant movement by students and professors and parents alike. And this design focuses on the green spaces being shaped by organic flow of everyday movement. So within this design, I took into account a lot of the the traffic that with the foot traffic that would flow through this space, the different doorways and entrances of the buildings, um, as well as the external gates that go through the space, and creating these two large main spaces. I wanted one large one and one more medium play sized one for debate or frisbee, um, and then. This larger one would be for celebration. It is lined on the Eastern side here with Texas mountain laurels. So they would be in bloom around graduation time and would create a nice backdrop for said celebration. There are also a number of smaller study spaces, more intimate spaces, more along the edges of the quad um, each of these smaller ellipses has a stone edge to it that can be used as seating as well as maybe like a barrier to like the, the paved area and the green space if you wanted to enter into that green space. And there is quite a bit of grade change proposed here. My contours are the solid lines here. And it would, there is one retaining wall here and one retaining wall here. So these two large ellipses are flat. They're flat ground. And then there's a retaining wall. And then because of water runoff, I wanted there to be a swale beneath each one. So here is a smaller swale right here that can catch all the water and be um, full of lush plantings. And then same with here, there is another swale as well. And then a ramp that goes along the edge and down here. And it actually is a little bridge that goes over the swale and ends down here. So um, 
Um, here is a diagram of the pathways. I just was really focused on those and how you might traverse this landscape, which is many different ways, uh, but also focusing on what would be a desire line and how to make the pathways the most desirable. <laughs> Here's a cross section of the longitudinal. This is looking west. And this one goes through the large and well, it goes through the large and the small. Uh, so this one is the, the larger green space. Here's a smaller little pocket with a sycamore tree. No, that's not a sycamore tree, but it's going to be a sycamore tree. And little uh, seating on the sides. And then down here, you hit the front of this swale that um, is the front of that retaining wall. And then also the swale here and the uh, mountain laurels, as well as the ramp. And here we're looking south. And again, the ramp comes around this one. This is the larger platform here, and then this little swale. And here, this is the smaller platform. Um, people could do yoga, play, and then the, the swale as well. So here are a few model images. These two are looking Southwest. And these ones are from that like far back Southwest corner, kind of, this is the, the ramp and step, these are the, the steps, the same steps that are right over here. And um, a few mountain laurels and sycamores as well. So that is the honor squad that I'm presenting. It's interesting, Suzanne, I'll just react right away. When I first saw the ovals on your plan, I said, what does this have to do with these orthogonally um, organized buildings. And I thought, is there, but then your project grew on me more and more as you discussed it. And it even brought to mind uh, the tall orthogonal buildings around Michael Van Valkenburg's Teardrop Park, that is creating a world. And I think you really have created a world here. Um, the, the matter for the people inside the buildings is what they get to see in your world. Uh, I'll leave the details of how it works and so forth um, to my colleagues who know, but I just want to express my appreciation of the concept. Thank you. I think to, to echo Mirka, it's a, it's a very interesting study in using topography to create like a sculptural moment in the courtyard. And so I can see that being like very interesting and intriguing to the people who live there to kind of watch um, the space transform. I think in terms of a plan and sort of executing your ideas, I would have liked to have seen um, the use of more hierarchy in your plans to denote like uh, pathways and walls and how, how those spaces um, actually kind of fit on the ground right now. Um, it's reading very busy, so it's it's hard to tell sort of what's pertinent information to the way people transverse through the space, the way it functions, how it meets the building. And there's a lot of like extra information, like the, the internals of how the building works that don't really relate to what's going on in terms of what the plan is. So I think you would better express your ideas um, by taking sort of a, a, a hierarchical approach and, and, and trying to just bring more clarity to, it, to, to this drawing. I did um, have line weights. My line weights did not show up and I know that that is a me problem, um, but <laughs> I'm, little disappointed by that as well because I really did focus a lot on the edge like what happens with those material transitions was like really something I spent a lot of time thinking about um, 
So I wish that that would have showed up. Um, your modeling is very interesting in terms of revealing how you're really trying to shape and sculpt space. I wish you had done an, like an almost like an overall axon to really show some of that topography. Like you, you've got some really interesting peaks here, but um, to help us understand really how you're 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 carving out all these spaces and setting them into this into this courtyard and sort of the sequencing. I think. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe take some views of the model, sort of a broader, a broader approach to help to help work through some of that. And as you kind of explore the next level of this to refine for your portfolio, like go in there and denote the the pathways with a tone, denote the walls with like a tone. You you can still do the black and white quite effectively, but I think um, you know this this is uh, the clay model waiting for for just that next level of touch. Okay. Um, can you go back to the plan, Suzanne? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it is hard to read um, because there's just so much included on the plan. Um, you know, I would take the existing contours off mm -hmm. and just let us see what you've graded. Um, and then if, if you want to show existing and proposed, you can have a contour plan you know, that's separate. But for the overall plan, like, I just want to see your design. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, like, the building footprints should be, like, super light. Yeah. Um, and it is nice to see them, um, you know, to see the interior spaces of the buildings um, in conjunction with your, with your design. Um, I, I also think that the, the way that you've regraded the courtyard, the flexibility of this plan um, and the, the, the shape and the, the sort of space making with these forms is really strong. Um, I, uh, and, and I think the model shots show that. Um, but also the reason why the model shots are so compelling is because they don't show everything that you're drawing on the plan. So there's like a lot of other stuff here. And I question whether it reduces the power of the experience, you know, to have, for, for instance, like the different trees. Um, I'm assuming the, the ones with the circle trunk that are shaded, those are the existing trees you're retaining. Correct. Right. And then what are those other ones that are kind of in a line? Um, these I was thinking would be um, a Mexican sycamore. I okay. wanted to create shade and also a little bit more of an intimate space in this corner. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, there's something about that line and then, you know, the, the, the way that it is intersecting these shapes but again, like back to my three trees, like it's only three trees. And then on the other, the, the other place they happen, there are only two of them. And I, I think that if you were to do other iterations of this project, I can see those taking a much bigger, um, playing a much bigger role maybe. Um, and maybe like you take out more of the live oaks. I can't believe I'm saying that, but <laughs> um, but anyways, there's something that's like there. There are live oaks. There are sycamores. Then there's the planting of these shapes, um, and it could be a question of just the way you're representing it, not not having clarity. Um, but uh, but yeah, like I I think the planting is actually the weaker part of your project. Um, and the, the sort of sculpting and the, and the sort of arrangement of these shapes is stronger. Um, and I also don't know if maybe you have too many of them, you know, the too many of them hitting the building. Um, I still think compositionally, it needs another round. And I know you've probably done like a hundred versions of this, um, but that, that's just my two cents. Of the ellipses? Yeah, <laughs> the ones hitting little, to. the ones hitting little field. And again, like, I mean, I'd love to see the plan with just the shapes, you know, without the plants 
in them because it, it's it's sort of like harder to see the composition with all of the other stuff. Um, but anyways, like, I don't know how many of them this space can really hold, uh, you know, and, and you want it to be like powerful and clear. And I don't know if you've looked at this precedent, precedent but it's very similar to your um, to your ellipse making, which is the Vera List Courtyard by MBVA. Have you looked at that? I don't think so. It, it has one ellipse and it is planted and it has a ramp that goes around the edge. A beautifully done ramp. Like this is the way to do the ramp around the ellipse. Um, but the stairs intersect with it. So you've got like the lines, the, the, you know, the lines of the stairs intersecting this ellipse. Um, so it's both functional in terms of like the ramp around the ellipse takes you down, the stairs are the inaccessible route. And then like with the geometries, just the contrast between those lines and the round, it's really powerful. And there's just one, it's a smaller space than this, but there's just one, you know, like they put all their eggs in this one basket. And so, yeah, like, I, I don't know how many, how many it can really, it can really hold. Um, and then there's there's the one that's circular. Like, are are some of them circular? Are there are those ones hitting Littlefield? Those are also circles. Um, Mainly just the one, but yes, just that one. Those this one. Also that's one. a circle too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's whimsical. <laughs> um, I like that, but. Um, I, I think more views would help, um, uh, you know. The sections okay. are, are a little bit, um, maybe not the strongest drawing type for this project actually, because, well, the, the sections give us um, dimension, uh, but the, the, they, don't, they don't really tell us about the form, so. I don't know if this was the project where someone recommended an axonometric or if that was someone else's, but yeah, like I think an axonometric would be really wonderful. Yeah. Even an exploded axonometric where you show that, the, you know, remove the planting um, so that we can see the various layers in isolation and how they all relate. Okay. That's interesting feedback because, yeah, I, I was wondering what information, besides the swale, I thought you could see that really nicely within the sections, but other than that, it was a little- Yeah, definitely. Not super helpful. Awesome. Two minute warning, are there any additional comments? Suzanne, thank you for being so concise. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. All right, very good. Justin, you're on deck, ready? Thank you all for okay. your feedback. I'm ready. I am in the lucky fifth spot. Thank you all for your attention. And I don't relish following Suzanne, given the creativity of her plan. Um, so I will try to be concise, but not too fast. Can you all see the plan? Mm -hmm. Okay. The proposed plan for this evolutionary reimagining of the honors courtyard directly responds to the program, program requirements uh, calling for the creation of two new distinct pur purpose specific spaces. Um, using the word evolutionary here deliberately because the organization of the reformatted plan respects the orthogonal surrounding buildings and the linear axis established along the path between the central entries and exits of the buildings at the north and south ends of the courtyard, as well as uh, the perpendicular access and egress from the east and west buildings 
to facilitate easy circulation. The Honors Courtyard offers ample volume for these two outdoor rooms. Here, we've defined and organized these volumes with de deliberate grading and dense plannings to create clear edge conditions around the spaces. So the major central space here uh, is created so that students can gather in large groups for graduation ceremonies, to attend performances, listen to speakers, et cetera. It is larger, celebratory, and elevated. We created this room and there is a heritage tree at the north end that actually has a very large canopy. But the, the primary open space is centered on the Carruthers second story balcony platform, which provides both a ready stage and a viewing space. And then this lower level around the perimeter of the space is planted with uh, prairie grasses that provide more environmental benefits, carbon capture, uh, groundwater infiltration rather than in habitation. We don't expect people to be sitting in the prairie spaces. And then a more shielded, intimate uh, terrace space is carved into the southwest corner of the courtyard. It features a high back bench and cascading grassy uh, landings that invite small groups of students together, lounge, discuss, debate, share their ideas. Uh, the Scott Amphitheater, which Phoebe brought up earlier at Swarthmore, designed by uh, Thomas Sears in 1942, provided inspiration for this space. Uh, we can get into materiality. Are there rocks along the edges of the tiers? I debated with Hope whether there might be a small aquatic pond on the top of the bench with some water cascading down to provide auditory shelter um, and cooling in the way uh, the city hall walls do, but it's a thing. We've added some trees along the perimeter to provide shade, so this would be an inhabitable space. Um, for me, the existing courtyard, we said that it was incremental. Um, it didn't define spaces, it feels very piecemeal. So we tried to define two very clear spaces with clear edge conditions that uh, responded to the request. But I do think there are some other opportunities um, without getting totally into planting. Given the celebratory nature of this courtyard, uh, I think you could do things with color uh, for some of these trees that define the edge along the central space. Um, I've added trees, frankly, in problem areas to create a grove here, to create a grove here. The existing oaks are quite large. So some understory, more sculptural, ornamental trees. I thought you might add golden lead balls or uh, some wisaches that aren't super thorny, like a guajillo. Uh, could do Esperanza. Could add Maximilian sunflowers and Dexmenia in places where there's full sun. But I just imagined if you walked into this place and at various times of the year, it was golden and blooming. Um, it would feel worthy of celebration. Last note before I'll pause and invite your comments is in this space, uh, we think Diana is very important to the 
courtyard in terms of what she represents. And uh, I would suggest that we've actually elevated her position. The terrace seating in the debate space looks out onto the courtyard, views Diana, and while she's not in the middle here of this gathering space, I think she's in the most important spot and we, we kept her very deliberately. So let me just pause there before I move into sections and other pieces for reaction. Can you describe the two spaces that are um, uh, up against Littlefield? So that felt like an opportunity, Phoebe. In the existing space, you have a number of like 70s picnic benches down in this corner. Um, these two spaces at the north end, uh, we kept heritage trees. And some of the grading, we used the grading because we thought you might want additional quiet areas. And if you wanted to add tables or seating areas, I, I put in a row of hedges and a couple more trees for shade, but that felt like wasted space. It wasn't part of the program. It just felt like an opportunity. Okay. Nelly, Mirka, questions before I move on? No, move on. Let's see the sections and the other things. That's great. Okay. Sorry, the only other thing I would add is uh, there is real asymmetry in terms of the ramps here. Uh, if this ramp is a very steeply sloped grade and given the ADA requirements, we added all of the exist, all of the paths are 10 feet, except for these, which are five feet, uh, a way for differently abled people to access the central space. We tried to keep circulation uh, not so prescribed. You don't have to go around a lot of walls. There's a considerable traffic that moves diagonally from the northwest to the southeast. Uh, you can still do that, but it, we thought it was very important for folks to get up this end, uh, the south end. The grade is not that significant. So. Moving on in terms of the sections, I just tried to highlight, so section one, sorry, this flag up here, moves across the front of Carruthers and highlights this debate space. Uh, and you see a little outline of Diana. I had originally located this space in this area, but the existing plantings and heritage trees and the grade made it uh, not extremely practical. I feel like this is a better solution and we haven't raised the back of the terracing that high. It's only two feet higher or one, one foot, depending where you are from the existing grade but I think it's enough with the step down terraces to reinforce that it is its own space. Um, in the next section, we highlight this very large central area uh, that looks at Carruthers and that natural balcony patio for Carruthers. Um, definitely lends itself to larger gatherings and either viewing from there or speakers 
addressing a larger crowd. And then the third and fourth sections um, really show, the third section shows the existing grade and the creation of, of one of those small spaces, Phoebe, that you asked about that could, could be a quiet refuge, um, not necessarily a debate space, but, but quite functional. And at, at, at the south end and then the north end, you see, oh, sorry. Further north, the section four again shows that terrace space, uh, which is symmetrical, both going east, west, and north, south, in terms of the terracing. And hard to see here, but there is a uh, ramp up and a ramp back, which you see leading up to the second space. Um, Moving along, I have more work to do on my drawings. I'd like to show more how this invites students and put people into it, but this is the idea. You're able to move around this terrace seating space. Um, there's worth more. I mean, it's quite old at this point, so we won't get there immediately, but that was the inspiration. And then the path moving up and down some of these recessed prairie areas, the central area here, and the terrace spot. So um, I certainly have some questions for you, but I'd like to answer yours first. So, hey, Justin. Uh, yeah, no. You're very thoughtful. So I appreciate that you very clearly thought about sort of the, the materiality and sort of the, the, the detail of these spaces. Um, you know, you were in a tough position going at the end of a very long review session and we're running late. So I think one of the things to help you and not just, you know, not just through school, but being a professional is being very clear about your big picture goals before you go into that level of detail. Because if we understand what your goals are for the site, for each individual space, mm -hmm. we can get into the, to the, whether this detail, you know, whether that plant or whether this uh, texture really makes sense. But I think um, before we have that conversation, you know, having a big picture view of the structure of your site and your goals, your intent as a landscape architect as to what your intervention is really trying to capture will kind of help set the stage for those, those conversations, um, especially when you're in the position of, you know, having to, to, to speed us through it very quickly because we're running out of time, because that's gonna happen in real life. Like you'll be in front of a client, it'll be the end of the meeting, the engineer will have dominated for 45 minutes, you've got 10 minutes to make your pitch. Um, you know, how do you do that effectively? So, um, thank you, Nellie. Can I ask you specifically in terms of describing the two spaces, what could I have done to be clearer about that? Um, I think part of it is in the rendering of your plan. Like your plan can do a lot of work. And so, you know, I found myself going to the Dropbox just to, just to see, see what the detail is. And I think that there's, a, there's um, you can help yourself by, giving more clarity to the carving of the space. Cause I know right now you have like a lot of little detailed, um, you know, grasses and, and whatnot, but in terms of being able to read as a mass, like think about things in terms of sort of scales of space. You start at the site mass volume scale, represent mm -hmm. that, and then go into another drawing to represent your thoughts about how that mass is really made up of like these granular pieces. Right now, this drawing in particular is, is a mashup between like uh, site 
and detail that that's making you making you have to work more for it. Okay, thank you. Mirka, you look like you're about to say something. Uh, I'm taking a note of what um, Nelly just said because I thought it was interesting. The scales of space and. I think I agree with that, that um, the large moves, the large um, ideas need to be simplified, clarified, and you do have two visual representation systems going on here at the same time, the detail of level of planting and the larger ones. Um, Yes, I mean, one of the things, if we had more time, I would ask you to go through the circulation, but I won't do that. I'll actually pass the word to Kim or to who hasn't spoken yet, and then maybe interject in just a moment. Um, I, I have something to say, I think, um, and apparently the electricity has blown in my office, so um, I'm on a dwindling power. If I, if I disappear, um, I, I will have to go plug in in another building. <laughs> Um, I, I think that, you know, you started off by talking about the orthogonal nature of the plan and how that respects the buildings. And um, I, I don't know if that's like a foundation for a design, but I think what you've done actually, um, th there's something about the orthogonal nature and the way that, that you, you look across um, the arrangement of these spaces and forms you know, on the diagonal, um, that that works really nicely, uh, and and you do look across at the di on the diagonal because of that main route along Littlefield, um, and I think you know it also has to do with the topography and the way that the spaces are kind of stacking up, especially from the is it the southeast corner. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, you see, you look and you see the prairie grasses and then you see the main space and then you see the, you know, the terrace space and that stacking, I think is, is really wonderful. Um, and I think like your, everything should support that. So, you know, there, there are other things, other, um, like the spaces at Littlefield aren't really related to that idea. You know, they, they seem like they're, they're sort of something else. And you said they're functional. And I wanted to say like, well, they shouldn't be functional. They should be like um, beautiful and inspiring, you know, <laughs> like, um, so anyways, I, I think that um, I, I really appreciate how you're using the plants. Um, you know, if you look at the, the sort of diagram of the plan, these large broad areas of grass, grasses or other like plantings are really supporting the composition. Um, and, you know, that's just in a drawing, but it translates into experience and use of space as I can see it in your model shot um, where it, you know, it just sort of like clicks. Um, that said, like, I think one of the things that I really like is how the central space is offset. Um, and as you said, it's because, you know, you wanted to create equal amount of space, um, but then the heritage tree is sort of shading um, or taking up a portion of the, the open area. Fine. But I, I like that sort of offset. Um, I think that that should maybe register in the way the grasses are wrapping around, like the grasses wrap around symmetrically but maybe they shouldn't, maybe they should be an L. Um, you know, maybe the, um, if you get rid of the, um, the little portion on the, on the north, um, the north end um, and just allow it to kind of wrap around. Um, and, you know, I think you, you could play a little bit with that asymmetry and have that asymmetry happen in the other spaces as well. Um, but yeah, I think that the, for me, where, where it kind of just loses its power are those two spaces at Littlefield. Um, and, you know, so I, I would maybe re, and, and really it's just the hedge, you know, it's, it's like a ring of a hedge, right? So, um, 
uh, maybe you just need to reconsider how the hedge happens um, in those spaces. I also I appreciate your criticism, Phoebe. Uh, I think there's something interesting to do with some of the grading, and I left some of the grading. But uh, last time I asked you about the central walkway through the, that middle space, and most of my classmates agreed with you. It was reading as two spaces and not one. So that was really good feedback and it's incorporated here. So I will take that one into the next step. Thank you. I think the hedge, you know, the head, the, the, the terrace space has a hedge at the back edge. Is that, is that what I'm reading? Those little plants? Yeah. That, that's a hedge, right? Yeah, I was thinking like Texas, uh, Fed or some, I haven't really thought, thought through the plantings very well, but yes, a hedge with, and I added a couple of trees to the two yeah. that are already existing in those spaces. Yeah, so I mean, a hedge is a really volumetric form. And I think like maybe this idea of the hedge, it doesn't just happen in the corner. Maybe the hedge kind of winds its way, you know, south mm -hmm. on, on the other side, or, or maybe it, it, you know, it's interrupted by that um, more open space with the trees, and then it picks up um, along little field. Like I, maybe just thinking of it more holistically. Um, yeah, you you're know, calling me out. Uh, I have not given those tertiary spaces enough thought. But I think they're interesting spaces. Mm -hmm. So I will. It's a it's an it's a strong plan and good work. Thank you. I mean, we're running over. Kimberly, do you have a couple of minutes, or um, it, we won't be able to have a, a wrap up session? I can go till five of three. Okay. I don't know about everyone else, but did you have anything you wanted to say? Kim, Kimberly? Oh, you're asking me? <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was time. Um, I haven't, I don't think I fully collected my thoughts on this one. Um, Can I ask you a question, Kimberly? Yeah, please. So, I love an aquatic garden and the idea of the top space here just being a small pond with two feet of water dropping that would provide some auditory shelter uh, and potentially some cooling feels exciting. But based on what you know about Texas uh, campus, is that an overreach? Is it conceptually too much of a thing or would you push for water in this courtyard? No, I mean, if you have money, you can do anything you want. <laughs> um, I think there's like a huge cultural appetite for auditory shelter right now as mm -hmm. we're subjected to the din of living in a growing urban city, um, especially with the amount of construction <laughs> in Austin. So the idea of using plants and water to make an auditory shelter is wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful conception of a small outdoor room. Um, and like you said, like the evaporative cooling that you would get from that would create um, a nice microclimate for a little bit of reprieve from the, the Austin heat. I think before you asked that, I was trying to reconcile that space with the concept image you showed of the terraced um, the sort of woodland terraces. Is that the same? Uh, yeah, the Swarthmore, just the idea that you could have really nice grassy seating areas with shallow steps down where people could sit that would be much more inviting than say concrete benches. Yeah, th this is sort of like a nice hybrid between like a cultural you know, like an academic cultural environment and like a forest bath 
you know, you sort of get everything you want <laughs> in an image like this. Right. Yeah, they've um, had like 80 years also. Yeah. Um, I think working towards building this, you know, in a UT courtyard would be incredibly challenging. But, you know, I guess what I would leave you with is if there's an intention to use water, um, the first consideration should always be where is that water coming from? Um, can it be captured rainwater from one of the roofs of the adjacent buildings? And then you sort of start yeah. to capitalize on like the larger uh, biological systems or ecological systems, I guess, in the area where, you know, maybe you capture AC condensate. I, I don't know where the AC for these buildings comes from. Yeah. I don't know if it's local or if it's like- Elo somewhere. Center did an amazing job of that, but they had a very large budget. Yeah, but so back to your question, like, yes, um, using water in gardens in Texas is great. You just have to be considerate as to where the water's coming from. And, yeah. you know, I think the rule to like turn off the fountains because of drought restrictions is is pretty stupid. It's just a, it's an empty gesture <laughs> because they don't actually use that much water. And what they can do for a space is worth its weight in gold. So, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hope I know we're over. No, um, I I let the I, because not everyone could come to the overview this morning at nine to nine thirty. I had to repeat it, so it ate into our time, and then I let the first session go longer. I, I tried to be polite. So, Justin. You deserve equal amounts of attention as does everyone uh, within your session this morning, uh, this afternoon. So um, since I probably have, no one's making bad faces or texting me behind the scenes. I think what we could do is, do any of you, those of you who participated and presented in this session have a comment or a thought that um, they would like to share or from your rest of your classmates uh, before we break and uh, head into the three o'clock session. Uh, uh, so I would like to open it up to have a, a larger comment or that addresses everybody. But it looks like everyone seems to be ready to go. Oh, um, Hope, I just wanted to say to all that um, this has really been excellent work. I've enjoyed seeing both those projects of your peers earlier in the morning session and now. And uh, I'm impressed with how everyone has a kind of party, an idea, a grasp um, of a concept and have elaborated that in um, quite a range of drawings. Um, I would recommend that when you get to your next, next step of drawings and you'll be doing this next semester in the history class, you'll be doing perspective views of your picturesque site. So no better time to get started on that than now. And to give a sense, especially since the project has been defined as one about volumes, uh, besides Edenic, Edenic Lush um, garden concept, that you attend to that issue of volumes and draw them again and again and again, just with small sketches. Small sketches will do it. But thank you, it's been wonderful. Uh, thank you for being here, Mirka. Um, I'd just like to say that um, I think uh, the work was really strong also. Um, and uh, especially considering that this is a three credit class um, and everything that you all have on your plate uh, for first semester. You know, you have well-developed concepts or strong concepts, right? With, uh, um, that have been developed, um, developed along uh, several layers, including um, manipulating topography, right? Sculpting uh, the land um, planting, considering um, how people will use this this space, um, and you know, forming kind of character, um, and and that's sort of a lot. You know, that's a that's a lot um, a lot to consider, and um, 
I think that what I'm really excited about is that each of you had very strong conceptual ideas because the facility with developing those ideas materially and, you know, in terms of three-dimensional space will come with time. Um, I also appreciate the restraint that I see in the work, um, but I think that restraint, minimalism, and simplicity are all really great things, um, but they don't, uh, they don't mean that you can't also um, be adventurous um, and really creative. So there were a few projects that I think um, were maybe more timid. And, you know, I would say for those students, like, don't be timid. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be straightforward um, and, um, and strong with your ideas, but, um, but don't be afraid to take risks. Um, and yeah, I think um, based on what I saw today, we're gonna have a really great semester next uh, in the spring. So thank you. Also a great presentation skills. Um, I guess uh, Dr. Shearer um, did a great job with you all, <laughs> as did, of course, your main instructor, um, Professor Hasbro. This was not a banner semester for Professor Hasbrook. I think the students spoke for themselves. Got off to a rough start that never seemed to get better. So, uh, Nellie. Let's talk about um, how amazing it is to persevere during your first semester of landscape architecture in a <laughs> pandemic. So, <laughs> kudos to dealing with you know, a brand new world with new languages, with new techniques, um, and having to think differently and outside the box, but welcome to the profession. So kudos, kudos to, to your professor for shepherding you through and all of your, all of your work. Okay. Um, thanks everybody. We'll see Kimberly, uh, thank you, yeah, applause, applause, but uh, big applause at five. Uh, Nellie and Kimberly will be returning over the course of the week in, uh, at, uh, with uh, Maggie and possibly with James Lord and Roderick Wiley, as will um, Mirka and Phoebe. So our outside guests and then uh, Adam, I think we'll, we'll only see Adam tomorrow, uh, late last session and then, uh, and then tomorrow. So. All right, everyone, I got to walk the dog in eight minutes. So I'll see you all back here at three o'clock. I thank everybody for their time and attention and the and the double loading of work. You know, I'm, it's at your house, it's on Miro and it's here. So no, you know, we triple backup. So um, terrific. Thank you all. I'll see you tomorrow or I'll see you at three. Thank you very Great much. Great to see you and Kim and Nelly. Oh, Yay. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> hey, take care, Kim. See you tomorrow.
I see Maggie and Jane is connecting and there's Adam. Okay. Hey there. Okay, there's Jane. Jane, do you know Maggie? Hello. No, hi Maggie. Hi, Maggie and Adam. Hey. Hi Adam, how are you doing? Good, good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all too. All right. Okay, so um, Jane got short shrift today uh, when it came to getting to take her through the courtyard. Um, Maggie had a chance to join us this morning, but we've got five students. I'm going to try to keep myself under four minutes and then we'll, br and then hopefully, hopefully we will, we will take some time at the end of the session to, um, for broader comments, like amongst the students to you or you to the students or when their classmates decide to share their uh, virtual visage with us, um, they can also ask some questions. So that worked really well in the first session. Here's the thing. So uh, poor Jane didn't get it. Uh, um, she rallied pretty quickly. And we did spend a lot of time in the early session talking about Diana, the sculpture, Diana, the huntress, and she's there with her dog. Uh, there's a hunting dog with her. So, uh, but uh, here, you know, the image of this is Carruthers with its rather prominent uh, facade and the thrusting uh, reading room, uh, looking north toward Littlefield Hall. Uh, I described a little bit the contours, right? They go, it slopes dramatically from the southwest to the northeast. So there is some significant grading that happens uh, in many of the situations here. Everybody knows, one, they, uh, there are multiple heritage trees on the site. I've told them to only keep three for the basic reason that resolving the grading and maintaining this really ate into the overall objectives of the course, or at least of this five and a half week project, which really was defining spatial volumes, exterior rooms, and then the technical grading that goes with it. Um, Adam knows that the contours have negative numbers. We know those don't exist. Thank you, Tech One. Um, and that they also worked with Dr. Shearer on their presentations and they have um, been extremely uh, strong and concise in their seven to 12 minute. Jane, these are some images from the uh, uh, LIDAR and photogrammetry exercise that we, the students have had access to this data taking us from Little Field, which you see elevated here. This Little Field, the entry to Little Field here to the north is really what set the datum for the photogrammetry and LIDAR. So that's the contours are all in relationship to this elevation point. Am I not Got sharing? Shared. No, you're not sharing. You're not sharing your screen. <laughs> Hello. I thought it was just me. No. It's me, and I'm being unprofessional, I guess. Okay, so um, <laughs> sorry, everybody. So this is Project Zero, and then all the contours are measured from this point down, downward. So that's why the contours appear as negative. But so this is the Andrews dorm, and here we are facing the thrusting stage or reading room of Carruthers. And you can see the large heritage trees uh, uh, interspersed throughout. Um, this document is on or is in UT Box. So you have every opportunity to go into UT Box if while during someone's presentation to find it. It's called 20 Hasbrook Underbar One. So under on that note, um, if you have some clarifying questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, and then, if not, then we'll let Catherine uh, begin her presentation. Clarifying questions? Okay, great. I will stop my share. And Catherine, it's all you. Okay, let me connect my um, Duet app because I have to get it from my computer. Okay. And you, little one, out of the room. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, can you see that? I can't say see y'all, so somebody might have to say. Yes, yes, we, yes. Can. we can see it. It's okay. Um, sorry, my dog there might about to bark. I think it's mine. Oh yeah, I'm pretty quiet. I'm starting right now. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Oh, it's going backwards. Here we go. Hi, I'm Catherine, and uh, this is a proposal for the Honors Courtyard um, by the um, Carruthers, Andrews, Blanton, and Littlefield dorms on campus. And the, the main idea is the three main exterior rooms for the formal use of celebration, debate, and ceremony. And um, they also serve a multifunctional space defined by the border of, and density of tree plantings with the terrace classroom, the extension of the Carruthers reading room for intimate discussions or study, and also the open space for recreation. Incorporating um, accessibility to each space along the main access um, from Littlefield to Andrews. There's also a simple roundabout, um, which is home to Diana, along one of the sub axes from Carruthers that creates a space for drop off, move in, and maintenance convenience for the staff. So here's my contour map. Um, many of the um, flat uh, graded spaces are terraces, um, slightly sloping because they need to help with the grade of the overall um, courtyard. And also there are some existing contours um, in the terrace room that help um, create uh, Natu neutrality and also um, to help separate it. So here are the three rooms, um, one for ceremony, debate and celebration and celebration and debate. And I use those words because depending on the size, uh, I feel like they could be interchangeable in within each space. Um, in the ceremony space, using the large terrace that Littlefield provides, um, the, the students could line up and come through this ADA ramp that would be added, um, come up, receive their diploma, come back and sit back down where their parents would sit behind them. Um, many of the trees are not specified only because I would hope that some of the smaller trees could be repurposed um, with our hypothetical unlimited budget. Um, here is uh, some where the section cuts will be. And here is some of my longitudinal sections. Um, this one has a view of all three of the rooms from the Blanton side. And this one is also from the Blanton side, but um, further back to see more of the holistic view, including Diana with the roundabout. Um, these are some of the cross sections. Uh, this one is facing towards Littlefield where the students would line up to receive their diploma in the ceremony space and the two heritage trees that frame the view up to the Littlefield platform. And these are um, some of the views across the courtyard from the terrace classroom. And this one is to the other side towards Andrews with the um, the trees behind it. These are some of the rendered views and you can see the open space in the ceremony slash recreation space um, towards the classroom in the back and also Crothers to the right. And this is the other way towards Littlefield from the classroom slash debate space that can be seen to the north. Thank you. Catherine, can you go back to your site plan as well? 
This one? Sure. So how much uh, elevation drop is there from the south west corner, which is the high point, to the northeast corner, which is the low point? So with the existing grading, uh, I think it was about like 12. But from here to here, it's only like six. And here to here is only six. There is a drop off right here. It's about like three and a half feet. But the um, ramp comes up and around it. So these terraces are mostly flat with um, a slight slope um, towards the east side. Mm -hmm. OK. When you go to your longitudinal section, I guess it, it looked a little flat in that um, mm -hmm. length. So from A to A prime, should we see the 12 feet in elevation change or not quite because of where that's cut? Um, a A prime is right here. So it's this oh, one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not a die. Yeah, it's not the diagonal. So you're not going to see the full elevation drop. Right. I guess okay. I could do one of those. No, that's well. okay. You're showing it correctly. It was just, I wanted to wrap my head around it. Okay. Do you have a, um, a section or a view that shows how you resolved the end of the terrace seating? The end? Um, what do you mean by the end? Uh, just where the contours are stacked together, uh, right where your rooms sort of change from the celebration space to the other space. Uh, it's where those benches would sort of stop. Right here? Yeah, zoom in on that maybe. Let's see. Um... How do you zoom? Control Let's, and plus. Oh, go. sorry. I did it this way. That works. Oh, now it went to the next page. Scroll. Oh, don't do that. Okay. There you go. So, yeah, it kind of slopes down towards the sidewalk in the middle. Catherine, Go for it, Maggie. Um, okay, <laughs> Catherine, I think I think there's a really nice clarity of these three rooms, and uh, if you were going to keep working on this further, I think the thing that I would love to explore for uh, explore more is the way that you're sort of orchestrating the way that they overlap. Sometimes um, the way that the edges are defined both in terms of topographic change, but also changes in enclosure that's created by planting uh, could be um, strengthened even further or, or uh, developed as a set of contrasting experiences as we move um, along your longitudinal section. Uh, you've, um, the way you've developed the grading is uh, sort of suppressing a lot of um, those, uh, the topographic changes that we see in section. But I think that um, the edge conditions where we transition from our ceremonial room into the sort of uh, debate and celebration zone, which is um, formal around this entrance, uh, and then the way that um, the topography is really heightened in the next room, the celebration slash debate, uh, I think that um, that could start to be uh, teased out even further and, um, and might even heighten the experience of walking in this long ramp through the, the center section. Okay, thank you. Hello. Yeah, I think my, sorry, my, my, my um, articulation of the debate slash celebration was, yes, the overlapping could use some work, but also that they're kind of interchangeable in that if you had a smaller, smaller group of people that you wanted to debate with, you could use the in front of Carruthers space, but if you had a larger one, you could use the Terrace classroom space oh, is so the idea that I was getting at. 
it's not so much that they operate as a shared space, but they are um, have similar functions. Is that similar? Or depending on the size, yes, of okay. the group of people, yes. Catherine, can you go back to the initial model shot, your first slide, slide number one? I just thought it encapsulated the work uh, pretty pretty well. Thank you. It does. It does. It does. I, so I'll just say a couple quick things and uh, give it over to Jane real quick. So, uh, Catherine, one thing I would recommend is potentially uh, when you do the proposed trees, I would either strip the color out or knock the saturation down by 70% so that it fits the sort of monochromatic uh, nature of the rest of the model. Um, I think that would help uh, graphically for one thing. Um, the other thing is that I would, I think we could develop the experiential qualities of the narrative a little bit more. So I understand the programmatic use of the space. I think you articulated that very well, but it, I want to kind of be sold on it and sort of what the feeling is or the emotion of that space and being within each of them. So I would strengthen that part of the narrative. Um, and you're welcome to go back and speak to it if you want to, but I don't want to take too much time. But anyways, that was just something I noticed is it would be nice to uh, strengthen, strengthen the essence of what it is to be in each of those spaces. So. Um, that was it for me. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Do you, um, okay. Yeah, you can go. I'll ask my questions after. Oh, no, go ahead. You got a question? Well, I was just wondering, Adam, what you would, what your idea of a recommendation for strengthening the emotional narrative of each space would be. Sure. So it's, um, to me, it would be like, if I were a user in the debate space or whatever, like what, what am I sensing in that space with uh, the specifics of the definition for the room? So what are the volumetric sort of descriptions that you can associate to that use of the space? And so am I, you know, surrounded by a specific plant? Uh, there's mm -hmm. a, you, you mentioned, I think some use, you know, you mentioned like intimacy and having the ability to have like smaller conversations, but what is the, enclosed the sense of enclosure and uh expansiveness and you mentioned like people being able to walk the ramp go back to their seats and their parents are sitting behind them but what is you know that's like how that space works through circulation but then how does that space work through um you know what's around you you know when you're sitting in this sort of open expanse are you bound you're clearly you're bound by the trees because i could see it in that diagram but are there other like qualities besides just flat and trees? Like mm, okay. other other like selling points, I guess, for a client. I, I to add to that, I'd I'd add to some of the things that Mirka and Nelly had discussed, had brought up the questions in the last session. Hierarchy. What is the relationship between we understand the hierarchy of relationships in section or for graduation, right? You have three classes of people, faculty, students, and parent, parents, well, let's call it loved ones, right? And so each one has a very particular relationship to one another, student to faculty, student to parent, faculty to parent, or faculty to loved ones. So those are those by setting the elevations, right? You have said very much or have the potential of com communicating uh, much of the relationships. Now, so what is it in terms of debate? Where, does the, where do the two opposing sides stand? How does, um, in terms of debate, what if it is a classroom experience? Is the faculty member at the same elevation as the student in this? Or are you actually giving the faculty member an opportunity to stand or sit at a different level in relationship to the students or the student to the faculty member? So those in relationship to the plant material and the ways in which you've made the boundaries can speak so much to the experience and those constructed relationships that are intentional uh, in the work. 
Yes, and I was going to take off on what Adam and Hope both said. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, because I didn't get an idea, because I know, you know, design, you can go, okay, this room is for this, this room is for this, this room is for this. But what type of space, not only spatial qualities, but how much physical space do I need for a debate space? How much, you know, in terms of not only what does it feel like, but depending on how much space you allocate, that could have a lot to do with how you feel about the space. And, you know, as well as the sense of enclosure and as well as how, um, you know, the materiality, you know, I haven't gotten much of the, you talk about kind of the, the circulation and the function, but what's the feeling of the space and what's the meaning of the space and how is it different at different times a day? You know, you've probably sat through graduations out in the sun and it's not very much fun. So what time of day would it be? appropriate to have those events and how can you accommodate um, the dynamics of that? Um, that would be one of the things I thought about. And then another thing, if you go back to your site plan, please. This one with the contours or just this the one? The contours, yeah, the contours. Um, it's hard to read. I think when you explained it, you explained what you're doing, but make sure graphically that you have a strong distinction between your existing and proposed contours and I don't care if the contours are made up. I mean, that's okay. And, you know, as long as you know, you have a temporary benchmark where the Z, you know, where your existing elevation is somewhere to take off from, but it's really important to show that and to show your mastery of that understanding. So label the contours, show the directional flow, um, you know, and, to, and then you wouldn't have those additional questions about, well, what does this look like in this section? You know, the more you can communicate um, your ideas you're trying to get across, I think the questions will be more what you want to talk about instead of the technicalities of what you have and haven't done. The other thing that isn't clear to me on this diagram is where the trees you're trying to save, you're supposed to save three of those big trees, where are they and what's the grade around them? Um, so up here in the north are two of the larger heritage trees and I Basically kept all of this is the same, even the walkway. Um, so those yeah. wouldn't really be touched except for adding the, the ramp on this side of um, Littlefield. Mm -hmm. So those aren't changing. So the, the grade isn't changing. Okay. For those ones. All right. But you should probably point that out in terms of with the existing trees that you're trying to save. And so people can see where they are and, and what that means. Um, because that's really important. And you talked also about repurposing some of the other trees. What were you, what'd you have in mind there? Um, so I was hoping that um, these two trees could hopefully be taken from some of these existing trees that were already on the site. Okay. Because they don't exist there right now. Oh, so you were trying to use existing trees from the site in some of your new plantings. Right. In your new scheme. Okay. Right. Yeah, that, did, that didn't quite come across. I'm sorry. Um, okay. That's, um, that's good in theory. I'm not sure how um, beneficial it is in reality, but um, I like the concept. I think there might just be some problems in making that work because what you'd have to do is you have to hold them off site you'd have to take care of them, maintain them during construction. So a lot of times it's just cheaper and more efficient to give those to somebody else or put them somewhere else and put new materials in. Thank you. But those I were my didn't comments. know about those kinds of things. Oh, no, that's, that's okay. Right. Catherine, on your next slide, the, uh, the one that shows the colors of the uses, yeah, that one. So I think the reason we're sort of talking about the, uh, you know, some other aspects besides from function alone is it could help strengthen this. So I think what's interesting is if, if you have debate and celebration and then celebration and debate, is it simply the size of the audience that varies, that dictates the use of that space or are there other, um, you know, designed experiences that would, better facilitate a specific use in a space? 
And I think that's kind of what I was getting at is like, you could use those other adjectives to describe um, when would one be more appropriate a use than another, right? I think you could strengthen that end of it because you, okay. you, yeah. I think another thing that um, would probably help with that kind of idea would be um, exploring more about the ground materials, which I didn't really get into, but um, I think that would help a lot too. Mm -hmm. Cool. Can I say something? Uh, you guys don't punish yourselves, right? I should have done this. I should have done that. Hold, hold, hold the phone, right? It's a three credit course. It's one fifth of everything that you've been doing all this semester. Yes, studio is synthetic, all right? Uh, but in light, just know that when you, criticism is often forward looking because your work brings up thoughts or issues, right? That each one of these practicing professionals says, ah, that's the next layer in terms of iteration and development. So always, keep that in the back of your mind as criticism is delivered, right? Because it's, it's it, your, the work promotes and provokes thought. It's not always about that you neglected. Right. What you did was you opened up an opportunity for something for another layer of development for the next four weeks of your fall semester. And don't, don't ever backpedal or apologize for your work. Yeah, you're putting your best effort forward and, and it shows, um, you know, we've we've been doing this a while. So we're going to have comments that that you probably haven't thought about. So you just acknowledge the comment. Don't say, oh, I should have done that or apologize for what you did, because when you get in front of a client, you never want to do that. You want to represent and put your best foot forward. And if you forgot something, well, then you get that you catch that on the next step. Right. Add it next. All right, all right, we're ready. We're moving on, we're moving on. Okay, and thank you, Catherine, congratulations. Thank you. Your semester is almost over. Well done. Thank you. Nice. Okay, Brent. Yeah, let me get it. Okay, colleagues, don't forget, higher resolution, better projected images are on box, just in case. You all see it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is reimagining the honors courtyard. Uh, the goal is to reimagine the courtyard and create a distinct uh, outdoor rooms that serve different uses, but ultimately lead to a central access um, was the goal. So the rooms vary in hierarchy, uh, ultimately create different emotions and relatively small plot of land and the rooms um, are meant to create uh, that different emotion in there. So I used, uh, or what was used was xeric and low maintenance plantings, grading, uh, change, hardscape uh, to define the space and to create a multi-use space that can be uh, quiet or house a small graduation stage. So uh, these are early sketches to kind of formulate ideas um, with a stage and centralized point. And I use Zilker Park as a as a uh, reference site um, to kind of formulate ideas. All right, so uh, this is a plan as the grade uh, change uh, you can see there and it's dashed lines to show previous contours. Um, so water is gonna lead to French drains uh, that would be kind of near the base of the uh, buildings. So the bearing slopes define the main ceremony space. Sorry, I can use my mouse. So that would be the space right here. Um, and the plinth here creates uh, different fields in this large room. So this is used for um, large gatherings or uh, graduation. So this is an area to sit up here and have seating out on the sides and then the grade, grade changes here as well. So this kind of varies in the effect that the room has, but it's one large room. Um, 
So there is uh, low grass and crushed aggregate that leads through the major path, uh, major paths, which is right here, and then up here, going into Carruthers, um, and then down here as well. All right, so these are uh, sections. The sections show enclosed debate space right here um, with trees um, and then a space for open ceremony right here. And so this section right here, and you can kind of see where, where it was cut, the second section reveals a lift in the grade um, in the center and that creates that access point um, yeah, access point in a stage um, that kind of borders areas for rooms. So these are our longitudinal sections. Um, these sections so define border walls with foliage edge. So right here, and this is the front of Carruthers. They're kind of that outcrop. Um, and then a xeric zone here that creates that emotion that's in the center of the uh, plinth area, similar to, to right here. So you, again, using, thinking of my time that I've spent at uh, the Silker Park or the Botanic Gardens there, thinking about what kind of emotions that evokes and then reiterating that into this courtyard. Um, so the plantings, not to get too involved in that, because I wanted to, well, the goal is to use these as shapes uh, that form rooms, but some Palo Verde, agave, fountain grass, um, turf grass, Monterey oaks, and viburnums. Um, so easy topiary plants. Here are uh, some perspectives, and these reveal uh, the space as grade plantings and landscape. Um, or hardscape delivers the room objectives. So this is looking out from Carruthers at that plinth area. Um, and then that xeric grass material, here's a heritage, to, heritage tree there. And then on this one is that debate space that uh, would be kind of lined with uh, thinking about Monterey Oak, something that's low growing. Um, and that leads to going up into that point area where you've got Syric plants that are easy to maintain that are still gonna give blooms and whatnot for uh, ceremony. So um, this kind of enclosed space is for uh, debate. And if I can go up real quick, I wanted to show you guys this portion there. So that's that debate space right here. And then this ceremony space right here, allowing people to uh, sit when a ceremony is happening up here, something to look up similar to like a stage that's lifted. Um, and then an area of celebration that here that's a little bit enclosed with some foliage to create a sound barrier, um, and kind of a, a secondary room. And that all leads through these paths that um, can kind of lead to the varying different rooms, but I give a different effect on any avenue that you want to take. Hey, Brent, real quick, can you, uh, on this plan that's on the screen, can you tell me where your high point of the site is and where your low point of the site is? Yes. So obviously right here is high and then it's gonna slope down right here. Um, and then the going from here, it's fairly flat across. It's like a cross right here. And then But technically it puts your low end of the site at the south east corner of the courtyard. Is that correct? Uh South. If you go up a page, would be up uh, to the back to the grading plan. There we go. Yeah. So the way you've stacked the contours places the north 
uh, west corner at the high end of the site. And this is as if we're ignoring the plinth, right? And you're just sort of sheet flowing mm. across the site. Then it sort of pulls all the water in the corner of the buildings that's at the south east corner, mm -hmm. which is opposite of the way that the existing drainage works. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my concern would be uh, generally you would want to continue to flow in the same direction, right? So you don't, you don't want to work against yourself and start to push water uphill. Um, so ideally the south, sorry, northeast corner would still have been the lowest point um, of the, the plain. So if you think of the courtyard as a tilted plain with a plinth that comes out of the middle of it, it still should have been sloped towards the northeast corner. Like Does that make sense? The existing grade. Yeah, because right now you, you've pushed all the stormwater that goes around your plinth towards uh, a corner mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. surrounded by buildings and it can't get out. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also, so just a couple more critiques. We'll come right back to some things. Is I would show the buildings, like the footprints of them. I think it's important to understand where there's gaps in buildings and windows mm -hmm. and doors. Um, then I do, I want to congratulate you on simplifying the design because I remember having seen this at midterm, which was like yesterday, it feels like. Um, there were a lot of things and you definitely sort of subtracted and made some simpler, more bold gestures. So I think that that was successful. Um, the, what you call a path, I see it graded, but I don't see any line work that suggests a material change for the use of that path. So I think you really, if you're going to call it a path, you want to show it. Um, I do like the idea that the raised plinth has uh, some xeric qualities to it and that um, to do that, you would probably import a very specific soil type into a courtyard that it's not, that's not present. Right. And so then those are new imported soils which will drain well. They'll be above the sort of existing uh, slope of the plane. So that makes sense. I mean, there's some logic to that, which I like. Um, your steps in the perspective, you got to have equal riser height. You can't have the first step be taller than the rest. Uh, and the last thing is that um, I want to be like defining a space because you've changed grade I think is a stronger method for defining space than just simply putting trees. So I'm, I'm nervous that the debate space that's in the Southwest corner doesn't come off uh, as successful if it is merely just sort of done through planting and then the, the grade doesn't change. Right. So I would, I'd want that to sort of do more work um, to strengthen the definition of the uniqueness of that space. Uh, and it really shows up in your first section. So if you scroll down to the next page and you see the very first section, so that to me is a super flat site with an alley of trees. And I don't know that that does enough um, to, to define the space. So that was my feedback. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Uh, sure. Um, possible to put something like our things in this area here to pull water away from these buildings so that it's going you know so that it's still sloping towards the building but you almost have like a swale that's collecting the water yeah. and off site. so here's the best rule of thumb you'll ever receive is that drains clog right any any sort of infrastructure that you would rely on in order to save you from flooding a building is not a good idea, right? So if, you know, that should be uh, something that you use um, when, uh, you know, your sheet flowing stormwater across the site and it's allowed to get out and then it, maybe it keeps you from being overwhelmed and it's uh, sort of a supplement. But if you solely rely on infrastructure, you're more often than not going to need to figure out your statute of limitations because it might come back to haunt you at some point. Because it requires maintenance, and then people don't maintain. 
and that's the issue. So, thank you. Okay, next is it? Uh, Jane, do you want to go or, or? Oh no, go ahead. I'm just okay. That's fine. Um, I don't. I don't see any faces, so I'm kind of like. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, who's going there? Yeah. yeah. All right. uh, so Brent, it's it's exciting to see a you know a big landform move here, and uh, it it just makes me want you to push it even further to um, to see multiple iterations of this to make sure that it is the height that you really want it to be. Right now, it feels to me like it is tall and close to the uh, the entrance of a building. And uh, perhaps it could be uh, a little bit mellower, but have a, a broader footprint that then some of the linear strategies of path, material change, planting could be strengthened and uh, emphasized and also have a relationship to this elliptical form. Um, if, uh, if, for instance, it were moved you know, slightly to the right so that the path intersected it tangentially, then it would be part of the sort of orbit of the ellipse um, moving through the site. And I think it, it gets at some of the things that Adam was pointing out as well about how you're defining these sort of secondary rooms, that I think they could have a stronger relationship to the sort of primary central space by thinking about how the planting intersects or has a reference to some of the guiding geometries that are forming these elliptical uh, forces across the site. And I think that that's just, it, it's quite simply is iterating through these drawings over and over and over again until you have multiple, um, multiple tests that start to get at a sense for the, the linear system of planting and path and the sort of orbiting um, elliptical form of your stage are all working uh, either in support of one another or in very strong contrast. I think in terms of your presentation, you were, um, it was really clear, except when you were talking about the experience that you uh, wanted for each of these spaces, you have in your mind a reference from spaces you've been in in Zilker Park. And so describe more specifically the experience that you're referencing and how that is made manifest through the physical forms that you're creating uh, in your present in your project here, because it's a great way of working. But you've got to uh, use the narrative a bit more for us to understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think that I was really taken by the way you started with your sketches. Go back to your first page. Okay, so you had me engaged then, like, what did you do? How did you do that? But then it, it's kind of like, like Maggie was saying, you, you go with these bold statements that are really good. You got to carry through. So you, you're telling me a story. You're telling me a story for the seven to 10 minutes you have, you know, and, and that's, the, that's a challenge, especially been working on something for a while. You got you to gotta boil it down and, and parse it out so that someone can understand that length of time. And that would have been, it would have been really helpful you showed how this went into your final product or final process, you know, that you had some type of connection between these initial sketches and then a sketch of how it came out and how you envisioned this. And it was because if it's totally different, why are you telling me? And then if it's like that, then how did you develop it? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Cause you, cause I was, I saw, I was like, Oh, cool. Okay. Where's it going with this? You know? And I was really curious. And um, mm -hmm. then you went right into your site plan. So um I think that you need to um, tell the story, you know, tell us what are you, what are you trying to tell me? And, and when you make a bold statement, go with it. Um, you know, cause I, I agree with the other two reviewers that you have some really strong stuff you're doing and then it just kind of, it, it needs to be more um, either tight, more tightly connected or mm -hmm. more broadly contrasted. Okay. Cause it's kind of, it's like you have two different ideas going on at least what I was seeing, you had two different schemes or ideas going on site. You had this elliptical thing and then everything else was not that way. So, you know, how does it, how does it all work together? I mean, I know we have three separate spaces, but, but how you can connect and how it works together 
also starts to suggest the hierarchy of your spaces and what you think about the experience that needs to happen in each space. Mm -hmm. um, I think somebody covered some of my other notes. Um, the, oh, I know one that no one has mentioned yet. Um, go to your site plan of your proposed elements. Okay, and then you mentioned, I think it was this, your circled place with the really small dots in the northern part of the site. And you said that was a little bit more over to the left on the other side of that walkway. There you go, right mm -hmm. there. Um, what is that? These were uh, by Burnham. Okay. All right, and that would be, a, be careful about when you talk about a sound attenuation, mm -hmm. because that's very technical and to really um, attenuate sound takes acres and acres and acres of trees, mm -hmm. <laughs> which you use in plant materials. So, but it's very effective as a visual buffer, you know, mm -hmm. so that, you know, it's kind of like if you don't see that highway noise or if you don't see that noise from the building, it doesn't bother you as much. Right. So what you're trying to do is provide a visual screen for that, okay. That it's a common, um, common thing that people do. But, um, but I liked where you were going with this. I just think um, with a few more iterations, you would really tighten up the design. So, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering. Um, I had messed with this central point a lot, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. so I was wondering. Um, as far as moving it, like you were talking about, Maggie, the, the distance from here to here is about like 11 feet. So if I had moved it out, I didn't want to encroach in this portion here. But were you saying like shrinking it down a little bit so that it's wider out? Um, yep. Okay. That's what I was thinking is that perhaps it doesn't have to be so tall if it's uh, being reinforced by other systems within the design that um, either through a planting strategy or, uh, you know, a different material strategy, you could um, suggest that form without having to go so high and therefore you'd have a little bit more flexibility about how it engaged some of the other systems on the site. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, you, you could use a site wall to sort of, you know, define some of the the shape of it uh, in addition to the landform itself. But I also wonder how the accessibility up to that space works out, because it looks like it's got stairs on two corners of it. And then there's, you know, I don't necessarily see a, a ramp um, up to it. Right. So you kind of ramp up to the base of a stair. Um, so there's some technicalities, I think, with it, but, um, mm -hmm. I do applaud sort of the, the bold gesture and, um, sort of overall concept of it, I think is interesting for sure. Mm -hmm. so thank you guys. Brent, I loved that you started with those sketches. It was such a great way of leading us into your project and your thinking. So I, I just want to restate that. I know it's already been said, but it, it was lovely. Awesome. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you guys for your time. Well, thank you for taking a big, bold risk, Brent. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. So Samantha then Zoe, and then Julia. So we're almost halfway. <laughs> all right, hi. Um, nice to see you all and thank you for coming. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay, can you see this? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. My name is Samantha and this design proposal is, the goal is to create accessible ceremony um, and discussion that is orbited by leisure activities that already happened in um, the courtyard before. Um, this is Carruthers and this is a reading room where people study and everything else is residential. So 
um, this being a place that already has a program of work, um, keeping the facade um, pushed out into the greater landscape just re reminds us why we're living here, for studying and keeping this, <laughs> um, this stage here in view of the windows of Carruthers um, helps the end goal of the studying be present at all times. Um, <laughs> um, this stage is also a uh, connection to the greater outside world um, because it is elevated above this grassy area and can be a place for small lectures or student debates. Um, and then from these windows and this repeating geometry, you can, um, and the, the planting plan gives a sense of seasonality. So um, zooming in a little bit. Um, from here, you would see um, a stand of red buds that would tell you that spring was coming. Um, and from here, there would be sunny plants um, that also tell you that spring is coming. So spring classics like blue bonnet or um, Indian blanket or Indian paintbrush. Um, and then also mixed with some grasses that could give year round interest and um, maybe like artichoke or like society garlic or something that helps have a mass and um, a year round foliage. Uh, and so also, so mirroring, <laughs> moving into <laughs> this area, uh, keeping the wildness of these edges um, helps paint from these windows this, uh, like hide this paving. So the elevation and the grasses here, which would be roughly like four feet tall ones, like Gulf Mali or Big Mali or um, some like Mexican bush sage or something like that, um, helps separate the stage and smaller um, classroom from like the sports area for, sp for Frisbee and then also shields this um, road. Uh, over here, we have um, flattened terraces that help to support the audience members that would be attending a ceremony. Um, roughly 60 people could sit here and then overflow could go onto these um, side square ones. Uh, these are all ADA accessible. This path runs right up to this stage. So it, you could wheel, if you were in a wheelchair, you could get your diploma without having to do any real grade change. Um, yeah, okay, moving. Oh, and these are the proposed trees with the dark trunks. And then the um, heritage trees have the lighter trunks. And many of them, uh, we took pathways out. Um, so they are a little more protected in this plan. So entering, entering in to the space from where most students would enter to begin with, you would see the statue of Diana and, and then Carruthers in the distance there um, and Andrews. In this longitudinal section, um, looking towards Carruthers to the west, you get a sense of um, a hierarchy of space. So the open space is the largest and clearest, most defined area. Um, the entrance is a little bit enclosed, but also more, more open. And then as you move down to the south, it is more enclosed and has more like personal growth areas. <laughs> um, and then Flipping to the other side of the courtyard over here, looking down towards Blanton, um, you can see the gray change of the flat, flattened areas for the audience can be used throughout the year for um, small like activities, um, picnics or reading or study outside. And again, the elevation helps um, hide some of that road and help you be more enclosed and inside the ground. 
looking at the courtyard and trying to imagine what graduation might look and feel like. Um, here would be like a, a year round um, program of use where there's a small classroom happening um, and then sports could happen up here, which I think is in this long section, Frisbee. And then uh, down here, you have your space for your graduation and your diploma right here with views of um, Diana and the wildflowers and the grasses. And, and then the people getting their diplomas get to see Carruthers where they just exited from, um, yeah. Thank you. Good job, Sam. Can you go back to the perspective rendering? That one, yeah. What are those columns? Um, oh, those are people. Those are, sorry, those okay. are scaly people. Scale figures. Okay. Yeah, it's not Photoshopped yet. Scaly people. <laughs> scaly people. Refrigerator persons. So I really like um, I really like the idea of this sort of concentric um, sort of offset inspired by uh, the reading room of Crothers, right? That's what that is. That shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what's what I think so interesting about it is it it's complicated, right? To partition the space <laughs> instead of like like simple bars that sort of segment you know north middle south right like that's uh i've just seen that you know over the past couple of years pretty regularly so this is a nice fresh approach which i think it comes with uh, many of its own challenges to figure out how to do that um but i appreciate the like boldness of it and i think one of the I think diagrams that explain it the best. I can't remember if the couple pages before or page after, but it's that that little diagram on the top right corner. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish that were your site plan. Like that to me is way more poetic than I think the site plan rendering leads on to believe. Jump back to your site plan. Uh, I feel like it. Um, or let me go to the one that. Yeah, because yeah, it has it ends up. Um, I mean, I guess this is great as a like a party to explain some vegetated spaces versus hardscape spaces, but the just the gesture is much more poetic in that sort of all white um, graphic. I think that's really nice. Um, there's a couple forms that I question, like the the triangles that are directly outside the reading room. Mm -hmm. uh, those seem like pretty harsh mm -hmm. corners. Um, so I think there's still, you know, another pass that could could happen there. The statue, is that what's in the middle of that little road area? So mm -hmm. its orientation mm -hmm. seems a bit arbitrary. Uh, it's not quite, you know, the same angle as the facets. Um, mm. But I like, I like that layered approach where there's, you know, existing uses. You said earlier, um, ceremony space orbited by leisure activities and those were the leisure activities that already existed so i thought that that was really nice way to organize your thoughts about the space so uh and a good use of topography uh, i question the wildflower uh display location because you're going to get a lot of morning uh shade and so though they would i think appreciate more full sunlight conditions so and and the fact that those you know those types of plantings um are going to draw quite a bit of attention. I would almost have them as the middle band of planting rather than mm. your uh, muley grasses. And I would put the taller muleybergias against the, uh, the perimeters. Uh, that way there's more color and excitement and energy, like closer to the center of the space rather than that sort of pastoral against the building facade. Okay. Yeah. That's my, that's my thoughts. Yeah. That's, that's good. I um, I totally agree with Adam about the little icon um, drawing that appears in your, uh, I guess the sections um, being really useful for me to understand uh, what's going on. Whereas the plan is really emphasizing, I 
think areas of lawn and paving, which um, undersells uh, the potential of what you're doing here. Uh, that, you know, along with that, the sort of um, concentric forms is really interesting, but a lot of the dimensions are similar. And I would love to see you play with that a bit more so that there are moments where the lawn is allowed to get wider and then is pinched or maybe goes away so that there's a connection through that center. Uh, and just play, you know, playing off of these uh, areas that you've um, designated as paved seating, thinking of those most of the time as a series of outdoor rooms that are kind of carved into meadow planting, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how might they have multiple entrances and exits so that we can kind of wander through them and perhaps a stronger relationship to the other forms that you have uh, within the plan so that they are, are part of the whole rather than these um, sort of rectangular forms. I think it's partially the way that it's drawn here that makes them stand out, but I think it really emphasizes some of the dimensional questions that I have about how big things are, um, which dimensions are repeated, and uh, how things relate to one another, both in terms of circulation, but also in terms of the overall uh, form. I also, I. I'm having trouble um, getting a sense, and this is also partially about this plan drawing, uh, mm -hmm. getting a sense of how um, the planting is uh, supporting and, and strengthening a sense of volume for each of these rooms. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes through more, yeah, it comes through more in uh, some of the 3, 3D um, images that you've created, but I would just explore that even more because I think that um, as Adam suggesting moving some of the, the dogwoods uh, in further to the plan, that's going to give you a stronger uh, visual and physical edge. Um, and I think it, it could it could be a really interesting um, set of dynamics that then will force some of these uh, dimensional changes and relationships in plan as well as in section. Okay. okay. Um, I think that probably reordering some of your sheets would really help because when I saw this plan, I saw it as like a hardscape soft space, softscape configuration rather than a site plan. And I agree with the other reviewers that your um, other rendering is much more expressive and communicative than this is. Mm -hmm. um, I like that you mentioned what happened in the space before that you had a rep, because I think you're the first one that has. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, was, was there anything worth saving other than the trees? I mean, you know, so you address that. And um, the other thing I'm not real sure about though is the scale of your geometry mm -hmm. and the scale of that courtyard. I like that you did that, but I think the scale, and I think people have said this before, the scale may not quite work with the configuration and the, the lines that you did. And I got the impression that you were going for color rather than shape in your planching materials. You know, that you were looking mm. at seasonality and color. And I think you need to make sure that you're looking at the seasonality all year round Mm -hmm. and how that space helps you not only in plan view and color, but how it helps you with the volume of the space, you know, the verticality of the space. How does it work that way? And I don't think you had, you had that in your model with the existing trees, but, uh, or with the, you know, the trees, but you didn't really represent this um, in a way that addressed that. And I think it's just the next iteration. You know, you've got, you've got some ideas about color, you've got some ideas about placement. And I think you need to take the next step when you start massaging this area and, and figuring out your shape and the relationships and getting some of the, um, refining some of the first cut um, plan elements here, I think it'd be a much stronger plan. Um, um, and, I have a, sorry, just a clarification question about the scale um worry what what about the scale looks odd. okay you're looking at the courtyard what's it 300 mm -hmm. feet long yeah that 350 320 mm -hmm. something like that 
Okay, and so you have this shape that you've taken off of the Carruthers reading room, mm -hmm. which is really cool. It's a bold statement. And I think that's great. However, um, how does that relate to the site and the functions of the site? You know, like one of the things that you need to think about is how many people are you programming each one of these spaces for? You know, what are the different uses that you have and what do you need to, how can you be um, definite enough to create those spaces and embellish those experiences and feelings through your design and then how much you know in terms of landform and how much do you need to change to make it all fit it just seems like those are really bold forms but I don't know how it responds to the dimensions in the courtyard is what I'm saying oh yeah well um I think it it grades pretty well I put it into civil and it like these are 10 feet wide and these um retaining walls are only like half a foot high so it's a really subtle it does look very extreme in this um but it is like a much more subtle terracing mm -hmm. in in the actual form of it so it feels like more like settled in there was that is that what you're saying yeah that's part think, of it yeah it is it i is think just, another Go ahead. Well, I think the other, well, the other part of it, I think is what Maggie had talked about earlier, where there seems to be a, an equal um, width to the banding of the uh, concentric offset. Not and I think idea. that if that were to be more dynamic and sort of, um, you have some much uh, larger bands for some specific use, uh, rather than it being too regular in its offset and I think, yeah, I think for me the two you go ahead two. well I, I was just thinking that I'm agreeing with you really I think is that by changing the widths and with some variation I think you start showing a hierarchy of those spaces mm -hmm. and a hierarchy of what what means the most and why you're in that space instead of just this is what it looks like this is what the reading looks like outside and I like the idea of it but I think mm -hmm. you just play with the forms and the dimensions a little bit more to to show a hierarchy of your uses and a hierarchy of the different spaces in terms of your meaning and experience. Okay. I okay. agree. I agree. And I, I think the, the, for me, the two least successful parts, there's a, there seems to be a, a significant amount of paving or dedicated like road surfacing. So I would question the extent of that, but then the two square sort of plaza spaces that are on the North and then the one on the South seem to be additive. And I don't know if they're, um serving you know are they as successful as they could be i think there could be more time spent on the experiential qualities of those two spaces okay okay, okay. we have um uh, samantha any questions for your panel um this is kind of like a off like the wall a little bit question <laughs> um but i was talking to a friend about this place. She works at um, the UT Health Center and she was saying that people get bit by squirrels a lot in this area. Is there, is there a way to like invite predators into an urban situation that's like safe for people, like hawks or something that's not gonna like hurt people? How would you do that? That's a great no question. <laughs> It is a great question exactly. because, you know, I mean, that's that's one of the challenges with urban wilderness or urban wild when you start inviting these native species in here and this, um, you know, that what you what, what you might get things you don't want to have in there. Right. Are you like trying to invite those predators or are you trying to dissuade them? Yeah, it's like at the UTEP project, we made a pretty excellent skunk habitat on campus. So that was always a that was a lesson learned. Um, but I think, you know, like the UT Tower has a falcon that lives there and there's a falcon cam or whatever that streams that. So, I mean, there's definitely precedent for it, but I think offering um, a perch, you know, like maybe one of the, the large trees, heritage trees that you need to harvest becomes um, sort of a sculptural um, gesture yeah, where they, you know, 
<laughs> tree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Samantha, Things like that. There was a snack. Yeah, I took yeah. it out because it um, interfered with Diana. I should have left it in. Well, what's interesting is, you know, like they, there's a company in Germany that will take these trees and they sandblast the bark off of them and they cure them. And so they, they don't become uh, hazards, uh, hazardous things that they become these sculptural objects that are quite beautiful. It's just you have to ship your dead tree to Germany to do it. So, uh, <laughs> Okay. That'd be cool. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Samantha. Zoe, are you ready? I am. All right. Um, I'm Zoe, and this is a proposal for the Honors Courtyard. Um, as is, um, the Honors Courtyard is a living, learning community for um, the Honors students, um, but it currently has um, some pretty steep grading that creates some challenges for accessibility. And there's also um, a lack of a formal plan uh, program for the space and a lack of general unity. So this project um, seeks to reimagine um, um, the space while still respecting the essence of the existing um, topography and creating um, accessible routes, um, places of intimate enclosure, and also a um, an open special space for celebration that uses a water feature to connect um, the sky to the land. Um, in terms of program, there are three distinct rooms in the new proposal. Um, we have an outdoor classroom, um, an enclosed space for studying or hanging out, and then an open, um, an open ceremony space surrounding a water feature. Um, in terms of conceptualizing the space, um, it was inspired by the existing topography and um, I imagined a tilted parallelogram being um, superimposed on the space crossing a central axis. And then there's a large void space also occupying the central axis and um, which is the water feature. And the purpose of that is to create a hierarchy on the axis so that when the space is activated for ceremony, um, the only occupant of the axis would be the person graduating um, and then the statue of Diana, which would be right about there. Um, and then I started to think about how to take cuts out of the topography to create, um, to create spaces that would fulfill the program. Um, so we have a, a rhythm of cut and fill um, that, um, yeah, that creates the spaces and also um, creates some powerful sight lines um, to the center of the parallelogram. Um, so then looking at the grading of the site, um, there are these two um, triangular planes that um, fairly closely preserve the grading of the existing site. Um, the grading is a bit more um, evened out across them, but it's still um, a fairly steep sloping plane. And then there's now a diagonal path graded, or two diagonal paths graded up, um, up the um, triangles and placing them in a, at a diagonal and also adding landings allowed them to be ADA compliant. Um, and then this center, um, basically rectangle and triangle space is um, graded in cut and fairly flat. Um, and then looking in longitudinal section, um, we can see how the triangular geometry plays out. So when you are um, taking a cut from the Western um, higher elevation part of the site, um, the space left is much more compressed because it's near the um, point of the triangle. Um, and also the walls are higher. And then as everything slopes down, um, down the walls of the triangle, we have much more um, open 
um, wider spaces. And here is a rendered perspective of walking um, along, um, along the path of the, the low point eastern edge of the site. Um, and now I'm going to walk you through the um, three programmatic rooms in cross section and um, zoomed in plan. So first is um, the outdoor classroom, which is in the uh, northwestern portion of the site. Um, oh, also, I um, forgot to mention in the grading plan that um, the grading along the, since the grading doesn't alter too much from the existing topography along the triangular um, planes, um, I was able to keep um, pretty much all of the heritage trees in place along that um, line. So when we're in our garden classroom, um, it's framed by a heritage tree and then some new plantings and a hedge of enclosure. Um, and then in the greater cross section, um, you can just see the classroom located up here. And then this would be the bottom um, of the path. So one would travel from there to there. Um, and then this would be a view of leaving the garden classroom and looking out over the courtyard, um, catching uh, the water feature, Diana, and the edge of the um, stage for graduation. And then here is, um, the uh, enclosed study social space um, that we looked at a bit earlier, um, but in cross section this time. Um, so this would be someone sitting um, below, um, below the wall created by the sloping path. And then we have um, vegetation um, from the path above and then also at ground level to frame the space. And then lastly, there is um, the open celebration space um, that surrounds this water feature. Um, during, uh, during normal times, students could hang out around the feature, have a place to reflect, um, and just have something um, kind of beautiful and special right in their um, little living community. Um, and then again, so this is placed on the central axis. So the only, um, only person who could occupy this area would be the person graduating. So um, all eyes would be on them. And then when we do have a ceremony, we can activate this entire parallelogram to um, in each dot represents a person to um, accommodate more people. And then it is designed so that the sight lines um, throughout the parallelogram space are unobstructed so that um, you could see um, what's happening on the graduation stage. And then lastly, this is a view of what it would be, what it would look like to be graduating from this space, um, looking in towards the stage, um, to be able to see the water feature, um, the dorms that you had lived in throughout your time at UT, and um, also your friends and family. And um, that's what I have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Zoe. So for me, Zoe, can you go back uh, one slide? Uh, so like a, there we go. Uh, I'll start these conversations so I can get out of the way. Um, one of the things, so there's a couple things I'd love to see like in the next iteration is just maybe it's a test and you can totally disagree with it and that's fine as well is that the uh, the cuts uh, the triangular cuts that come down to the fountain I wonder if some of those aren't it would be more successful as folds or stairs or some some other geometry rather than a pure vertical retaining wall um, I mean it it's not to say that this, that and the one that's just to the north and uh, just um, like directly north of the water no, uh, up from the fountain, like that diagonal mm -hmm. cut that goes to the northeast. Yeah, like that's a vertical wall that's straight down. And I'm wondering if it were a fold or a, I mean, I guess it could be softened if it were like a living wall or something that's, you know, has some other texture to it. It's, mm -hmm. um, 
I like the dynamics of the site plan sort of having these big bold gestures of tilted planes and some sunken recessed things. The cut to the very south part of the plan, I didn't like it until I figured out that it was a backdrop to the room. And that was part of like this, the, you were creating a more intimate space by having people sit against that cut at the base of the wall. So that I think had a little more poetics, but the North one to me still seems a little harsh rather than if it had like a Hargraves kind of fold to it rather than a, a straight cut. Now it's not to say that that can't be successful because, you know, my lens, um, uh, Memorial in DC is a you know straight kind of cut and has some of those similar forms and that's super successful. So, uh, anyways, that's one thing I'm not like. I like the gestures, but I'm still curious about the elevation changes if they're too abrupt in some areas. The last thing I had was the where the two people stand uh, to have a graduation ceremony and they're sort of on access to the fountain. I'm wondering if that entire north south eastern edge is strong enough to offset the like the axial view looking towards it right so the backdrop behind the two people that the entire uh congregation or whatever is looking at is just four plants right so does that need to be thickened and have like a much more substantial quality to bookend the eastern part of your project um, I feel like that might be a little light and could use some, I don't know, some extra help along that edge. Because it seems like that building, correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of like an alley, right? Like the view looking back towards the west is much more attractive than looking towards the east, right? Mm -hmm. And so then I would, mm -hmm. I would not want all the photographs taken of the two people graduating to be of the alley of that building and not, not be buffered enough. So anyways, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, that's a great point. I think I was imagining them as like big full grown trees, but in reality they've been planted as small trees. So I think, um, yeah, more robust planting would be really nice. Well, and it, it may not be just the planting as much as it is. There's a lot of gray dedicated to that alley. So I would reclaim some of that, mm -hmm. keep it as mm -hmm. small as possible, and then just layer in additional landscape, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, a single row. Maybe it's a hedgerow of plants that has, you know, 12 to 15 feet of depth rather than a single line of anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So yeah, I am also really excited by how bold uh, this is and the fact that you're playing with different kinds of landforms across this as a, a series of big gestures is really fantastic. Uh, your little sketch diagram um, over the, the idea of folded and cut paper uh, was really fun to see and it reminded me of the sculpture park in Seattle and um, and maybe want you to do a series of studies that would be looking at exactly the questions that Adam was asking about how, how the landform might um, accommodate uh, some different edge conditions um, along these cuts. I also would, I, I uh, would love to see a, a series of studies about why the angles are the way that they are. We have this um, big Z that gets repeated and the sort of lower edge, see if I can annotate. There's something about this condition here that um, feels very pinched when I think what's lovely about this line is that it's kind of, it's like an arm welcoming you into the space. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if the angles were slightly different or if we were doing um, a sort of series of landforms or terraces like Adam was talking about, if that could be adjusted to be much more gracious and perhaps it becomes a completely different angle from uh, what you're using up here, right? It could read as a, a different, um, a different uh, angular form. 
I wonder if this becomes, if this starts to be a series of terraces, if that becomes the journey that you go on to graduate and maybe gradu the graduation person is here and we're all facing the opposite direction, or if that becomes a series of terraces that then accommodate some of the audience members. And I would start to play with uh, the way that angles and landform are both structuring circulation as well as uh, the different uses that you imagine for the special as well as everyday events. Mm -hmm. I think in theory, the clay landform workshop should be shorter so that we could have bolder terrain. But yet, I thought the work for the clay landform workshop started to make some significant ties back to the grading class. So I don't know, I, it's a toss up. Maybe the uh, course evaluations will give us some insight or you'll send me an email, but uh, I think, you know, the bold, the bold terrain studies, I think, give a whole new life to this poor courtyard. I, I like the landform. I think that um, the acute angles though are a little harsh. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, because you want to engage people, you want to invite them into that space. And so I think, you know, like these places that, and I think uh, Maggie's already talked about those locations, but, you know, that strong form, you really talked a lot about the ceremony and you talked about some, you know, some off areas and the wall height differences. But where do I, um, celebrate is that the same space what are go over my three spaces again in terms of where they are on the plan in terms of how you envision the because you talked about the graduation you knocked that one out i think you know you and we talked about you know meg talked about some, maybe some terracing you know the plant materials but the concept is strong and it's there okay so with just some massaging and refinement but what i wasn't clear to me or as clear to me was the experience and the space for debate and celebration. So if you could walk me through those. Yeah. Real quickly. Um, well, the celebration, I understood it as a graduation ceremony. Um, so I think okay. we talked about that. Um, but also this whole triangle area in here is, I, I intentionally left as a open lawn space that students could use as an informal space if they wanted to you know have their own party or do whatever they wanted there there'd be space for that and then the um classroom space is um this in this little grove of trees here so we're framed by a heritage tree mm -hmm. hedge and some new plantings um i didn't add the furnishings yet um but there would be okay um, seating for students and a professor could stand here and give a lecture or it could be circular tables or they could stand like in the shade under the tree yeah 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 um, <laughs> on the ground, whatever. yeah i'd like to stand under the tree please the other thing um that i, I like how you've shown the the outlines of the building and the rooms inside because it kind of gives you an idea of the relationship between indoors and outdoors Mm -hmm. which is very helpful in trying to read the plans. But one thing that concerns me is the, um, the impervious areas around your heritage trees. Mm. Maybe I'm reading this wrong, but to me, it looks like that um, around those trees that you have some paving, like right up to the root color of the tree on those ones that you saved, are they the ones that are in the, shaded lines yes. those trees mm -hmm. taken out those are trees to remain in right yeah okay well you've got um you know remember that the tree roots are like in the the top part you know mm -hmm. they're, they're in the top i don't know 12 inches or so you know some the layers on top yeah. so when you pave around that you're really 
hurting the tree over the long run. And oaks will live for a while and then they'll decline. And, you know, so you need to be careful about when you're going to save them, really take measures, strong measures to save them and mm -hmm. to make sure that they're going to survive. So you don't, you know, come later and there's a hole in the pavement where the tree used to be. Um, but, you know, work those into your design. They look like they're just kind of plopped. You saved them, but how did you integrate them into your design? Mm -hmm. And so I think um, that would make it a stronger statement if you could integrate that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I'm glad yeah. that you saved them. And I think you're grading, you know, you're careful grading. I couldn't see enough detail as I would like to see, but I think from the general idea, um, you could save them, but then how does it work into your design? Because, hmm. you know, if you're going to save something, you have to integrate it into what, or contrast it, you know, maybe there's a contrast between yeah. history and the present or, you know, because, you know, maybe you could work that, that angle from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are the, I think most of the other things have been covered. The only other thing I would add to this, uh, Zoe, would be, um, you know, the, the use of plant material is very linear. It sort of accents these, uh, accentuates the path. I, I would have loved to see, and I think what would complement this site plan is like large, dense bosks of trees. Mm. Like some of those triangular forms, if that were a forested vertical volume of like dense tree trunks, uh, creating a very unique sort of understory condition um, it seems a little sparse, and I think the planting material itself doesn't have to just follow paths, that it itself can be the definition of the space. And I think that'd be really uh, complementary to the land forming that you're doing as well. I don't disagree, but I guess I would just question around a living space and the safety of being able to see through the space if you're living in there. Mm -hmm. um, so you just have to be strategic in terms of where you place those trees close together. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, any final questions or comment? Okay, great. Zoe, thank you very much. Um, keeping with the theme of bold, Julia, will you take on the mantle of bold since you are you. in Texas with the Yankees behind you? Oh, okay. I apologize for my bizarre lighting and setting. I'm chasing better wi-fi in the basement of my partner's home and he is a huge yankees fan so okay um i was being funny but not serious <laughs> okay um all right thank you all for your time and attention today i know it's been a long day but i'm happy to share my design um okay so this design proposal for the honors courtyard provides places for ceremony, celebration and debate through a sequence of rooms reinforced by grading, planting and circulation. The rolling topography and varying layered levels of planting work together to create spaces with different senses of, different senses of enclosure, excuse me, different moods and opportunities for activity. And we'll come back to this plan in just a second. Um, but I wanted to talk about the existing courtyard on the top left here a little bit, um, which is qu quite linear and was directed, is sorry, is directed by a strong set of central axes and slopes from west to east with, um, I think at the most dramatic, a nine foot drop. Um, the, my proposed contouring on the top right moves towards three overlapping spaces, which is supported by the planting plan on the bottom left and reinforced by paving on the bottom right, which I have, I'll zoom in a little bit, which I have paired with the topography. So while this proposed plan moves away from the existing organization, um, the plan recognizes the strong center existing axes by placing areas of importance on the axes. The first lies within the largest space on the north side of the courtyard, which is uplifted and framed by large trees, um, three of which are heritage trees in front of Littlefield. 
Um, these overarching trees, these trees provide a sense of overarching enclosure and the proposed contouring slopes gently down and back up to the center of the courtyard where there is a lifted stage for ceremony and celebration. This stage lies on the existing cross axes directly east of the Carruthers reading room and paths from Littlefield moving south and from the entrance of the courtyard in the northeast corner reach around and up to the stage. The grove in the middle of the courtyard mediates the transition from their ceremony and celebration space to a more intimate, quiet debate and gathering space. Just gonna zoom in a little bit here. Okay, the proposed topography um, directs the paths around the grove and uh, these mounds are emphasized by rising layers of planting, providing a sense of slowly rising enclosure. Low ground cover, which is indicated by a spaced out hatching that I apologize is difficult to see, but it is here, um, transitions to a shrubbier understory with a denser hatching, um, which uh, is all under this canopy that arches and overlaps above the path. The grove leads to the third space on the south side of the courtyard, which is meant for smaller gatherings and debate. A large tree, this one right here, on the perimeter of the grove highlights the low point of this third intimate space, which is reinforced by paving and layered planting. And I will come back to this space and section in a little bit. In section elevation, these two sections cross right at the stage, emphasizing ceremony and celebration. On top is a cross section that faces south with the grove seen behind the stage area. Um, this is what I imagine it would, the grove would look like if there was a group, a large group of people um, on the uplifted space for um, a ceremony and whoever is being celebrated will stand at the stage space with the grove in the back. Below, a longitudinal section shows sequence of movement from Littlefield on the right, so on the north side, upstairs onto the ceremony and celebration space and past the stage into the weaving grove towards the quieter end of the courtyard. From north to south, these two section elevations are cut about 15 feet apart and they delineate the three overlapping spaces of the proposed courtyard. We show the experience of walking through the grove here onto this, this person uh, with rising levels of planting and overlapping canopy as you walk between the mounds. The Carruthers reading room on the west side of the courtyard opens up to the entrance of the grove here. The last two sections cross at the intimate sunken debate space, which begins at the large cut tree in these drawings right here. At top, the large tree that begins the sunken debate space is right at the perimeter of the grove and the cross section at the bottom um, cuts through the same tree and it shows the ground sloping from Carruthers on the west side towards the lowest point of the space, which lies under the cut tree. The gentle slope of the sunken space can be seen outside the entrance of Andrews on the south side of the courtyard. Lastly, this is an overall view that shows the rough canopy and topography of the proposed courtyard. Thank you. I, I've got a, a few things. Um, so on this image here on the screen, Julia, I would uh, I'd figure out a way 
to superimpose the contouring onto this uh, white um, topographic uh, mesh. I think that will help uh, the lines read and all the movement read to that specific graphic. Um, okay. One other thing I was going to ask you, what, what was your inspiration uh, behind this approach? Like, why, um, why mounds and uh, moving rolling landscapes? Uh, so, actually, I think that I talked about this in my mid-review with Maggie, and I know Teardrop Park was mentioned in um, the last section of reviews this afternoon, but there is a certain section of Teardrop Park that uh, I think it's the south entrance that has, when you enter, there are some, like, two large volumes that... Um, that delineate three different pathways into this space that's surrounded by like very linear orthogonal buildings. And I love how walking into this city park, it feels like you're in a totally different space. Um, mm -hmm. So it's trying to channel something similar. Yeah. I, I mean, I could definitely see, um, you know, Michael Van Bakkenberg's uh, work as an inspiration. It, it reminds me a lot of the um, gathering place for Tulsa, which I presented, you know, just the path uh, structure and uh, land forming. So I, I also really uh, enjoy the contrast between, you know, really rigid boundaries with this sort of fluid infill. I think it's a really nice uh, contrast between the two systems. So I was just curious if what sort of inspired that. And I, and I think that's a good, um, good example. So um, the cut with that type of plan, I, I would study um, his work immensely because I feel like when you go back to your site plan, if you see the, the some of these paths there, I think there should be a centralized um, bit of hierarchy where there's sort of a primary path. And then as it you know works its way towards the edges, it might, the path widths might reduce in uh, size and they become sort of secondary and tertiary paths. Okay. Um, but I think like the land forming and the fact that the paths sort of meander around, uh, you know, how you're shaping the, the ground plane, I think is really great. Like the bones to this, I think are really solid and excited to see um, using grading as a design tool. I mean, there's tons of like little nuances that I'm, you know, pretty type A in particular about like radii uh, consistencies and all sorts of fun stuff like that. But I think the bones here are, are pretty solid. And I'm, I liked your explanation of why you chose to do this work. And it's not, it's not completely arbitrary, right? It's sort of based in an experiential quality and, and the contrast between that sort of rigid form and then the fluid landform. So it's good. Thank you. Julia, it's exciting to get to see this um, again since our mid-review, which yeah, it was like four days ago. Um, <laughs> it's really come a long ways. But, uh, but I, I also just wanted, one of the things that I remember you saying in the mid-review, and perhaps this is uh, you know, still the case, is that you were interested in defining rooms through topo topographic uh, change and then reinforcing edges through uh, planting. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has started to uh, really come out here, um, but I'd love to see you push it even further. And mm -hmm. I think once you have the diagram that uh, is answering the circulation hierarchy that Adam's asking for, which I agree would be really useful, the next layer of trace is about how your planting strategy is reinforces is reinforcing um, edges between spaces and the edges of circulation, and really giving this immersive quality that you uh, feel within the Teardrop Park example and other good examples. Uh, so that though the diagram of planting, circulation, and those hier hierarchies are um, working hand in hand. But I agree that. Uh, the, especially the central um, bosque and the mound structure is moving in a really interesting direction. 
it's just kind of figuring out how that works with the flows and uh, the movement through the space. In terms of a central um, path, I actually, I did write a note about this during our mid review mm -hmm. and I wrote, try to find a central path. And <laughs> I really struggled because I think I am, I'm very accommodating to this space on the north side, this huge celebration ceremony mm -hmm. space. And I felt stopped up trying to find a major path. I didn't know if it would have to cut through that space. Um, yeah, so I think this is where you develop a series of iterations, right? One answer might cut through that central space where the area that you have as your kind of beginning of the stage, maybe that actually becomes, you know, a central path that has a relationship to some of the connections. Mm -hmm. And then you do another iteration where you test out what it looks like if it cuts through your Basque and, mm -hmm. um, and just testing each of those ideas and what has to change in order to accommodate each of those moves is, you know, that's sort of the next step, I think, for this design is to continue to work through uh, how you develop that hierarchy and how it starts to impact all, all of the other decisions that you've made um, until they're all kind of working in the way that you are pleased with. Uh, so it's, I think it's sketching through it and, um, and then also accepting that it is going to change some of the decisions that you've already made right. uh, in order to develop that further. Okay. And, and just to sort of reiterate one thing, when the, when you're doing the process of sketching, um, and it's the same way that I do contouring, I would, you have to do it by hand and you have to make some of those really beautiful confident pen strokes you know nice bold gestures uh that are really fluid and continuous through the site um don't be afraid to that to be like a messy diagram but that will evolve into crisp clean cad line work but i think you know to do that study it has to be outside of a drafting program you know you really have to like study that by hand mm -hmm. you'll develop your hierarchy and like big bold sharpie marks on trace and then you bring it back into cad and start to make it more realistic so but i think those expressions are much easier done outside of autocad okay agreed no i i, I really like your design um i like how your presentation was quite legible that you took the time to show the overall plan and then how your landforms and your concepts of space work in each part of the site. Um, I couldn't tell the difference between the shrubs and the ground cover, but in I your know, description, well, you, but you're, no, but your description of it, you walked, you walked us through it in terms of, you know, like I'll catch this the next time at the next iteration. And I think that your landforms are really strong. I like how you use, I uh, the grading as, you know, grading as is design. It really is. And so many people forget that it is. So you've made a strong statement with that. You've provided some natural barriers and some direction for circulation. So while you haven't actually worked out the, the circulation plan per se, because I was having a hard time seeing a hierarchy of that as well, mm -hmm. that you have the start of that and your strong landforms will help you direct that. And I like the idea of the marker and the, and the bold moves, because once you get into CAD, it's like it, you're in a straight jacket, you're in small angles and you're trying to make it constructible. And you do that, you make it constructible after you've made those broad moves. Um, and I think that the, um, you've, you're, your way you've done it has kind of made it easier for grading. And I think it's a very clean design, even though it's really curvilinear and stuff, because Van Valkenburg, um, he does these designs like this, but he's also very concerned in his designs on how they'll be maintained. And he always has maintenance in mind when he does these designs. So I think you, you reiterated um, his approach or the, the guts of his approach. And um, I like how you've tried to use the landforms and design to create your spaces and direct your um, pedestrians through the space. So. Um, I think the next iteration would be pretty exciting to see, but um, thank you. And thanks for going into the details of each part of the plan. Thank you. 
Wow, great, terrific. Thank you very much, Julia. All right, so here we are. We're at our 449 mark. We've got 10 minutes. This group is completely and totally on time. Uh, it, this is your chance for everybody in the class to join in and ask some additional questions or share their thoughts on the commentary uh, in this group. Oh, you all can't be silent. I like all the uh, squirrel chat. It's good. The squirrel chat? On the on the chat string over here. A lot of squirrel mm -hmm. talk. Yeah, I have to admit it was a serious, <laughs> it was very serious. <laughs> well, I got really worried with the snag tree so close to the entrance by Diana, though I completely loved the whole thought of a wild. A, a really wild portion of the tree of the plan. I thought that as a proposal, instead of being so maintained, there was part of it that was rough and wooly and, and dead. But um, <laughs> I would, you know, I, I was encouraging, but. You know, say hope, I mean, I, I imagine there's some grand design about the, the themes that connect all these groups of, and of all our various proposals, but. It was really inspiring that this group, I mean, really went for it with the landforms and these really, and a lot of other groups too, you know, really it, I mean, I know certainly in my case, you know, it's hard to break out of the tendency to want to respect a lot of the existing forms and things. Or like Adam said, you know, go for the North Middle South approach. <laughs> yeah. As somebody who did exactly well, that. <laughs> What's uh, what's interesting, and, and I think, you know, we can attest to the fact that, like, once you get away from academia and you and you get, you know, back into the real world, you tend to do the, you know, the top middle south because it's, uh, you know, it's affordable, it's uh, reasonable, and it and it it does work, you know, it technically does what you need to. But I think where you're at right now, you know, first year students being able to think outside the box and, and really stretch the bounds of creativity is critical because you'll spend the rest of your life being told no. So like, do it now, you know, now is the time to be bold and just, I had a, a, a band, I was a band nerd growing up. And so the, the theme was like, if you're going to play a, long, a wrong note, that you have to play it loudly and uh, with confidence, right? So if you're going to make a design gesture, do it, you know, go all out, make a big, bold statement, and you can always sort of subtract and reel it in. Uh, it's much harder, like if I had a client that, I've never had a client say, well, could we do something more grand? You know, like it's, uh, it's always sort of a subtraction process. And so I feel like you swing for the fences and then you can always dial it down. But I'd also say that it's with the big, it's with those big, bold visions that you can bring someone further than they were willing to go at the beginning, right? You can't incrementally pull them along, but um, it is part of our job as designers to uh, really investigate and imagine um, new ideas and new relationships and, and uh and possibilities that go beyond the scope of what we've been handed, and especially in landscape, to see um, connections beyond our the boundaries of our site and opportunities that might not have been realized, and um, and so you have to get in the habit of uh, pushing yourself to be bolder than what you've been asked to do, so that you're um, you're you're best serving your client that way too. It it goes. Um, beyond academia, I think, particularly if you're interested in the larger uh, larger responsibilities that we have to a broader public in, in our discipline. Well, I think it helps you learn where to push the envelope because when you yeah. get into practice, um, you're gonna have to figure out ways to bend and break the rules to get what you need for your client. And I don't mean that you're doing terrible things, but you know, there are, are uh, normative 
system has a lot of rules and regulations that really don't um, encourage creativity and design. So we have to be able to take that chance and know how to bend and break those rules to, to form better and new rules. I guess that's the kind of way to say it that um, we, so these bold moves you're making now will benefit you in the future and making some of those moves. You know, the, the, the way I tried to frame it uh, was this, that they're designing landscapes in nine, you know, in 2020, it needs to be a reflection or a critical commentary on what it means to be a student in the honors courtyard at the University of Texas in 2020. So it calls, it sort of begs the question, what is the faculty, student, parent hierarchy? What is the platform for debate? Are they oppositions? You know, I mean, how that you actually can think socially and culturally that the landscape begins to respond or have a commentary or critical commentary forward. Um, you know, that's one of the ways, right? One way is to solve the problem. Uh, the second is to sort of probe what it means, right? These programs, potential programs, right? and they, they all, all of them have performance, hierarchy or challenge a hierarchy and how can the use of form level change and uh, providing view or denying view actually reinforce you know, your position. And so that's what I'm encouraging them to do because you know, you're, this is the opportunity through scholarship and exploration where you have uh, free reign in many, or you have, you have a venue within which you can learn through experimentation and error. I'm not going to say failure. Experimentation. <laughs> experimentation. But I also want everybody to understand that criticism is not always, it's, it's not personal. It's about the work at this time. It's challenging because this is you in your first semester engaging in this work. So it feels really close, close to the person, but in many ways it's asking questions to open things up potentially, you know, for the future. And so um, your work will, oh, you want your work to provoke questions. You want your work uh, not to be perfect because it gives you so many other opportunities and venues. And so I, I, I will argue that the solutions for the courtyard this semester were refreshingly different than anything that I had seen in the past. And uh, so I'm going to credit that to the, the, the special chemistry you all have with one another, gained, <laughs> developed virtually and um, and also, you know, with your work with Maggie over the summer, it's been a remarkable sort of look at the courtyard. I learned more things about this courtyard than I have in the, you know, combining the years past. So I have to, I give the credit to them. I, I was wondering, um, as far as plantings, when you guys look at plantings, you, and you're looking at a job, do you select uh, the type of plant or do you more look at what kind of space can you take up and then look at the type of plant? Like, do you have a plant palette before you go in that you know I want to use these things or is it more of the spaces I want to occupy now, what's going to fit in those spaces? Kind of cut out a little bit, but I, yeah. for me, like mm -hmm. I, I, um, I approach planting design. Um, it's all you know, super site specific, obviously, but it's. Uh, I rarely go into a situation with an idea of what I need to use. Like it's, it's more about like color and form and texture, and all of the you know ways that you describe plantings, rather than the specific species. And I back, and this is just a personal preference, I guess I back myself into finding the appropriate species that resolves the design intent that's needed. That's how I approach it. 
Yeah, I think the only time I've ever looked at a plant list first is doing where you're doing an extremely large project and you're working with other consultants, like you may have one part of the project, they have another, and you're trying to make it all go together. Mm -hmm. And that's the only time I can think that I've looked at the plant palette first. And that was just really in a between the firms of how we're going to make this look like one place. And, and even with like uh, clients, you know, I early in concepts, I hand each client a presentation that describes uh, plant palette. And here's a suite of plants that we'll likely tap into, but that's not specific to the design. That's specific to the region. Like that's a central Texas thing that says, look at the beauty that's around you. Here's all these options that we can use. But when I go to place plants on a, on a project, it is, you know, what, what work are those plants going to do? Are they offering a different texture? Are they breaking up or softening a facade? So they're, they're doing all this other work. Um, but I mean, it's, it's not unheard of, you know, to have a palette to work from, but the selection of each species is often uh, something you do after you decided what needs what work those plants need to do for you. I must confess. And, and availability of what you need and then when it's available. <laughs> if, you, if the size you need is available when you need it, that becomes an issue sometimes too. I mean, I don't know how Maggie, how, how all y'all feel about this, but in many ways, I ask them to think about habit over species because habit is how the shape of the plant contributes to the definition of the boundary or of the volume and allows them, my thinking was it was allowing them to just think about that before worrying about the debris of a mesquite or of the lacy bark elm or right, that we could talk about habit so that the focus of the conversation stayed on the volume and the boundary and the threshold and how all of the plant grading and material work together as opposed to you know, spending time on the species. I mean, I'm not trying to deny the beauty um, that that contributes and a depth to the, the love of making the landscape. It was just the dedicating of time I think one of the biggest factors is what kind of soil you have to work with and what the what the soils are on site and how much soil um, adjustments you have to make. It's better when you don't have to make them, <laughs> you know, for your plant to be in its natural right. habitat, that, those, that the plant type and the soil type fit together. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think related to each of these is just that you know, you need to be clear about why your planting pellet is related to your co overall concept because mm -hmm. frequently you will have issues with the soils where you have to make adjustments or you, uh, the plant you want is not available in the quantity or the size that you thought it would be. And so knowing what you were trying to do with that particular plant is how you start to ask questions of your consultants in order to get the overall design um, that you've intended, right? And having having a really clear line from concept to each of your uh, decisions then allows you to um, make those adjustments in a way that is in service to the overall design and is not dependent on one particular species or one particular. And I think that's why a lot of times you'll see a candidate list of plant species. You know, until you know mm -hmm. the the exact parameters and conditions, you'll have a a candid list of species, or I think you were talking about things in Central Texas, Adam, in terms of what's mm -hmm. available, what can we use here, what what's around. Right. Because I mean, you know, the situation that I might use like a giant Hesperalo, I can often, there's probably five other plants that would do a very similar thing, right? So if I run into an issue with mm -hmm. one specific species, I'm going to reach on these, you know, look at these others that I think will do a, a very similar um, job. So yeah, you need to have that sort of depth where you might have something in mind, but you, you want to be able to pull um, other alternates and, and actually be able to like defend 
against a contractor's substitution because that's what you run into a lot is lazy contractors that say this is the same thing and you're like no no it's not you know so you need to know them well enough that you can stand up for yourself and make them look a little harder okay any last ones Okay. It's really a question, more of like a comment, but um, I just appreciated seeing all of the like, I know we ha we all had the same list of deliverables, but it's like the way that people went about um, fulfilling those requirements was really interesting to see and kind of looking at, oh, this person did this and that was really effective for whatever they were trying to do. And I think, um, I'm not sure if everyone else felt this way, but there were a lot of times where I was like, okay, this is my idea. And I, I'm not sure which way to do it best, you know, or w the best way to represent it. So um, it was really, it was really interesting to see how everyone um, decided to represent their ideas. Agreed, agreed. I would say, Franny, one of the things, I, you guys all, uh, you're a really close class, and that's uh, really good, um, because you're going to be some of your, your own best teachers, right? And I, I hope that you all, uh, you know, as life returns to normal, or maybe it doesn't, I know you all sort of have that slack communication, whatever that is, you kids these days. But the idea is that you can share uh, tips and tricks with each other, and as a whole, like as a, com a community, you're going to excel far beyond where you could as an individual. So keep that up. I think it's really great um, to share that and, and exchange ideas and whatnot. Great. All right. I think you're almost all done. There's a history paper ahead. Is that correct? And is there... Anything else? There are some perspective Maggie, drawings. Maggie. Oh, so Maggie and Mirka. Okay. I'm right. rendering an animation tool. Oh, yeah. That, well, Ashwini. Okay. Yeah. No, I know. You owe me an animation. A long one. 300. Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Very good, everyone. You said three minutes minimum, so. <laughs> okay. Three minutes minimum. Let's hope it's four. All right. Well, all right. Very good, everyone. It was a real pleasure. Um, I, I guess applause, applause, applause. And um, may you all rest well tonight before you make those beautiful perspectives and spin those words for Mirka. Okay. I would recommend if you have the time tomorrow to just live stream the second and then the third year reviews, because you're really going to, I would screenshot specific things that you like and have questions about and then reach out to them because it's, it's, you're going to see some really beautiful work. And I, I think it would behoove you to, to watch it in the background. Are they right. recorded? You think? They, they oh, yeah. are. They're all, this, okay. this is live stream recorded on YouTube apparently. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we had we had a maximum of eight viewers at one time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, congratulations to all of you. Thank you very much to Jane, Adam, and Maggie for closing out the day, and uh, rest well and write well and we're, perspective well. We're influencers now. You are influencers. We got the following. I wonder what our, who are who your advertisers <laughs> are. Mm -hmm. So, but we have product placement there for New York, so we'll see where we go. Okay. All right. Ciao. Thank everybody. you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks so y'all. Great job. Appreciate it. Great to see your work. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jane. Bye bye. All right. Ciao. Bye. Ah. The last ones to go. All right. Bye. Party's over. <laughs> <laughs>